You know what I love? Going to France. We're on the wrong side of the road! And why do I love going to France? Because that's where Disneyland is. It's a small world after all. It's a small world. Though. Who doesn't love Disneyland? Walt Disney himself loved it so much that he died. Obviously I went there with my family recently for a quick break before Catechorus season 11, you know, to freshen up, give myself some new ideas. I gotta think of more ways to joke about how Postman Pat's nose looks like a dick. And once I returned to the UK, I thought back on the trip we took and I realised that no matter how many times I go to the same theme parks, it's still a brilliant time, and the rides are still excellent, even if it's the tenth time I've ridden them all. Casey Jr., still adorable. Slinky Dog, still only just about worth the five minute queue time. Buzz Lightyear Laser Blast, still badass. Not as badass as my score, though. Space Mountain, still my favourite ride. Star Tours, still great, and it's even been updated with 3D glasses and pod racing. Ratatouille, still brilliant. The Orbitron, I didn't go on it, it's too scary. Pirates of the Caribbean, still fantastic. Indiana Jones, at the Temple du Peril. My favourite Indiana Jones movie, still rocks my cock off. But who do you think's hiding in that tent? Aerosmith's Rock and Roller Coaster, still incredible. Although I'm pretty sure that Steven Tyler just breathes in with his giant gaping mouth to make the ride go. <laughs> Crush's Coaster, still excellent. The Special Effects Showcase, still awesome. Phantom Manor, it was being refurbished. I fucking hate you, Disney. Thunder Mountain, still one of the best rides. Tower of Terror, oh, I don't know about this ride. Oh, I'm all on my own in the hotel basement. It's, it's a little spooky. I, I don't think I'll cope on this ride. <laughs> Okay, it's not that bad. How do theme parks do it? I'm mean, not like that, no. How do they keep consistently entertaining no matter how long the queues are? How do they make it all worth it despite the older and more cynical you get throughout your life? I don't know, but we have a game here that can hopefully answer that question. Enter Theme Park World on PS1, also known as Sim Theme Park in America. An EA classic, which I've never heard of, that was a sequel to a game called Theme Park, which I also don't know anything about. But hey, a game with a manual this huge must be worth playing. What the fuck is a Vida Tate Jack? Who made this game then? Ah, my favorite company. Bullshit productions. <laughs> okay, then what do we have here? Aliens. I like them. People in alien costumes. Uh, they're all right. I like them. I really don't see where any of this is going. Ah, the power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. What in the name of Nanny's Biscuit Tin is going on here? What the fuck is the game trying to tell me? How does any of that illustrate running and maintaining a theme park? Did I just so happen to pick up Torture Dungeon World by accident? Anyway, we've started the game up, we've got a gate in front of us, so all good so far. Oh, what the hell is that thing? No, seriously, what is that supposed to be? An overweight colon? A ghastly taking a shit? I don't know what this is. When I give you information, most of the time it will be repeated with a message. And more importantly, why should I even listen to you when your glasses don't line up with your face? Anyway, this guy has a load of blah to talk about that doesn't mean anything. And with that, I think it's time to flick the switch <coughs> and open up my park. Okay, yeah, maybe I should have made something before doing that. Ooh, that's a noise. I heard something. Was, was that a car engine or a dying cow? Oh god, it's a bus! This is this is so soon, so unexpected! Thank you so much for the support! Oh, okay, I spoke too soon. Why aren't you coming into my park? Look, I've got nothing! This park is anything that you want it to be, is in your imagination. Oh, fucking hell, maybe I should actually look into building something then. There's a lot to choose from here, absolutely, but I think starting off with the crazy ape is a nice way to ease people into the park. Visitors can use- Shut up! I've got no time for you, you defective anal bead! I need to start preparing for my customers. Oh my god, there's one! We've got one park goer in our midst, and he is queuing up for the crazy- Crazy ape. <laughs> oh shit, he vanished. Where did he go? Is he on the ride? If he is, why isn't the ride moving? Oh, oh wait, here we go. Ride's over. <laughs> that was fun, wasn't it? So now I think I can start construction of a new I forgot to link the exit to another path and he's stuck. I mean, yeah, this is my fault, but equally this is fucking stupid. There's so much grass to walk on. Hell, go for a fucking dip if you want. Anything must be better than having a seizure outside a monkey's bossy. Oh god, here's another one. We have another victim, people. Who knows what will happen once he gets off the ride? Oh, what? So my last guy just farts and walks away. I mean, the fart was unnecessary, but why didn't you just do that ages ago, you muppet? By the way, this, this here, no, this isn't some sort of genetic metamorphosis. This is just what happens when more than one person gets stuck in the same place. It's a little bit parasite Eve, I'm aware, but it's totally innocent, really. Well, except from when one of the stuck customers decides to fart and then everyone gets offended and walks away. That's when it isn't innocent anymore. Why can't people just leave the ride in an orderly queue and then join another queue for the next ride? The more I say that word, the weirder it sounds. Queue. Q. It doesn't even sound like how it's spelled. 
You should be waiting for a ride in a Kwiwi. Okay, it's obvious that I need to look at a lot more of the menus and additional rides in order to make the perfect park. The most essential thing to find before anything else though is a toilet, because Christ you can never have too many of them in a theme park. Yeah, we have a toilet here ready to go, so I should probably figure out where to put- WHAT THE FUCK IS A SUPER TOILET?! <laughs> I don't know, but we need at least two, right by the front. Can you imagine being the guy who designed the theme park where the first thing you see upon entering is not the Disney castle, not Alton Towers, not the Universal Globe, but two giant toilets? This park is hereby dubbed Dexter's Laboratory. Okay, so here's the thing. This game I'm holding in my hands, this disc more specifically, I tried my hardest, guys. I couldn't get it working on my PS3, my PC, even my PS1, but to be fair, my PS1 is a little bit... <laughs> Fucked. Yeah, I guess I wasn't very good at looking after discs when I was younger, so this meant I had to emulate Theme Park World on my laptop. And because of that, I actually ran into some copyright protection. Meaning that I don't have access to all the different theme park styles, the rides, and I'm unable to hire anyone or go through any of the actual maintenance of the park. I also don't have access to the mode that allows you to explore your own park in first person and go on the rides, but Honestly, I don't think I'm missing out on much with that. Either way, this is fine with me because my imagination isn't limited to the amount of stuff I have to work with. And also, in practice mode, you have access to thousands upon thousands more funds and are able to build whatever you want with absolutely no consequence to anything. So that's what I did. And here is the fruit of my labor, Dexter's Laboratory. The park is open for business. I'll take you on a tour in a second, but first we must wait for some custom- Where are their parents? Anyway, welcome one and all to Dexter's Lavatory, and your first immediate stop to check out is Toilette Towers, a gift from the French, the cornerstone to our park, and what put us on the map in the first place. Prepare to be stunned by the gleaming floors and high-tech facilities that only a super toilet can provide you. And while you're here, why not try out some of our special endangered turtle burgers? You may be glad that the bathrooms are right next door afterwards. After you're done here, you may want to head left down the gravel path of longing guilt, where you won't only be able to see our beautiful flat trees. Oh what, you don't like them? Oh, fuck off then! But if you continue down your path to destiny, you will eventually come across the beloved treasure of our park, the Rock of Inclination. So precious and so desired to the point that we even have a litter bin right next to it, because if you dare have a picnic near this rock and throw your rubbish everywhere, we will feed you to the living, breathing yes. Oh dear, it seems as though too many people are refusing to use the super toilets and keep letting off whiffs, which in turn is pissing everyone else off. The toilets are right there, people. Don't make me eject you. Anyway, right here in front of the super toilets is where you'll find our best and biggest water coaster, Unfinished Dot TMP, aptly named because I couldn't figure out how to fucking finish the ride. No matter what I did, it refused to connect back to the start of the ride, so I suppose that's a good thing because if you rode this coaster, you would definitely be... Bypassing that ride, however, leads you to the longest queue in the park, and for good reason, because our most popular ride is housed at the end of it, the Oval of Bland. <laughs> You can see why it's our most popular ride, can't you? And right next door to our exciting oval lies our most hardcore ride for only the most hardcore guests. The blazing pot of skewered death, and Christ almighty, even I forgot how violent this ride was. But hey, at least you can agree that it'll spin you around like a bad gense. The thing with this ride, though, is that, well, it derives its name from the amount of death that has occurred on it, because as you can see, there are no safety harnesses, meaning that you will most likely fall out of the ride into the scorching pot of lava if gravity isn't on your side. But don't worry, if you do fall in and somehow manage to get out, I took the liberty of placing the ride right next to Savior's stream, so you can at least cool off if you get burned inside out. Or you can just go in there and have a wash if more guests decide to fart in your Face. But ah, there is one more aspect of the park that only the most dedicated should be able to spot. For if you turn right at the entrance and bypass all of the eye-catching excitement, you'll find a queue of epic proportions leading you directly to our loving deity who made the creation of Dexter's lavatory possible. The Sun God of Judgment. And this is where he proudly sits, waiting to be praised for everything he has done for us mere mortals. And if you decide to disrespect him by just waltzing up like you own the place, he will teleport you into his judgment slingshot and FUCKING LAUNCH HIM OUT OF THE PARK FOREVER! Let's say that doesn't happen to you though, is there something beyond the Sun God of Judgment? A reward for those with the highest level of faith in their hearts? <laughs> Hell yeah there is. For those who have survived all the trials of the park, this path will lead you to the secret back end of the park for a final test of your devotion to the Lord. For your final test, are you willing to walk by the Forest of a Hundred Eyes and risk being spotted by our guards who can see through your deceit with our disguised security cameras? Trust me, they can tell if you're not being serious and if you're not worthy, they will stop you right there. It's also worth saying that one of those trees is equipped with an automatic sniper rifle. But I'm 
I'm not telling you which one. If by some miracle you pass the Forest of 100 Eyes, then get ready for your final test. Behold the majesty of Sunny, the son of the sun god, god sun, sun. Who doesn't have any special powers necessarily, but if you're nice to him, he can give you a voucher for the slightly racist costume shop on your way out. And yes, the front door is in his testicles, because we all know that's where the best deals are hiding. And that, boils and germs, was my brief stint with Theme Park World on PS1. Yeah, I didn't have the full game and access to the actual stuff that lets you play the game properly, but let's just say the manual is this thick for a reason. For a PS1 port of an originally PC-only title, Theme Park World doesn't only look pretty damn good, but manages to give you a fully functioning and very detailed theme park simulator, with tons of customizable options, special features, and it's all done in such an accessible and easy to follow way. All the while not being overly complicated with the PS1 controller and overloading you with information and button prompts. Yeah, it's not the best of its genre that I've ever played, but if you're into this kind of stuff, I'd say there's no harm giving it a look at least. Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna look for the best deals and offers in my area. Roller coaster tycoon. Why is there nothing on TV anymore? Hello, I'm a packet of noodles, and you're watching Disney Channel. After these messages, get ready for the new series of Don't Worry, That's Just My Boner. Ugh. I guess I gotta find some other way to get my entertainment today. Books. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of weeks ago I was in a corner shop just picking up some bits and pieces with my girlfriend Keris for the house, and I stumbled across this. I'm sure you can understand, I had to pick it up. And I thought I'd spend today's video just going through it and reacting to everything that could possibly be in here, because look, I mean, this is 50 greatest games. And Sonic Boom is on the front, so this bodes well. Full disclosure, this is the first time I'm looking at any of this. As you can see, it's still sealed, so this is all live, unscripted reactions to what I'm looking at, and let's just go through this magazine for clearly for babies. It's a it's fucking it's a fucking babies magazine, and let's see what we find then. Okay, so best Fortnite wins, I don't know what that means. 110% gaming. My tips and oh my Jesus. For a second, I thought that said my tits inside. Oh no, don't show me them. Okay, so what's on the back then? Oh, we got five free gifts. That's pretty cool. We got some pixel sunglasses. We got a tango suite, um, a pizza patch. What the fuck is a pizza patch? Keyboard stickers from Ethan Gamer. Is that his real name? I, I feel very sorry for him. And some Overwatch stickers, pretty cool stuff. And to accentuate how hilarious YouTubing and pirates going together is, we've got three crying face emojis, because that's that's what the kids are into, you need. And apparently we can also make a creeper head. Now what I love about that is that if you didn't know what Minecraft was, and you said to your mom, then they're gonna think you're talking about making the head of a paedophile. Anyway, let's open this shit up and see what we've got. Okie dokie, right, so we've got the pixel sunglasses. Wait, where's that? Warning, not suitable for children under three years old due to small parts. Choking hazard. That's what it says on the back here. Okay, what small parts are we referring to at this moment? I can't- I'm a grown man and I can't even choke myself with this shit. Okay, so here's the pizza patch. Oh, it's an actual patch. Oh, I see. Right, okay, so... Well, I fucked up now. I can't get in there. And we've got the Ethan Gamer 100% official keyboard stickers. There's 75 stickers in here, apparently. Okay, let's have a look at a few of them. Oh my god, you can tell this is a kid's magazine because they just assume that they have all the time in the world to cover every individual fucking key in stickers. Oh my god. But we've got the Overwatch stickers, at least, so let's have a look at these and see what we've got. Are they from- are they for a sticker book collection or what? Um, we've got... Um, Tracer, and we've got Tracer, and we've got Tracer. Oh, we've got a, a, a shiny Tracer. And here we go, the main event. The special 50th issue edition of 100% gaming, 110% gaming, sorry. I, I missed the extra 10% because I'm not feeling 100% myself. I suppose it's got to be at least a little bit decent, otherwise they wouldn't have made it to issue 50, so let's have a look at what's going on here. So according to the contents here, we've got Making the Creeper Head, we've got the Greatest Games list, which I'm very excited to see, the YouTuber Pirates, which I'm also... I, I don't know who any of them are, I'm not that excited actually. And apparently that lasts for like 21 fucking pages, and then we go on to Roblox for page 40. Okay, gaming news, Summer of Pokemon. Pokemon is going worldwide. <laughs> 
<laughs> Worldwide this summer in Chicago, Pokemon Go Fest, a walk in the park. Let's players explore the city to find their favorite po- fa Fave. Save Pokemon, while Pokemon Go Savari Zone in Japan is an event for Pokemon Go Trek. How many times can they say fucking Pokemon Go? You'd think they like Pokemon Go. Disney Heroes Assemble, team up with your favorite Disney fave, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Disney Heroes like Wreck-It Ralph, Buzz Lightyear, and Mike Wazowski. Yeah, he's my favorite Disney hero. Yeah, like Wreck-It Ralph, you know, big <laughs> strong hero, Buzz Lightyear, big <laughs> strong hero, and Mike Wazowski. Fucking oh. basketball. Yeah, of course, all right. This month we've been 30% bossing Fortnite. Let's go to the next page. Oh, Christ almighty, we've got reviews here. Reviews for the kids. Okay, um, this is for Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition. I'm just gonna look at- I'm not gonna read all of this in detail. I'm sure it's, you know, for two fucking pages and like, I don't know, three sentences altogether spread over like three paragraphs. I'm, I'm, I'm not really gonna bother with that. So I'm just gonna go with the verdict section here. The good, cool special moves, loads of characters, massive battles. That's very vague. The bad, silly story, repetitive gameplay, no puzzles. Obviously these guys are entitled to their own opinion, that's fine, they can give it a seven, whatever. Um, I haven't played the game enough myself to make a judgment on that, but I'm looking, th I'm just skimming through the review. There is no mention anywhere about Dynasty Warriors, which is kind of a big fucking point to why why Hyrule Warriors are designed the way it is. It's not supposed to be a new Zelda. So I I don't really know what to say about that. Let's move on. Okay, here we go. So crafting a creeper head. You will need a cardboard box. They are talking about pedophiles. Hiding in fucking boxes, jumping out at all the kiddies. Scissors, paintbrush, pencil to- wow, they're trusting the kids with scissors? Cut off the extra tabs on your box and sketch squares all over it. They don't have to be perfect. Mix the colours and paint your box similar to a creeper. Use this guide here to help you. So it does have to be perfect, you fucking liars. Here we go. <laughs> this is what I'm very interested on. Um, the 50 greatest games. We celebrate our 50th issue with the 50 best games ever. I'm just even looking at these first two pages. I can't see anything about any detail. There's no detail here, so I'm just gonna take their word for what they've said and leave it at that. Number 50, Disney Infinity. Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, awesome. Yeah, all right. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, haven't played it. Ratchet and Clank, okay, why? Why not the original one? 47, Metroid Samus Returns. That's good, it's a bit debatable, but all right. I think it's just because it's the newest one. 46, Lego City Undercover. Number 45, Rock Band 4, create an epic band and rock on. Yeah, that is what you do in rock band. You make a band and you rock. So yeah, but it's Rock Band 4, why not Rock Band 2? Rock Band 2 was the fucking best, easily. Number 44, Portal 2. Okay, considering the amazing reviews Portal 2 gets, I'm surprised this is that high up the list because this seems just to be like a load of stereotypes on what kids seem to like and I'm really, Really surprised that that game in particular is that high up the list. I wouldn't put it in my favorites personally, but I'm surprised it's that high up. Number 43, Donkey Kong, a legendary arcade classic. That isn't arcade Donkey Kong, and Donkey Kong could be referring to any fucking Donkey Kong game. Can you be a little bit more specific? 42, Spyro the Dragon. That's not Spyro the Dragon, that is the Reignited Trilogy, which isn't even out yet. Little baby child. 41, Forza Horizon 3, have the drive of your life. I haven't played the game, I couldn't possibly tell you. Number 40, Football Manager 2018, take your favorite footy team to glory. Ugh, all right, okay. Number 39, Gang Beasts. Pokemon Sun and Moon, all right, interesting. 37, Super Mario Maker, that's actually kind of surprising. I would have thought they would have put Mario Odyssey or something in here at some point. I don't know, maybe maybe that will come up later. 36, Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 and 2.5 Remix. Number 35, Gran Turismo 5. Buckle up for a great ride. Hang on a second, but... Forza Horizon 3 apparently gave you the drive of your life. Buckle up for a great ride doesn't sound that much more exciting. In fact, it sounds more boring. How have you fucked that up? Number 34, Plants vs. Zombies. Haven't played it, couldn't tell you. 33, Cuphead. Rayman Legends 32. 31, Skylanders Imaginators. Create your own Skylanders in this epic game. What does that mean? Explain. 30, Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. That is an insult to fucking Cuphead. That is a fucking insult to Cuphead. In fact, no, apparently Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle is better than Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 and 2.5 Remix. It's better than... Spyro the Dragon. Number 29, Street Fighter V. Ryu and Friends Strike Again. As far as I remember, that game came out unfinished. Number 28, Minecraft Story Mode. Wow, Minecraft is only number 28. I mean, I know it's not the official Minecraft, that's probably gonna be number one, you know how kids are like, but... Minecraft Story Mode, just got too much story, not enough action, you know, just throw it in the midway point, that's fine. Number 27, Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga. Best Lego game as far as I'm concerned. Number 26, Overwatch. That's not higher up, okay. Um, number 25, Wii Sp <laughs> 
Okay, I love Wii Sports as much as the next guy, but to put Wii Sports above fucking Overwatch, Cuphead, what? 24, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, that's pretty cool. That's not the Insane Trilogy though, that's Skylanders, isn't it? 23, Angry Birds 2. You're fucking joking, right? You're gonna put Angry Birds 2 above Insane Trilogy, Cuphead, oh my god, let's just keep going. 22, Super Smash Bros. Melee, okay. All right, they used Melee, not the most recent one, interesting. 21, Lego Marvel Super Heroes 2. Okay, more Lego, okay. Number 20, Journey, the first game Stampy played on his channel. Is that the only reason it's number 20? It seems a little bit too boring for the kitty winks. Number 19, Splatoon 2, we ink it's great. Number 18, Lego Dimensions. Fucking Lego again. Number 17, Little Big Planet 3, alright. Number 16, Pac Man Championship Edition 2 Plus. I didn't know the kids were into that nowadays. Number 15, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Reinventing the world of Hyrule, all the while using Tingle from Wind Waker. Number 14, The Sims 3. Yes, the fucking cornerstone of child gaming nowadays. Number 30, Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I haven't played them, I couldn't possibly comment. Number 12, Roblox. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Number 11, Sonic Mania. Number 10, Burnout Paradise, fantastic game. Number 9, Rocket League, of course. Number 8, Fortnite, of course. Number 7, Pokemon Go- Above everything? It doesn't work half the time. The people who wrote this magazine clearly haven't played Pokemon Go every day. Number 6, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, va va voom. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. The the image of Mario saying va va voom, that's the best shit I've ever read. Although I'm very curious as to what that dot there is. I think that might have been a misprint. Va va voom! The Legend of Zelda: The Wind Waker HD. Okay, very ballsy to put that above Breath of the Wild, considering the kind of magazine this is. I I applaud that. Number four, FIFA 80. I have no fucking comment, next page. Number three, Tetris, oh my god. Don't these children who love Fortnite and Minecraft love just jumping off of their PCs and their PS4s and their ooyahs and go, hey mum, do you mind if I just grab your Game Boy and play Tetris for three hours? Apparently it's number three though because it's the best selling game of all time. They've got some very shallow views from this magazine. It's very political. Number two, Super Mario Odyssey. I called it. I said it was going to be higher. So there we go. So much to explore, so many ways to play. I agree. I, I wouldn't say it was the second best video game of all time though, but you know, I'm glad it was above Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. And as for number one, what do you think it is? I don't even have to tell you, do I? Of course it's Minecraft. If if you want one game that you can play day after day without ever getting bored, it has to be Minecraft. There's so much to do, from exploring mysterious portals to fighting for survival, or even building your dream home. Then hop online and visit amazing worlds and brilliant mini games built by players from all over the world. You can do that in Roblox. Agree or disagree with our list? Let us know your favourite games by tweeting us at at 110 gaming. Okay, first of all, this is a children's magazine. You shouldn't be advertising social media to kids who can't handle it. Secondly, I'm gonna fucking tweet you and I'm gonna tell you exactly what I think. No, no, I didn't want no, I didn't want to follow you. I don't agree with your list. Custer's Revenge should have been one. Okay, YouTube pirates. These YouTubers have gone crazy for Sea of Thieves, all right. Okay, so we've got Ethan the Cabin Boy, Sailor Squa- Sailor Squash- Squashy? First Mate Big B, what does that stand for? Big Bollocks. Quartermaster Stampy and Captain TDM. TDM, TD- what a weird name. What does that stand for? Um, the dump truck molester? Seriously, I don't know who these fucking people are. That's fine, they can do their own- Oh my god! Get off of my face! These white pillows stood no chance against Dan the dump truck molester's electric blue hair. <laughs> That's me on Bluetooth! <laughs> this unicorn is lit! New tube, check out my channel. Views 4,110,212, subs 25, 000. okay, to be fair, I kind of like that idea, you know? That's a, that's a relatively small YouTuber in comparison to most, so I think that's pretty cool that they're supporting more independent creators. Dungeons and dogs? Stampy's dog Alex was right at home as the dungeon master for a game of Dungeons and Dragons with Squashy. I'm assuming that they're um, in a relationship. Yeah, not Stampy and Squashy, Stampy and the dog. Big bollock dance. <laughs> <laughs> no! Check out Big Bollocks Stats 2's 
Fuck off! Okay, here we go. So we've got Ethan Gamer here. We chat summer holidays, movies, and must play games with Ethan Gamer, alright? I don't know who this guy is, I'm just reading what's here. What are your summer essentials? My scooter, my friend's scooter. Yeah, this is definitely for kids. Okay, sorry guys, you didn't tune into Leafy is here. Um, I'm not gonna be taking the piss out of um, these poor innocent kids or anything like that. I just find it... Ugh, excuse me! I just find it kind of funny how um, stuff like when I was younger, scooters were... No, you just did not do scooters. If you did scooters, you would be kicked very hard in your nose. So I just find it kind of fascinating how like nowadays it's like, Oh yeah, I'm proud of being a scooterer and stuff and it's just like... It's a different time, I get that, but it, I find it so funny how trends move along and how I got bullied for this shit, but kids nowadays, it's its totally cool. And they've got access to social media. It's brilliant, isn't it? Ethan Graham. I think I had a bowl of Ethan Grahams once. Okay, so I'm not going to stay here too long because I have no fucking idea about anything to do with Fortnite, but I'm going to just have a quick look here. Victory Royale. Getting to number one in Fortnite is tough work, but totally worth the celebration at the end. Dan the Duck Truck Molester was determined to get a recording of himself winning a Victory Royale, and he delivered. He got so excited that he threw his controller. Bit bit selfish, isn't it? Someone someone spent a long time building that controller. Big Beast Design your own bot here. Well, okay, I ripped the page out and I don't know what they're talking about. Oh my god, I ripped out a lot of pages. Jesus fuck. Um, okay, what are we talking about? Oh, hex bugs. Okay, but let's go into these uh, mid this middle bit that I accidentally tore out, actually. YouTuber of the month. We got another YouTube shout out. I, I appreciate this. Mousy is a fun gamer who loves to play The Sims, Minecraft, even Harry Potter, Hogwarts Mystery. Isn't that that fucking piece of shit iOS game that coaxes kids out of their money because your Hogwarts student is being strangled by weeds? The only way is YouTube. Oh my god, we're doing the only Ways Essex, but with YouTube. Mmm, tastes like the tears of an eight year old racist card player. <laughs> okay, speaking of eating, that has just reminded me. I've. I went through my free gifts, didn't I? And I. I didn't actually get. I didn't get the fucking Tango Suite! Someone stole it! I mean, I was so distracted by this, but that was the main reason I picked this fucking thing up. I think, actually, the, um, how much did I spend on this? The four ninety nine I spent on this fucking magazine. I think I spent the money on the Tango Suite and the magazine came free. Kids call it with a Z. Oh my god, I hate this shit. Games, Nintendo Switch, Donkey Kong, Tropical Freeze. Con, it's the original Wii U version of the game with a twist. Tropical Freeze comes with a new funky version, which is a lot harder. I love the new character Funky Con- that's the easy mode, dude. Paladone, Nintendo Game Boy Watch. This watch is so cool, it's shaped like the original Nintendo Game Boy. Also, the alarm is the original Mario Land theme tune. It's awesome. How do you know what a Game Boy is? Nintendo Labo, Toy Con 1 Variety Kit. I don't care. Toys, my favourites are the Ratchet and Clank toys. They are so cuddly. Yeah, you know, the classic game from PlayStation. Clank and Parappa. <laughs> the best new games you can play right now, okay? Donkey Kong Tropical... <laughs> Fucking come on! Owlboy, 7 out of 10. Oh my god, I can imagine a load of people would be pissed off over that rating. Jesus Christ. One word reviews. Mr. Bean, Risky Ropes, Rocky. Super Doggo Snack Time, Tasty, 8 out of 10. I feel sorry for the developers of Owlboy. F2 Fact File, it's fucking football. I, I could see that coming a mile away. Jezza got to the semi-finals of Britain's Got Talent back in 2008. And 10 years later, he ended up in a gaming magazine with Sonic Boo. Roblox, awesome rides. Oh dear. <coughs> yeah, I'm not bothering with any of this shit. Let's um, have a look at what else there is. Top 10 Minecraft landmark builds. The White House. It's time to feel what it's like to be president of the overworld. <laughs> and they've put the fucking president as a creeper. Are they trying to say something? Big Ben. This build includes all of Westminster Palace and has a giant cock. Walt Disney World. Holy shit, that's actually amazing. I'd actually, I'd, I'd get Minecraft again to check that out, wherever it is. Um, But they haven't... Get out of the way. They haven't, like, told us where to find any of this shit, or YouTube links, or credit. I, I, so, useless. Best of the web, here we go. Labo Live, over on YouTube, people are posting visits and playing songs on the Labo piano from Mario, Zelda, Tetris, and even All Star from Shrek. You mean by Smash Mouth, yeah? Shrek didn't fucking sing it. Meme of the month. I'm reading a magazine where there is a meme of the month. Fuck me, what am I doing in my life? 110% want. Um, Argos, £174.99. Sennheiser Game Zero gaming headset. Yeah, because everyone can afford that. Become an epic gamer. Oh, fucking no. Not even kidding, there is nothing going on on this page. I'm just gonna go to, we're nearly at the end. Oh no, this is the last page. Oh, I, I was having so much fun. The random round. Get silly with, dang, that's a long name as we ask. Okay, I don't know who this guy is. I like that username, pretty cool. The Become a minion or a cat? A cat, obviously. Y yes, obviously. Why the fuck would you want to become a minion against a cat? Why would you want to be a minion? You want to be that? 
You want to be that. Silliness rating, eight. Verdict, oh wow, dang, that's a long name, is silly. Also, the answer to question two, The Sims or Minecraft? I'd love both, but I'd have to say Minecraft for recording. Eight out of ten, silly. He's very... He's so, he's so silly, can't control him. And there we go, I just had a look at one of the worst things I've ever seen and spent money on for your enjoyment. I would say that I'm gonna go off and enjoy my Tango Suite, but as we've discussed, someone had it before me, so I'm just gonna go back to the sofa and watch some TV instead. He's back and he's better than ever. Adam Sandler is a plate and don't forget to wash my ass. It's me, the Prince of Personality, Bubsy! What could possibly go wrong? And because I'm a hero for crying out loud- I've got a question for you all today. How many years of hate and violent beatdowns does it take for an old gaming mascot to just- Bugger off. Well, if Bubsy making a return on the PS4 is an answer to go by- IT TAKES TOO LONG! Holy mother of Bobcat bollocks, how did I end up back here? For those who are blissfully unaware of the terrible deeds committed by Bubsy the Bobcat ever since his debut in 1993, let me quickly fill you in. During the advent of character platformers being huge successes thanks to Mario and Sonic, causing platformer mascots to be as hot as Battle Royale games are today, every single company you could imagine tried getting their own cartoon character who could run and jump their way through Hellfire to save some random bitch or kick Dr. Machino in the butt, apparently. The company who made the Gears of War games and funnily enough, Fortnite? They had a mascot. The company who made that horrendous PS1 South Park game? They had a mascot. And another mascot. The company who makes WWE games today? They had a mascot. Guess who it was? No, no, seriously. For a company that makes sports games all about big old beefy boys beating their backs, guess who their attempt of a platforming mascot was in the 90s? It was a lonely and desperate time. The point is, everyone wanted a slice of the platforming pie in the early to mid 90s, which led to a company known as Accolade, who also made this game, who also made this game, to develop a game known as Bubsy, Claws Encounters of the Third C <laughs> Kiss my ass. What happens when you mix busy and dense Mario level design with the speed of Sonic and the fragility of Crash Bandicoot? You get a total mess that might as well be called Bubsy the Copycat. Bubsy 1 has its fans, but God, that's all it has. I personally can't stand the game, nor its sequel, which is more of the exact same, but with more original video. Visual ideas. The Jaguar game can crawl into a hole and die along with the Jaguar itself, while an actual Jaguar comes in to eat them both and vomit them up again and then die. And as for the first time Bubsy entered the realm of 3D platformers, I took a look at that game a few years back. You piece of shit, floating in a bit of cold soup garnish with even more shit from an old obese man's I didn't like it. What I really admire though is that despite the malice towards the character and the failure of the absolutely terrible and rightly cancelled TV pilot, Accolade didn't let any of that get them down until they dropped Bubsy forever. And so another company known as Black Forest Games came out of absolutely nowhere and decided to lift the noose off of Bubsy's neck and resuscitate him, ready for a comeback to the PS4 and PC in 2017. Nobody asked for it, but enough of you memed him to make it a reality. And the moral of the story, boys and girls, is that MEMES ARE SHIT! <laughs> Time to play the game! Oh, what's this then? I thought I was playing a 2017 Steam game, not RuneScape. Bubsy, the Woolies Strike Back. Thank the Lord it's not the Willy Strike Back because having three on your head is more than enough for me. Okay, so say what you want about the previous Bubsy games. At least Bubsy 3D had a sodding intro cutscene. Something to drive what little story there was and make you care about that. Yeah, I know it didn't work, but the point is that it's 20 times better than what this 2017 modern indie game can muster. You get 10 seconds of an intro to this game, all in still images. There's a wall, there's a rumbling, there's a knob, there's the bad guys taking away some random golden wool, and the title screen happens. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, I don't know, everything. But it gets even better. Not only was that intro cutscene flaccid and pathetic, but you start the game up, pick level one of the tutorial, and without any kind of flashy build-up, excitement, interesting loading screen, clever jokes, or anything, you're just jump cutted and plonk straight into the game. Like, I'm totally stunned here. For all the meme status and the new devs riding on the love-hate Bubsy train to build this game up, I'm actually shocked there isn't any kind of, well, fanfare going on to kick things off. There's nothing even self-referential or nostalgic for actual fans of Bubsy as well. I'm five minutes into this game and everything has just happened so far with no flow, no reason. And you go through all of this toss for a game that actually controls pretty decently. Didn't expect me to say that, did you? I'm not joking, the game actually controls pretty well. The physics are what I'd hoped they would be, the running speed is perfect for the camera distance, Bubsy's glide is extremely smooth to use, the jump arc and mid-air control are on point. Bubsy, why are you making me feel this way? Stop confusing everyone. Look, you're even scaring the collectibles away. What the actual hell is going on with the yarn here? I can assure you this is not my PC. I can run Far Cry 5 on high graphic settings at 60 FPS flawlessly, and I restarted the game multiple times fiddling with the graphics options because there's no way to do that within the game itself. 
Fuck And yet, no matter what I did, these Windows 95 R's options menus didn't change anything or address the slight problem that, oh, I don't know, the collectibles that appear in a platformer with collectibles don't show up! But sometimes they do. It just depends on where you are in relation to the objects, and I can't figure out what the hell the game is trying to pull here. This isn't only even in the collectibles either. Look at that rock. It's on fire here. And then it isn't. But then something happened in one of the later stages, and this something almost made me figure out what the problem was. Look, this is actually some kind of imprint at the very beginning of this stage, superimposed as an extra layer on the game itself, but only as an invisible layer that hides any object around its outlines. Either I have accidentally picked the hard mode of this game, or this is an ingenious artistic metaphor to the fact that Bubsy himself has burned his image into your retinas, into your subconscious, and no matter what game you play, no matter what genre, how modern or old, he will always be there, lurking in the background as a phantom, distracting you from the tasks and obscuring the important things you should be doing, but you cannot, for he is always there, in the way, forever. Or it's just... shy. And yeah, this may be a step up from Bubsy's last game not like that saying much, but even if this weird glitch weren't a problem, this wouldn't save the game from how bloody boring it looks. Well, except for those moments when you're climbing a wall and then hit an enemy's head which causes you to climb upwards really fast, that's pretty interesting. I mean, just look at it. If there's one thing you can commend the original games on, it's that they at least had creatively messed up and interestingly animated stages, but here? I'm falling asleep just looking at this, and while I sleep, I dream of the end. Hell, I would honestly rather look at Bubsy 3D over this crap, because at least you could argue that game has some abstract blocky designs and striking colour to it to make it more memorable despite how awful it looks. This is just, well, what can I say about it? Basic animations across the board, basic uninspired obstacles copied and pasted absolutely everywhere, enemies that either disappear the second you kill them, or just hang around and then jump cut out of existence. In fact, as I write this script, I'm not even looking at gameplay and I can tell you that I don't even trust my own notes because I don't remember how this game looks right now. Bubsy is making me curmudgeonly. It's so forgettable, and the same can be said for the music, which repeats the same stock loops over most of the stages I managed to be able to stomach before my acid reflux happened. No joke, this is a stage from World 1. And this is a stage from World 2. Not same music and basically the exact same style of visuals but just coloured a little bit differently with different objects. I wish I could say more but I can't, it's just so damn boring. Try pouncing to attack enemies, well that's easy for you to say Mr. Game but have you actually tried to do that yourself? It's useless, you either fly over everything immediately into danger or it just doesn't work at all so instead why don't you try pouncing to make a better game. Well, I mean, despite the fact this game is so bad, even the collectibles don't want to be in it, I still somehow managed to grab 399 out of 400 yarn on the tutorial stage. Celebration of my impeccable skill aside, though, the gameplay itself doesn't serve much better on its own anyway. Everything you've seen so far, this is the whole game. Every single bit of it. Run from left to right, jump, glide, climb around, bop enemies, collect weird vanishing yarn, and smash into obstacles that will occasionally let you in on a special secret. That's it, though. That's the whole game, and the importance of collecting the world is for your score and your score. Even keys that unlock the special vault in each level, yeah, they just let you grab more yarn for your score. Why give us a tally and make these things the most prominent collectible, and even hide optional collectibles for access to a locked off part of the stage if none of it means anything? And furthermore, why is there absolutely nothing else going on here? Ignoring the fact you can bypass everything because there's nothing of any value to help you out on your quest, no power-ups or anything, this is some of the most insipid level design for a platformer I have ever seen. The copied and pasted obstacles and enemies certainly help out with the blandness and repetition, but what's with the vast amounts of nothing? What's with the random walls everywhere forming extremely basic paths? What's with the lack of anything interesting that looks like it's actually built into the stage? What's with the spring pads that don't serve any purpose of the level design other than to spring you upwards for no reason? It feels like you're platforming not through carefully thought out stages, but instead a custom Smash Brothers brawl stage made by a 12 year old boy who has more spots on his face than brain cells. It's just the most basic of elements and environments placed on top of a flat background like shelves nailed on a flat wall in Ikea but it's one of those shelf and wall sets that nobody really likes or cares about so they put them at the back of Ikea because it's only for the old people who get lost in there. There's nothing to say about any of it other than how boring it looks, how boring it feels, how boring it's designed. I'm running out of ways to say it sucks because god it does. And it's worth mentioning at this point that on Steam I paid £15.49 for this. Hey Siri, how much is £15.49 in dollars? £15.49 and pence in dollars is still far too much for Bubsy's Willy Strikes Back. Wait, wait, and you have to go through all of this fuss over golden wool. What's so great about that? What can you do with golden wool anyway? Isn't it too stiff? What are you supposed to do? Knit yourself some stiff golden socks to wear while you keep snuggly in your stiff golden jumper while sucking on your stiff golden blanket? 
<laughs> Good God, that was a violent death. What was with that noise? That seems highly unnecessary. But at the same time, it's Bubsy, so it feels good. Oh, come on. You know I'm your hero. Oh, and by the way, Bubsy, you blundering, brainless, boorish bastard. Why don't you ever shut up? I get it. You have a mouth. That's fine. But you don't need to use it all the time. How am I gliding? I'm unstoppable. Gliding down. <laughs> Bubsy's on a pouncing spray. So shiny. <laughs> That's one of the main reasons people couldn't stand you in the 90s. <laughs> But hey, this is a modern game after all, so maybe there's something in the options menu to remove the voices entirely. That would be very nice. Oh look, there is. And there's even cute little descriptions for each level of how talkative you want Bubsy to be. So that there's the lowest. Okay, let's just rename that to tolerable. But what on earth could they possibly call the highest level? Bubsy. Bubsy. Bubsy! Did you know they released this game on Halloween? Yeah, I'm not joking. They, they knew how terrifying this was. I don't know how much longer I can go on now. Let's at least get the first boss out of the way and see what happens. And wouldn't you know, I got hit by a big old fire attack that was invisible. And at the end of the fight, I smashed the UFO into the corner. Definitely should have got mauled into bobcat paste, but I didn't. Which then ended the fight because Bubsy may as well be a vampire with how much he refuses to die. Why does this exist? Who asked for it? And more importantly, how is it that a game series that hasn't seen the light of day in 21 years comes back with a game this bad? It's boring. It's ugly. I don't know which is worse. I might just split my pants now if I don't die laughing first. The world was a lot different in the 90s. With barely any internet, information and jokes being spread around to millions of people was almost unheard of without TV, movie or magazine endorsement. And if you were terrible, the public voted with their wallets and you'd never be heard of again. But nowadays, where Bubsy used to be just a pest, he's now an ironic meme god. And this game is the perfect time capsule for the future of how a company could cash in on this infamous status of something without any further care put into the product itself because you buy it almost expecting it to be awful. Awful. And that's the joke that you're paying for. But it's a joke at your expense. You spent this much money on it. I could have bought a McDonald's meal out for my family with that money, but instead I'm sat here, alone, hungry, looking at my knobbly knees in disgust as I wonder how my life ended up here all because of an orange freak. Bungie Bobcat here. I want you to die! Knock knock. Who's there? <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Hey everybody, I'm back and guess what I found? Peppa Pig has an official magazine, didn't you know? I didn't know, but you know, I figured I've already done a Kerekaris about Peppa Pig the show. <laughs> and I've done a Kerekaris about Peppa Pig's um, DS game. Bursting bubbles is quite hard work. So why not talk about the other thing that kids are massively into along with television and Nintendo DS, which is bits of paper. I didn't think it could get much worse than um, a gaming magazine for tweens, but here we are with a Peppa Pig magazine. Once again, this is the first time I'm looking at any of this. As you can see, it's sealed. I mean, there's a bit of a hole there, but I mean, you know what kids are like. They, they think everything belongs to them, especially this that thing, and I'm just gonna go off script and react to what I'm seeing. I should probably get a pen, shouldn't I? Because there's, there's gonna be some activities, isn't there? I mean, I would read the front of the bag, but there is absolutely nothing. Peppa Pig's bag of fun. <laughs> Is that George's cup of fun? There we go, I've got a Pikachu pen for the occasion. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of different activities and things to color and things to draw. So I figured I might as well use the pen of something that's actually good to um, rip into something that isn't very good. And isn't that funny? I ripped into Peppa Pig before, but now I actually get to rip into her. Like literally rip, look. Okay, so these are the free gifts. I, I don't know what any of these are, but let's let's have a quick look here. Oh, I see. So you spin it around. I guess these are outdoor. Oh Jesus! I guess these are outdoor toys. Um, yeah, you just spin it around, and then it um, it tells you what what you want to do. So ready, let's jump. Ready, let's. It broke. Ready, let's. Run? Very good idea! I don't know about you guys, I always find it confusing when um, things like television shows and magazines, which you usually like partake in the activity indoors, start trying to tell you to go up and about and oh my god, what is that? I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see that, there is some gunk on this. There is some white gunk 
I think someone likes pigs too much. Okay, what else have we got here? We have got a, um, it, 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 it. It's a piece of shit. Okay, wait a minute, let's see if I can get this to um, actually do something. It doesn't even make a satisfying noise when you rip it to pieces, so overall I'm very disappointed. And what else have we got? We have got a glitter, my favourite. Oh my god, it's covered all over the... Oh no. Speaking as somebody who has lived with my girlfriend's kids, little girls specifically, glitter is the <laughs> devil's spawn. It's it's like I don't like glitter. It's it's coarse and rough and irritating. It gets everywhere. But hey, we got a little um fake terrible looking trophy to um oodle at while we're getting on with the rest of it. So what's this here? Um we have got also, oh, this is gar this is garden games. That's what it says at the top there. Garden games. Okay, so this is this was meant to be played in the garden. We have got a peep. We got to peep a pig. <coughs> that I was not expecting that noise. I was expecting something quite high pitched. <coughs> Weirdly enough, you have the je the more gentle you blow, the better the noise. But the harder you blow, <coughs> it doesn't make any noise at all. So um. This can be my stranger danger whistle. So what else have we got here? We have got a, a magic, a, a swimming magic painting book. Okay, use a clean paintbrush to add water to make the colors appear on the page inside. Oh, and this is based on my, one of my favorite Peppa Pig episodes, the one where everyone's rude and horrible and everyone deserves to die. It says that I've got to use a paintbrush, but I honestly don't want to do that. I think instead of using a paintbrush, I'm going to spit on the ones that I like and rub that in instead. Pepper and George are going swimming. Rebecca and Richard Rabbit want to swim too. Pepper and Rebecca make big splashes. Daddy says he can make the biggest splash. <laughs> oh wait! <laughs> Hooray! Daddy really does make the biggest splashes. Bloody hell. Well, I mean, I can make a big splash. You want to see that? <laughs> I wasn't expecting much from this colouring booking thing, but can you see it? the I've spat all over it and the colours have actually come through pretty well. This is actually kind of incredible. I've, I figured like it says use a paintbrush. Kids don't use paintbrushes. Kids like gob up and throw up everywhere. So yeah, just use your bodily fluids, kids. Oh, this is where I get a bit, yeah. I've done it on one side of the page. It's now seeped through into the other side of the page. Very bad quality and I'm going to tear it in half. So let's carry on with the rest of this magazine then. So that's the four pepper gifts all done. What's in here actually to read? Oh my God. Not even joking, that is the first thing I see when I opened this bloody magazine up. Absolutely horrifying. So we've got um, a colouring book here. There's really not much to say about any of this. It's just very basic pictures. But the funny thing is, is that I hate the art style of the show itself because of all like the overlapping lines and stuff. But now it's like, it's, a, it's an official colouring book. Kids can draw better than the official artwork. What's the point of having a colouring book when they can draw better themselves? You know what, I'm gonna add my own little caddy touch to these lovely pieces of artwork. I'm gonna get my pen per pig out. There we go, I think that's perfectly appropriate for the kitty winks. But other than that, I mean, it's a colouring book. It's nice for kids that want to spend, force their parents to spend the money on the magazine. Um, it's very simplistic, I, I really, there's there's so little to work with with Peppa Pig, this is what you need to understand. Anyway, here's the main event, the Peppa Pig official magazine, so let's open it up and see what the first thing is that... Oh. Oh look, we've got some free stickers to begin with, let's get the stickers out, let's do that. I've always wanted to be a knobhead, and now I can be. Daddy Pig loves Caddy's ear canal. <laughs> and obviously if I'm gonna have, um... Is it Mr. Potato? I forgot what his name is. I'm gonna have him on my head. I'm gonna have to have George on my cheek. And um, we got banana, some balloons, and a, is that a donkey? I, I don't even know what that's supposed to be. Some kind of cave dwelling cryptid. Anyway, let's carry on. Oh, oh, whoopsie daisy. It turns out I was supposed to put the stickers on in the book itself. It's a sticker page. These aren't stickers for your face. They're stickers for the magazine. Bloody. This magazine belongs to, it belongs to me. Oh my God, this is interesting. So there's a grown-ups instructions part here. Grown-ups, provide your child with a pencil and a set of coloured crayons. Okay, fair enough. Allow your child to feel in charge of the magazine. This is some cult level stuff here. Encourage your child to talk about what they're doing. Praise and offer encouragement to make learning a rewarding, enjoyable experience for you and your child. Okay, but if you're teaching your kids that Peppa Pig is the fountain of all knowledge and the where you should get all your manners and where you should get all of your 
behavioural traits from you failed as a parent. No, George! Hello everyone, Mr. Potato here. Are you ready to do some exercise? Come on, George, let's join in. <laughs> hee 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 ha ha ha, no. It's very important to exercise to stay healthy. That's why you can see me opening a brand new sports centre in town today. Wow! Mummy, can we go and see Mr. Potato? It's a long way to go and see a potato, Pepper. That is the best answer you could have given that bloody shitty child. He's not any old potato, please. Oh, all right. Story writing. Bliss. At the sports centre. Hello everyone. <laughs> Hello Pepper. <laughs> we thought you were Mr. Potato. Oink. Wait, I thought it was Snort. Are we going? Are we jumping from Snort to Oink? You can't go from Snort to Oink that quickly. You'll you'll get whiplash. You don't look like Mr. Potato. No, you're much too big. Who are we talking to? I actually. Th this is so badly. D I don't know who's talking to who. Are they talking about Daddy Pig being too big or the? That thing? If you're talking about Mr. Potato right here, he's bigger than all of them, so how can he be much too big to be Mr. Potato? I don't understand. Sing with Pepper and her friends. <laughs> Time to add my own little um, personal um, caddy touch onto the lovely picture that we have there. Mr. Potato has arrived. Thank God I was getting worried. Add your jigsaw stickers to the picture. What jigsaw stickers? I actually haven't got any jigsaw stickers. What are they talking about? I actually don't have jigsaw stickers here. Jigsaw sticker here, jigsaw sticker there. I've got, I've got a grape. You want me to put a grape, grape there? I've got a, I've got two lovely bouncing oranges. I could just stick them there if you want. Beep, beep, look everyone. He's here. Please welcome your friend and mine, Mr. Potato. Everyone cheers for Mr. Potato. How many times have they got to say Mr. Bloody Sodding Potato? Pop down your yellow letter stickers to finish the- I don't have them. I actually just don't have these stickers. I don't know what they're talking about. Wow, that's a big potato. He he. I declare this new sports center open. Great. So what happens inside the sports center? Mr. Potato looks around the sports center. Why does he need to do it? He built the bloody thing. Pop Mr. Potato here. What? Pop him in the face. <laughs> Fantastic. As well as exercise, we need to eat fruit and vegetables to keep us healthy. Yes, Daddy Pig knows all about that. Mr. Potato chats with the children. <laughs> Which fruits and vegetables should we eat, Mr. Potato? Him. Apples, oranges, carrots, tomatoes. What about potatoes? Uh, yeah, he's not too sure about that one, is he? Although, to be fair, I'm feeling like a potato myself. It got stuck on my finger. Let's create, design your own super fruit or vegetable. What would their costume be like? What will you call them? My superhero is Mr. Horn. Guess what his superpower is? It's hiding all the way down there. We watch your show every morning. Very good. Remember to send me all your drawings. We will. <laughs> <laughs> the next day. Today, children, we will do some drawings for Mr. Potato. <laughs> I want to draw a pineapple. I'm going to draw a carrot. Very good, Rebecca. Okay, now, I remember in my Peppa Pig video I did about the show, this is an episode. How much did I spend on this? Like, f five pounds, not including the ham as well. You're conning parents out of their money. You're conning parents out of their time by making them sit there and watch the show in the first place. So that's not exactly fair. What have the children drawn? Pop the pineapple and carrot drawing stickers on Danny and Rebecca's paper. I don't have any of those stickers. So their drawings can be as empty and miserable as their home life. How many children? Too many. Pepper's Gallery. Okay, let's not start making fun of kid drawings and stuff. Again, this channel is not leafy as here. We've got other... We've got bigger fish to fry. What the hell happened here? Excuse me. Excuse me. I spent five whole English pounds on this magazine. What is going on with this? If I spend five pounds on a Peppa Pig magazine, I expect perfection, not this worn, scratched up car paint magazine. Let's colour. Use the splats to help you colour. You don't want to do that, kids, because you're too young. Excellent. We'll put all of your drawings in an envelope and post them to Mr. Potato. A few days later, how many piggies? More food. What did Pepper and her friends send to Mr. Potato? Colour the correct tick to answer. Flowers, hats or drawings? Your attention span can't be that bad that a page ago you've already forgotten what it was, right? We sent Mr. Potato some drawings. Did you get the drawings, Mr. Potato? Silly daddy, he can't hear you, he's on the television. <laughs> daddy Pig, I am calling social services on you because you're clearly completely inept to look after children. Mr. Potato looks at some pictures. I've received an envelope full of drawings. This tomato looks very juicy. Tomato! <laughs> What's that written there for? That's your picture, George. Oink! Hee 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 hee! Join in, read the clues and use the picture stickers to give Pepper and George the things that- You know what, I really, really don't care about any of this, so instead of that, um, what the- Pepper, what is that? Where did you get that from? Have you been to Victoria's Secret again? So instead of um, actually doing anything that the magazine is asking me to do, I'm actually just going to um, tear these pages out here and I'm going to see how tasty um, Pepper Pig's meat is. <laughs> if it was legal, 
to grind up snotty, bratty, horrible children into a paste and spread it on toast. I think this is what it would taste like. I also want to point out that by ripping out this page in particular, I've made things unintentionally terrifying. This picture here, it shows Daddy Pig watching television. Hmm, I think Daddy Pig needs some exercise. Well then how would you expect your shiting show to run if no one's allowed to watch the telly which you are on? Mr. Potato wants Daddy Pig to join in. Yeah, if you never had roast potatoes and sausages before, it's a fantastic combination. Come on, Daddy Pig, are you ready to do some exercises with me? Uh, what? Come on, Daddy, let's do some exercises with Mr. Potato. Oh, all right, Pepper. Oh, oh, oh. It doesn't take any more than one convincing word from any character in this series to change everybody's minds. There's no point writing the dialogue like this if it's just back and forth like this, just... I wanna do this. I don't. Come on. Oh, all right then. Like, that's not dialogue. Every single scene plays out like, George has got his retractable teeth out. He's thirsty for flesh. Oh, and here we have an advertisement for Peppa Pig World. I really think I should probably go there just for the laughs and make a video. I don't know. Young Town, is that you? What are you doing at Peppa Pig World? Let's make fruit smoothies. Let's not. I should probably put that page back. I can't read it otherwise. Daddy Pig oh. likes jumping up and down. Yeah, this is the same as the episode because Daddy Pig doesn't like jumping because that's why he's so fat. Daddy Pig needs some exercise. Hey? What? That's the point. He doesn't exercise. So how does he like doing that if he doesn't ever do it himself? What's this? You're having a laugh. These are the stickers. Okay. Considering, seriously for a sec, the fact that these very important stickers, and the funny thing is is that, yeah, look, they're, they're, they're random. Like, so we've got page six stickers here and page eight to nine stickers here. So they're completely, they're different. Like, it's not like the beginning part of the book and the ending part of the book. They're completely dotted all over the place. And considering it is for such young children, how are you supposed to know to go to the back of the book first in order to put the stickers in for the front of the book? Th that's the dumbest design choice I've ever seen in a kid's magazine where there's things to stick on your face. Certificate of Pepper Fun. Draw a picture of you in the hula hoop. There you go, that's me, because that's how you make me feel, Pepper. You little bastard. Cut out fun. I'll ask an adult helper to cut along the dotted black. <laughs> <laughs> I am my own adult helper, thank you very much. I don't need scissors where where we're going, we don't need scissors. Actually kind of surprised how accurately I managed to rip around the edges. I mean it's not perfect, but what am I what do I do with these? Do some exercises. How? What do I do with these cutouts? Do I fold them? I HATE THIS BOTTLE! There you go everybody, that was the Peppa Pig magazine. Was it as good as the show? Was it as good as the game? No, it was just as bad as both of them, and it was so awful that it makes me want to shove Mr. Potato up my- Sandy, would you like some bacon? Do you want some bacon? Go on then! Oh, even the dog doesn't- you're... Daddy Pig, you aren't even good enough for the dog to eat. I'm not joking everyone. This video series was absolute hell to make and I sat right here in this very spot only a few days ago and said to myself Oh, all of the Mega Man games are just about half an hour long. I could do all of the games in one big video before Mega Man 11 comes out. But no. I couldn't be any more wrong. After a total of 35 hours of gameplay later, no sleep due to anger and stress, nearly 150 recorded clips and almost shattering two controllers, I'm now a broken man. But hey, at least I got some videos out of it, right? <laughs> but why, pray tell, did it take me that long to finish a collection of mostly dinky NES games? Well, make yourself comfortable, sit back, get yourself a nice hot drink in your mega mug. M m mugger man. M Mugman and share in my anguish as we all dive into the world of every single classic Mega Man game. Yes, every single one, one to ten, kill me! So, Mega Man, he was invented for the NES in 1987 by Capcom, known in Japan as Rockman. His design is iconic, he's never far away from that trusty arm cannon also known as the Mega Buster. His music is always incredible no matter the game, his gameplay is consistent and classic 2D run jumping and gunning action. And all this led to not only nine classic sequels so far, but also spin-offs, new franchises and sequels to those spin-offs and franchises. Oh yeah, and they're also known for being so brutally difficult to the point of making you want to rip your naughty bits off. 
What you see is what you get with Mega Man, so there isn't that much point going into a lot of depth this early on. They all look basically the same, but with their own little mechanical differences, but many things do remain consistent for the gameplay. Most of the stages you can pick from will last you up to four minutes at most if you know what you're doing and don't die. You get new weapons with their own ammo count after each boss you defeat known as Robot Masters, and those very same Robot Masters are based around a rock, paper, scissors design where you need to experiment with other boss weapons to figure out what weaknesses that boss has against what weapon. And at least back in the 80s and early 90s, most of the longevity with the games came from the constant replaying of each stage to get better at them, using the boss weapons to clear trickier parts, and trial and erroring your way to the finish line by guessing what attack to use on what boss at the end. Not only that, all of the games allow you to pick any stage in any order you want to do, so even though short by design, replayability is a big selling point here. That and with the final parts of each game, you'll find yourself doing them over and over again because of how bullshitty they can get. Either way, Mega Man 11 was announced pretty recently, and at the time of this video's publishing, it's scheduled to be released on October 2nd, 2018, eight years after Mega Man 10. And I personally wanted to do a Catechorus all about Mega Man 11 since I did Mega Man 8 on my channel, the only PS1 entry of the classic Mega Man series. But in order to celebrate 11, I figured I needed to have a little bit more experience with the series and so decided to pick up both of the legacy collections on Steam and go through every classic game all in one go back to back so that I knew what I was talking about. Now, personally, I've only played Mega Man Powered Up, the Mega Man 1 remake, Mega Man 2, a little bit of 3 and 8, so I am far from an experienced player, but now I'm pretty experienced, I can tell you that much. I'm sorry it took so long for this video to get done, and I'm sorry it wasn't in one big video, but as I'm sure you can imagine, this was very painful. I did not expect it to be this difficult, so here we are with part one at least. Without further ado, let's go. Okay, so what's the story here? Dr. Light is a jolly old Santa who, thanks to his genius, develops many different types of robot masters for help in industrial jobs. However, six of these start going wrong out of nowhere and start attacking the city of buildings, leading him to suspect that his old jealous rival Dr. Wily is behind the malfunctions in order to get back at him for his success. Turns out he's right and Dr. Wily actually wants to take over the world with these robot masters as you do, and so Rock, Dr. Light's robot assistant, embedded with a strong sense of right and wrong, offers his body to be converted into Mega Man in order to stop the nefarious Wily once and for all. Nice and simple but effective, it's the 80s after all, so onto the game itself. Well, to pardon the pun, my relationship with Mega Man 1 started off Rocky. I had to learn how Mega Man worked all those years ago, and it wasn't as smooth of a start as I was hoping. I mean, you know you're playing an old game when you have a silent title screen and then jump straight into a stage select with no warning at all, even though for 1987 being able to pick your own stage to do at your own time was kind of groundbreaking. I decided to start with Cutman because I thought he could help me with my throat in case these games ruin my soul, and then the first screen pops up and immediately gives me shit with this smirking mm. piss face constantly attacking me. I then experienced reloading after death right into enemy pathways, areas where I swear it's impossible to not get here and slow down. To top it off, I got to the fight with Edward Scissorhead and he appeared to know exactly where I was going to be every millisecond of the battle until I died in complete misery once I realised I had another nine games to go after this. So I decided to restart the game, which is when I discovered these really cool art backgrounds unique to every game on the Legacy Collection. Now we look better, I'm expecting the game to give me nonsense, and I'm ready. It was then I discovered that the key to Mega Man 1 for the most part is just going for it. Ignore your instincts and just don't think about what you're doing and you'll find yourself breezing through many of the stages. Mega Man 1 more than anything punishes hesitation and panicking. So get confident, go for it, and you should be golden most of the time. It also doesn't help how enemies can shoot through objects, which really sucks, but luckily enough, so can you, so use that to your advantage whenever you can, since Mega Man for some ungodly reason can't point his Mega Buster arm cannon in any direction other than straight ahead or behind him. This does make some parts unnecessarily tricky for sure, but that's what the boss weapons are used for, so you can't complain that much. Think of the Mega Buster like the whip in classic Castlevania. It does the job just fine, but don't rely on it all the time and try to use sub weapons as much as you can. So anyway, I beat the first boss Cutman and I get a fantastic victory tune that really makes you feel like you overcame a true hurdle in your quest. <laughs> Yay, one down and another. How many more to go? The soundtrack itself overall I found alright. Not like Castlevania levels of kick ass, but for the late 80s it's great enough for the run and gun action and extremely catchy and memorable. The visuals aren't as meticulous and detailed as Castlevania either, and it may be a little too simplistic and empty for most, but it works with the faster paced nature of Mega Man. Either way, the game is at least nice and colourful enough, and the anime styled aesthetic mixed with the choppy blocky 8 bit pixels I actually really liked. It goes together really well, and Capcom seemed to like it too, since this style of Mega Man, these sprites 
assets especially, would be reused in every future game no matter how more detailed the backgrounds and bosses would get. I mean, look at Mega Man, he's pretty adorable as far as mascot characters go. Simplistic visuals don't mean simplistic gameplay though, because as far as the running gun action is concerned, this is a standard 8-bit tough-as-nails platform with all the old-school archaic horse waste to keep you on your toes. Or to just kill you for no reason at all, thanks so much for that game. There are so many jumps that give you no room for error, with ceilings blocking your head unless you hit jump at the pixel-perfect moment just before you fall off the edge. The knockback can be really unforgiving, some enemies throw so much bull at you that I'm convinced there's nothing you can do. The timing of the disappearing block segments are ridiculously precise and also include trick blocks to throw you off, and your full speed is so damn fast. Look at this. Mega Man plummets downwards faster than an elephant in a trapeze. It's almost like he just heard that hell was hiding at the bottom of the screen and thinks, Yep, sign me up! <laughs> I also just noticed a conspicuous lump on this drawing of Mega Man in the background of the game. This is a little distracting, I won't lie, but at least he doesn't look like... <laughs> All of this overly difficult nonsense though is to be expected, seeing as that this is a very short game, the shortest of the series easily. And the replayability aspect comes from what I said earlier, getting more weapons, tackling stages with those weapons to make things easier, and figuring out each Robot Master's weakness until you win the game. And to give Mega Man 1 credit, you can feasibly guess what each weapon will be effective for each robot on the character select screen without even jumping into a stage for the sake of even more trial and error on top of what's already here. The weaknesses are really creative as well and not blindingly obvious, Cutman's weapon can cut electric wires for instance. Bombs are usually used for blowing up rocks while mining. You can use fire to light the fuse of a bomb, etc. And even cooler, if you just so happen to have an ability on you, you can replay certain stages with those same powers to unlock additional routes for more optional goodies. Not just health and weapon ammo, but also the beam, the most useful item in the game by far. Yeah, get stuffed, flying platform pal! Get stuffed right in your stuffy little stuff stuff! <laughs> oh. One thing I really didn't appreciate though is at the final stage when going through Wily's fortress because, well, you need the beam here to get through, so no matter what predicament you find yourself in, you have to go back to Elecman's stage and find the damn thing. Which, unfortunately, I had to do. I mean, at least with finding the Robot Master's weaknesses, you can actually kill them all with the Mega Buster, just in case you got that far and don't want to replay the stage again with the correct power-up. But here, the power-up isn't a cool bonus like it should be for moments like this. It's a necessity and a bit of a prick move when it appears to be an optional item off the beaten path. But I suppose you'll probably game over at this point anyway, meaning you'll have have no excuse but to go back, so thanks game either way. Make sure you also don't change weapons during climbing a ladder because you'll fall, that's really nice, and don't let a single pixel of your body touch any spikes. Not a pixel. And not that pixels either, it's shit! And there's a lot of spikes in this game, so get used to it. Oh, and by the way, if you die, you lose a life, sure, and get your health back to full, sure, but you don't get your weapon energy back. So in many cases, especially against certain robot masters, if you waste all the weapon ammo, you might as well restart anyway. Oh, and sometimes the game does stuff like this. <laughs> What in the holy mother of bitch trees happened there? I'm also not the biggest fan of Mega Man's traction in this game. For some reason, he slips all over the place when he comes to a stop, making some singular block platforming unnecessarily painful. And speaking of painful, how about this bit that sees you going over bottomless pits with platforms that randomly shoot at you with no pattern while flying penguins are being thrown at you? I was really lucky enough to get through this part on my second try, but Christ on a bike, they sold this torture device to kids in the 80s. If it weren't for how huge and overpowered Elect Man's weapon is, many of these areas would be the end of me before even reaching the second game, but yeah, I do love this weapon. It just destroys everything and fires up and down and ahead. I also love those moments where the game rewards those who pay attention, like when you're dropping down here and you can steer yourself to grab a load of goodies if you're attentive enough to this part over here. And this part in Gutsman's stage with all the dropping rail platforms, many people's most hated bit, but I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a drummer. <laughs> But the rhythm and timing for this part I really didn't find that tricky. I mean, I died a few times for sure, but I didn't find it that difficult. It's quite a clever setup, actually. Oh! And you can slide up ladders. Worst boss in the game, though? Fireman. Easily. You aren't even a robot! You're an occupation! I hate you, Fireman! Sam! His pattern makes absolutely no sense. Look at this. It's too fast, impossible to dodge or predict, and he does so much damage. Oh, and the final part of this game can keel over and never wake up for all I care, even though it is brilliant how Dr. Wily bobs his eyebrows. <laughs> Oh, and how about that yellow bloody devil? This guy hits like a truck, has an extremely intricate and tricky to read and react attack pattern as he morphs from one end of the screen to the other, and some people like Some Call Me Johnny recommend using the Elect Man pause glitz trick to score multiple hits on him before he has another chance to do that stupid attack sequence again.
but I didn't. Oh yes, yeah, see this? I kicked this stupid pillock right in the nuts without using the trick at all, and I honestly found the challenge of learning the pattern extremely rewarding. Kind of like that part in Gutsman stage. I didn't think this was too bad after a few tries. I mean, it's still difficult, but not too bad. And if you get past all of this, get ready for more wily goodness with this boss, which I began with assuming the weakness was Gutsman's weapon since there were blocks here that you could throw at the boss, which it turned out to be the weakness. That's great, but if you do that at the start of the fight, you've lost. Because that means you can't jump over the thing while it moves around the arena unless you keep the blocks there. Oh, and by the way, the blocks don't respawn if you die, so just game over and start again. And once you even know all of this, it isn't too bad once again, but getting this far to only have the game bitch slap you is not fair at all. Even then, it's impossible to predict which end of the screen these things appear from, and therefore which end of the screen you should be on in order to 12 lords are leaping over it. And then you have a gauntlet rematch with every single robot master so far, which every game after this will do, so you would better remember the weaknesses and still have ammo left over, otherwise you will start all over again. If a little bit of luck is on your side though, get ready for Wily himself, and funnily enough, despite being two phases, he's one of the easier bosses in the game, especially compared to what you've just been through. At this point, you blow him up, Wily begs for forgiveness, and Mega Man does the truly heroic thing and leaves him there. You're an idiot. So obviously Wily's gonna come back and give us a sequel, but before we get there, can I just mention something? Overall, Mega Man 1 is all right. For a late 80s NES platformer in the first of a series, it's good enough. But the only reason I say that is because of the save feature that's present on the Legacy Collection. Without that, with all of the trial and error bullshit the game expects you to deal with, Capcom wanted you to do most of the game with three tries before a game over and needing to begin an entire stage all over again. If I had that misfortune, I wouldn't have gone any further with the game after Wily Stage 1, it gets that difficult. There's just too much guesswork and luck-based progression for me to say this is where you start if you want to get into Mega Man. It's the first of the series and hot damn does it feel like it. But after all of this and... Mega Man just leaving Wily at the scene of his own crime. This leads us on to Mega Man 2, what many people consider to be the best game in the series. In this game, Dr. Wily has returned, which is what happens when you run away, and he decides instead of relying on working robots to take over the world, he's gonna create his own instead to combat Mega Man, and jumps up from 6 to 8. Much simpler plot this time around for sure, but that doesn't matter because Mega Man 2 is fantastic. For a second game, it does a ton brilliantly. It isn't my personal favourite, but the jumping quality is definitely the most noticeable. Mega Man 2 is the same basic game as 1, but improved, well, practically everywhere, especially in the presentation. For an 80s NES game, the opening cutscene is completely epic along with a little bit of story text. The soundtrack is probably the best in the whole series too with its catchy, energetic and memorable melodies weaving in between hardcore beats and bass lines. And you can see how much more cool the game looks just from the improved animations and backgrounds and sprites for enemies and bosses alike. Just check out this transitional piece when you get new boss weapons. You even get to see Dr. Wily's fortress and honestly I get that they had a good base work to improve from Mega Man 1 but it feels like this is the proper start to the series. Well I mean they could have fixed the slippery feet but what are you gonna do? Unlike 1 where playing with the save states is the the only way I recommend you play the game. Two, on the other hand, is totally doable here just playing regularly because of how much fairer and tightly designed it is, and not just with the addition of collectible energy tanks that you can choose to use at the best points when at the end of a long stretch to get all of your health back. They've been a staple to the series ever since, and for good reason, they're incredible. There's no instances of off-screen damage or kills, well, except with Bubble Man's stage. You aren't swarmed with enemies at any point, and the bosses are all much easier to read and predict with their added animations, but still challenging. And that's the key with Mega Man 2. It's easy than one but still quite challenging. The balance is brilliant and every death here more or less feels like my fault. The game is designed not only better visually but that same level of quality can be seen with different and unique platforming and enemy management challenges for each stage. There's lots of special one-off set pieces and different things to test you like how fast you can read where you should drop down before dying or how hard you should push the jump button to get over water obstacles without touching the one-hit kill spikes all while dealing with still tricky but way more manageable groups of enemies. There's a bit more thought here than the constant onslaught of running and jumping than one and a lot more tests of multitasking and managing multiple kinds of enemies while platforming, but the balance is the best bit of Mega Man 2. It's just right. You either have tricky, powerful enemies with little platforming hazards, or high platforming hazards with easier enemies to deal with, and there's more variety than one to boot. The weapons from bosses are also not only cooler to look at, but a hell of a lot more useful than one too, and all perform entirely differently depending on each situation in the stage. Which is perfect for replays because this game is short once again, but the way all the levels are designed, especially Crash Man's with all the ladders and dead ends, means that with the correct weapons, you can pick up even more stuff to keep your run going. And after some Robot Master stages, you even get a chance to unlock some of Dr. Light's environmental gadgets like Item 1, Item 2, and Item 3. 
I guess the guy in charge of naming things died the day before. And these give you all brand new ways to traverse levels, skip ridiculous parts of the game, and potentially give you more lives and E-Tanks to keep your run going. For an NES game without any save states, it's been very well thought out to be as accessible to new players as possible, as well as difficult to let you know that you're still playing a Mega Man game without you feeling like you should pour salt into your eyes and wring your own neck. And this is alongside all the cool features of the original game like Robot Master Weaknesses, which have all yet again created rock, paper, scissors mechanics. Metal blades can cut through wood, for instance, and even pop the bubbles. It makes sense to use something that stops time against something that's quick, and gusts of air could push something towards a crash. And everyone knows that bubbles can destroy heat. Okay, that's a stretch. Couldn't tell you how Air Man is weak against leaves though, but I really don't care because- Jesus, he died quickly! Oh no, no, not the real Jesus. I heard that was very slow. The Metal Blades though, my god, possible contender for best boss weapon in the series. They are totally incredible, they fire very quickly, have tons of ammo, and allow you to fire in multiple directions, which means the Mega Buster is basically obsolete once you get it. Although why Mega Man can now move his own firing arm in eight directions while throwing heavy metal saw blades and can't while spitting out poxy pricking lemons, I have no idea. But more importantly, you can still slide up ladders. <laughs> Health is more readily available, but it's balanced within the more difficult moments. Instead of health being something that only appears at midnight during a blood moon on the third leap year of the century, like in 1, 2 sees health almost like a trade-off for when you take damage during a more intense moment. Unless you fall down a pit or touch spikes, of course. For example, if you don't have the means to attack the rabbit here in Woodman stage, because Mega Man's arm is so muscly he can't move it towards his own feet from fiddling with himself too much, it's fine because you can get complimentary insurance. And considering all the bottomless pits and dozens of tiny birds that can either drain your health or push you into your doom, in Air Man stage, they tend to drop a lot of ammo and health to apologise. To be fair though, this might be because I went with the normal difficulty instead of harder, or the fact that the Metal Blades are just so good that they make me want to dry hump the nearest inanimate object. <laughs> but overall, Mega Man 2 is just more fun, and even Wily is still having the time of his life. <laughs> Wily Fortress 1 begins and immediately kicks ass with the best song in the entire classic series if you ask me. It just sounds so good. <laughs> This is all followed up with classic Mega Man 2 gameplay. But then there's another boss much later on that can seriously do one. He has only one weakness, and even with a full energy bar of those bombs that you need to beat it, you can only still just about do it. If you die here after firing one bomb, you can't get any more ammo on this retry, meaning that you have lost the game. And equally, if you miss one shot, you have lost. Why this is here, I have no idea. It isn't challenging, isn't fair, and a serious flick in the gents for making it this far into such a tough but fair game, and stuff like this ruins the final run of Mega Man 2 towards Wily. It certainly has its highlights though, like the derpy bloody dragon that appears out of thin air to give you not only a chase sequence platforming challenge, but then a not too tricky bottomless pit boss. The only thing ruining it for me being the seizure, 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 seizure. Then there's another boss similar to the bubble machine thing from one, but the machines are smaller, easier to dodge, and it's just a better fight overall that doesn't rely on guesswork. And the next stage is more standard great Mega Man 2 gameplay with added tension, mixing water physics with funneling and instant death spikes. Which I did all my first time, don't judge me. And then one of Dr. Wily's greatest inventions comes in ready to end your <laughs> yeah, he's really as pathetic and easy as he looks. Which is more than I can say for the final Wily boss, at least the second form. The first form isn't too bad, but the second form, jeez. No matter what I tried, no matter what I did, jumping over the attacks or running underneath, I always got hit. If it weren't for the save states, I would have given up here too, seriously. It feels like the same people from Mega Man 1 just appeared out of nowhere to design the final parts of this game with the stupid attack patterns, and it ruins the consistently great journey as far as I'm concerned. But once you finally do it, Dr. Wily then transforms into an alien. What? And it doesn't stop there. It gets even weirder. He's weak to bubbles. Bubbles! Cheeky monkey bridge. And once that thing is beaten, it turns out that Dr. Wily was definitely not in Kansas anymore. And just when things couldn't get any weirder, Mega Man gets Wily to beg for forgiveness again, and then he what? leaves with leaves. <laughs> Why Mega Man's done this again, I have no idea, and what is with this somber walk through the seasons? I mean, is he sad that he forgot to arrest the Doctor again? Well, I guess he must feel a little bit stupid, because as to be expected, Mega Man 3 then happened. All I can hope for is that Fishman returns to make the third game just as good. <laughs>
Well, I guess after the epicness of two, Capcom decided not to bother trying to top it straight away, so we don't even start with an opening cutscene or an interesting title screen. A little disappointing, but at least the music is pretty calm yet grand to let you know what's about to take place once you hit that start button. Oh, shit! Despite no story explanation at all within the game, though, what's going on now is that Dr. Light and Dr. Wily are now working together. <laughs> yeah, right. In order to create a peacekeeping robot known as Gamma, until eight new robot masters suddenly go haywire and steal the crystals needed to power the thing. I wonder why that is. So we need to stop the masters and stop whoever is intercepting this whole shindig, including the new character known as Breakman, who keeps appearing throughout the game to stop Mega Man on his journey. And so now we've hit start. What do we do? Oh Jesus! Mega Man is one of the bosses. He's Dr. Wily. And speaking of Wily, I think he got a little bit too carried away when he recruited Hard Man. Hard Man. In fact, there isn't only Hard Man, but Snake Man too. What is this game trying to tell me? <laughs> This game is basically the same as Mega Man 2, but with a few alterations and additions. First of all, Mega Man doesn't slip around anymore like he's wearing special buttered shoes, which makes platforming a lot easier. But he's still able to slide up ladders. <laughs> But it's not all sunshine and dandelion farts though, because even though the visual detail from enemies and environments is a lot busier and prettier than 1 and 2 combined, I think this is heavily affecting how the game actually performs. I mean, it could be the Steam port in the Legacy Collection, but I got main menu glitches, stuttering side-scrolling that was pretty last minute with showing me threats, and absolutely insane slowdown that made many parts of the game unplayable. Even some of the easier sections, just because of the inputs not registering during the slowdown. The boss weapons too are also not that interesting to me, and the logic for what weakness work with which bosses are stretched so thin it's kind of funny. Hard Man's weakness is funnily enough not a special guillotine weapon but instead a magnet missile. I mean is it because he's made out of metal? But lots of things are hard, not just metal, it could be anything. And the search snake weapon can help you search for Gemini Man and his clones, I guess? But using a hard knuckle weapon on a spinning top? Or using a top weapon on a shadow man? Or a shadow weapon on sparks? I get that they need to make the robot masters more unique now the main elements have been taken up but it's a little jarring and what really doesn't help is the boss fights going down heavily in quality from 2 since they're more interested in spamming bullshit at you constantly instead of providing a fair fight with learnable attack animations and styles. Anyway, I chose Top Man as my first robot master because he just looks hilarious and I decided to test out the new ability which I got from him, which is... completely crap. After which I then hear a delightful little whistle. And then all of a sudden, a crazy red bastard man appears and jumps all over the place. And this is the pre-mentioned Break Man, a recurring mini boss throughout the game, and one that in every single fight does the exact same thing. He jumps around, doesn't run, and shoots. And that is it. Why the hell he's part of the game, I don't know, but he's easy enough at least to make you feel good for finishing him off. Another addition to Mega Man 3 is his slide ability, and this not only leads to a few more alternate paths and interesting level challenges, but I love how frigging terrified Mega Man looks whenever he does it. Oh my! Oh it looks a little bit like Hardman found his way up Mega Man's bot off. You also have access to a new faithful dog companion known as Rush, not only adorable but useful as heck too. There's Rush Coil for springing up towards higher platforms, Rush Jet for flying gracefully over any kind of terrain, and Rush Marine for underwater traversal. Which I never found, so I never used. Shut up. Like the slide ability, it opens up more interesting level parts and optional goodies that are hidden away, but acts a lot more like the items from Mega Man 2 in terms of usefulness in totally optional situations as a bonus to make them easier. Mega Man 3 may feel a little like 2 in many areas, but I found that 3 had a much higher focus on more animated and unpredictable attacks from enemies to go with the new visuals, and this does lead to pretty good non-rushing combat segments where you need to stop and think a lot more about what you're doing before continuing, which I do like, don't get me wrong, but I don't prefer it over the balance of combat and speedy platforming from the last game, and 3 goes a little bit too crazy on the targets that are way too small to hit. Christ, these things are annoying. And enemies like this are all over the damn place, which aren't fun to avoid or fight at all. Just a health draining and not backing nuisance. In fact, these enemies were the only time that the top spin attack was even vaguely useful. It's not even useful on the airborne enemy since it knocks you back whenever you use it, causing more problems than necessary. And just you try using it as the weakness against Shadow Man. It may do a lot of damage, but the amount of times I tried to hit him without getting hit myself and taking off chunks of damage were immeasurable. What am I doing wrong here? In fact, his whole stage can blow off for all I care. It's full of those stupid enemies that I'm convinced your bullets go straight through. And there's this part here where I swear it's impossible to get by without taking a hit. But in order to get past, make sure you take the hit without being too close to the edge or else... Oh dear, you fall and get down the hole. And what about this here in Snake Man stage? Hey, what's all that about? The game also brings back those lovely moments of Mega Man 1 insta-death punishments while 
piling lots of enemies onto you. As far as I'm concerned, this game is the best of Mega Man 2 mixed with the worst of Mega Man 1 with a sprinkling of no slippery feet, sliding and the rush abilities. I mean, it's nice to get E-Tanks back and everything, but with so many more insta-death scenarios and enemy ganging, it's hard to appreciate them and it makes you question why they even bothered having them back except for the run to the final parts of the game. And even when you have all the weapons at your disposal, their utility in the stages is very questionable and I didn't find many of them that useful at all. The Searching Snake is alright, it tracks every solid ground surface and is good for the smaller enemies, as are the Ninja Stars. They're like the Metal Blades, but much slower and you can fire anyone at a time, so not that great really actually. The Hard Knuckle is powerful, but far too slow to be that reliable. The Gemini Laser is powerful, yes, but not only has barely any ammo, but if it misses a target, it bounces all over the damn screen and won't let you pause, change weapons, or even fire another laser until it vanishes. It's completely useless. The Spark only really stuns enemies and not much else. There are magnets that track enemies up to a point, but then decide to just fly off screen if the target moves even an inch off of the beaten path. And the needles are just a weaker version of the Mega Buster that don't really affect everything, so why the toss would you ever consider using it? And as far as the end game goes, you don't fight Dr. Wily immediately. No, instead you go through four of the stages you just did all over again, except way more difficult and with much harder elements of Mega Man 2 thrown in for the sake of the team knowing that that game was much better. Then you have to fight the Dark Robot Master thing, which is a culmination of mixed powers from older Robot Masters, which, by the way, not only means you have to guess their weaknesses with Mega Man 3 weapon logic, causing me to die before even figuring out what weapon to use, but also, this hybrid monstrosity moves faster, hits harder, and I swear to the Lord can read your mind with where you plan to run to, jump, and attack. Like Mega Man 1, if you didn't have the save feature, I don't know how you're supposed to enjoy this game that much. I mean, check out this bit in the Airman hybrid stage. If you don't have enough rush jet power, or God forbid, get to the end of this trek and lose, that's it. You're done, because the ammo pickups you need to keep flying through this part don't respawn. What's the point of all of this? And the slowdown, my bleeding Plus hole the slowdown. It screws up your timing with these trapdoor platforms so much. If you don't jump the very second you land on these things, you will fall. So good luck with the inputs not registering on these bits. I understand that for a third game, they probably wanted to make it a bit longer, but this was not the way to do it, if you ask me. Especially considering the Wily stages are probably the easiest in the whole game, and those are the final stages. I mean, they're still challenging, don't get me wrong, but as some kind of twisted apology, you're given four times the amount of E-Tanks you've ever had in any game so far. And compared to that Robot Master, a hybrid thing, it seems backwards to stick this part here. Well, I mean, you still have to refight all the original Robot Masters again in case all that feces before wasn't enough for you, but then you go to a pretty decent yet easy fight against the mad old Doctor himself, which leads you to finally take down Doctor Wily. Oh, sorry, Doctor Wiley. And then, okay, do you know what? Fair enough. I actually didn't see that coming. That's kind of cute. And just when everything was going hunky sodding Dorian, more like Mega Man 2, the game suddenly remembers, Oh yeah, I'm Mega Man 3! And gives you another boss that can only be attacked by upwards attack, so I hope you have enough ammo for what you need, otherwise game over. And even if you do have the ammo, oops, one hit kill from off screen. Did you also know that this was the peacekeeping robot Dr. Light and Wiley was supposed to make, and what a shock, Dr. Wiley made it evil to take over the world. You finally take down the boss after tons of trial and error and with absolutely no indication that nearly every weapon you have bounces off the last boss, leading me to waste tons of ammo and time. After all of this, Wiley isn't apprehended again, but his fortress crumbles and supposedly kills him. And so before Mega Man can think, it turns out the crazy red jumping bastard comes in to save the day because his real name is Proto Man and is actually Mega Man's brother. Okay, whatever. And by the way, this guy is a noob. This may be an unpopular opinion to have, but I think Mega Man 3, personally, is my least favourite of the series so far. I mean, it's not terrible, it's not even that bad of a game, all things considered, but Talk about a messy sequel. It's full of trial and error, unplayable slowdown, is extended for no particular reason with pointlessly hard additional bosses, and once again, if it weren't for the save feature, I don't know how one is supposed to enjoy it. We've taken a major step back to Mega Man 1 design with 3, but hopefully, Mega Man 4 will curb my appetite. <laughs> So hey, this game starts with a cutscene, alrighty, great start, and it gives you a little backstory. And wouldn't you know, especially for 8-bit, it's pretty damn beautiful. The animation, the colour choices, it's minimalistic, but almost like a moving comic book. Do you know what else is beautiful though? Sliding up ladders. 
The story this time involves a Russian scientist known as Dr. Cossack, and with Wily supposedly dead, this guy is now the next in line to take over the world. Eight robot masters, fortress stages, same shtick, same dead expression, different paint job. Let's move on. We begin the game at Dustman stage, jump over this pit, and <laughs> but after Dustman bites the dust, <laughs> we then get another badass addition that shows off how much more went into the presentation. Along with the cutscenes, this brief and simple transition when grabbing new weapons is slick as cold mozzarella, and I'm already enjoying this a lot more than three. Slow down is also rare, yes, and that's with this much more detail, which also goes hand in hand with more environmental platforming obstacles to keep things more interesting along with the new robot masters. Do you want to go to a skeleton world or an Egyptian temple? That's so kick ass. And the level design also takes a lot more risks with alternate routes for optional goodies, and despite the same controls, abilities and rush gadgets from 3, you also get one of Mega Man's best new abilities, a charge shot to his Mega Buster. This thing saved my sorry face plenty of times, fully charging and keeping a big old shot for me mini bosses, bigger enemies and rows of smaller enemies alike makes this one of the best additions for sure and it's a good alternative to rapid firing if you prefer to wait for a more accurate shot. But the game still has its moments of bollock like in Drillman stage with these constantly respawning rocks above bottomless pits with respawning things right here and many many moments of making a jump before. <laughs> Yeah, that happens, but the game overall feels like a decent balance between 2's design and 3's mechanics for me to say I enjoyed it a ton more. This does mean though that the slide ability isn't really used within the level design all that much, but instead is an extension to Mega Man's movement, so it's used more like a fantastic dodge manoeuvre for many obstacles and attacks, and I can't imagine playing the game without it. This also means that it goes back to 2's set piece design, giving you more segments of platforming and enemy type challenges instead of multiple things going on all at once while being attacked all the time. It's all much more reasonable, and the balance of difficulty is more in favour of either trickier enemies or trickier platforming, never both of them together clashing and causing you hours of salty tears. Just in case things get a little tricky for you though, just pop an e-tank and you'll be all set. Well, if you don't mind losing your hearing, that is... Oh! The bosses are probably the most reasonably designed in the series so far as well. There's no spamming here and instead nothing but actual readable and reactionary attack patterns. But as far as Robot Master weaknesses go, well, the logic has completely thrown itself out the window. Wanna use a ring boomerang against a dust man? Why not? But the weapons themselves are all once again unique and have special uses in specific situations. The skull shield is like the leaf shield in Mega Man 2, but actually lets you run and jump at the cost of only one hit protection, which is great for falling or flying obstacles, especially over pits. Dustman's attack, and no, that's not a horror movie, is very powerful and splits into four pieces. Dive Man's missiles track everything at the cost of less ammo, the drill is like a fully charged Mega Buster shot on the fly, the Pharaoh thing can fire diagonally upwards, the ring is great too since it not only slices through enemies but also comes back to you like the Shadow Blade in 3, the Bright attack freezes everything on screen around you for a few seconds, and the Toad attack is like a mini screen nuke. They aren't my favourite weapon so far but it's a big step up from 3 if you ask me, as are the final stages, which are tough yet once again fair. The end game though isn't against Wily, but the Russian scientist Dr. Cossack instead. Russian scientist Dr. Cossack? I mean, come on, seriously? Where's the Spanish scientist Dr. Flamenco? And his tower is very... well... I think he was a big fan of Hard Man too. And this is the same structure as 2, with a few more bosses to beat down before the final boss. And as we climb higher up Cossack Tower, we finally get to the big man himself, who isn't massively difficult, but just as you're about to win, his daughter appears out of nowhere. Appearing out of nowhere seems to be a running theme in Mega Man, along with the crazy red jumping bastard, who both demand that we stop fighting, since Wily, surprise surprise, was the bad guy all along, holding Cossack at hostage. So off we go to stop Wily once again, and his bosses aren't too tricky either, except his final, final phase when he can just teleport on top of you from the dark. <laughs> After which Mega Man wins, doesn't arrest Wily AGAIN, meaning that he escapes, and the game ends. Brilliant. Overall, Mega Man 4 is more of what I was looking for after Mega Man 2, to be honest. It has the mechanics of 3, the design of 2, but it's starting to get a little bit been there, done that for it to massively stand out. It's still a great entry though, and another one I recommend you play. The fact that you don't need to rely on save states again, like in 1 and 3, says a lot as well. Before we conclude Mega Man 4 though, can we just take a step back and relax, take some deep breaths, have a moment of reflection and peace as I dedicate a song to one of the greatest bosses in video game history, Toad Man. And I Are you ready to see me yell more at the bumbling blue bulbous part? I hope so, because here is Mega Man 5.
The intro cutscene here reveals that Proto Man, Mega Man's older brother, despite turning back to the good side, is now a bad guy again. Make your mind up! And he's kidnapped his own creator, Dr. Light, and is rallying together, take a guess, eight robot masters to help out, take a guess, Dr. Wily, in order for him to take over the world. And the very first thing I noticed was the animation for charge shots looking a lot better. It's more flashy and prominent and feels a lot better to use. It's a lot more <laughs> and a lot less piffle. As for the game itself is concerned, it's basically the same as 4, but balanced to be way more like 2, with the least amount of bullshit in the series so far, and with even more cool ideas to help keep things fresh for 5 games in. You can slide, you can charge shot, you've got rush gadgets, but also get new level ideas entirely, which is the least I can expect this far in, but it's still nice to see, especially playing all of these games back to back. And I don't ever recommend you do that! Gravity Man stage I loved for how different it felt compared to any other Mega Man stage, with the flipping around to the top and bottom of the stage, but unlike most games, the control style actually changes around the gravity instead of remaining the same just for the sake of being confusing. If you want Mega Man to move to the right, you press right if you're at the top or the bottom of the screen. No mirroring in sight just because Mega Man is upside down. And the following Robot Master battle using this mechanic isn't massively difficult at all, but due to his weakness being a shield weapon, trying to position yourself near him while dodging his attacks but not collide entirely with him as the gravity flips over was something really brand new and memorable. And the run up to Proto Man's boss is another great idea. It's very short, yeah, but making the whole stage come down yourself by destroying blocks and not getting crushed, that's not been done before. The weapons themselves are slightly running out of ideas though, which isn't great, but the building of each stage meant that they didn't need to make things unnecessarily difficult and that you feel like you need to rely on the power-ups, which goes to show a lot about the solid level design on display. The stars are the same as the skulls from 4, the water is the same as the snake from 4 but only runs down surfaces and not up, which has its uses but overall isn't as cool. The star arrow thing is basically the hard knuckle and no, riding it isn't that useful and more dangerous over anything, especially with Rush Jet making a return. The charge kick isn't bad actually, especially for tiny enemies. The napalm bombs are really powerful but really low range, and being able to flip gravity yourself is a brilliant little power-up, as is the Gyroman power that allows you to fire in front or upwards with a lot of ammo. It's kind of similar to the Metal Blades in 2, but not as exploitable and much more balanced around the level design to still keep it challenging. I mean, yeah, I still prefer the Metal Blades because of how overpowered they are, but in terms of keeping things just that little bit more tense, this is a great compromise, and in fact, I say they're running out of ideas, but the fact that so many of them are close if not identical to 4 isn't a bad thing at all. They work when they need to perfectly, but just don't seem to be as creative or imaginative as they once were. And at this point, I've only just noticed that Mega Man has a serious case of silly feet syndrome. <laughs> Also, not only does he look totally horrified when sliding, but equally looks horrified while jumping. What is wrong with this guy's face? More important than anything, though, is that you can still slide up ladders. Okay, sorry, I'm not doing that joke anymore. You can always milk it too much, can't you? <laughs> Milk. Throughout each stage we also have a brand new collectible rewarding not only the keen eye but brave players who want to go out of their way to risk getting them, and by finding all of them to spell Mega Man 5 you'll discover the risk is entirely worth it because you get the brilliant robot bird companion Beat, who automatically follows around you and attacks any enemy or projectile until they're dead. This is a fantastic reward and a great incentive to step out of your comfort zone while looking for them, or in case you miss one it's definitely worth giving up a life in order to try grabbing it again, or replaying the stage. Mega Man 5 also introduces new tanks to refill every weapon and ammo and your own health, but the game only allows you to carry one at a time to keep it balanced and make you consider if it's worth using now or later, just in case another one pops up later and you can't carry it. And stepping back, the entire level design and challenges in each stage is as close to two as it can be, but with added challenges built around fast time dodging with the slide, the charge shot and rush gadgets, the terrific soundtrack, this all makes 5 my favourite entry so far. Even the tank distribution is just right, the power-ups are useful but not too overpowered, this is just a great game here. I mean it does still have its moments, like at the start of Wily Forge and not having a clue that you shouldn't drop from this side. Come on, that's really terrible. But that's the only proper instance of bull I can think of from the top of my head compared to the previous games. You even get Mega Man's first vehicle segment here. How fantastic is this? I mean, it's not exactly difficult or anything, but it looks and feels great and even has a boss battle. The ending also sees you climbing Proto Man's tower to fight more tricky and unique bosses. Well, I mean, some are tricky and some are completely pathetic. But this guy, this guy was a total crumbing bastard because he constantly loves to freeze you until you get him stuck in the corner. Plotwise, we then discover that the Proto Man that kidnapped Dr. Light was fake all along. The real Proto Man comes in to save us, and then a fight to the end with Dr. Wily occurs once again. What a surprise. Come if you dare. Ooh, don't worry, I will. 
with the help of Hard Man. I actually thought these ending segments were some of the best in Mega Man. How many bastard in castles does this guy have? The stages themselves are top stuff, and the bosses are once again not the hardest in the world, but very unique and interesting instead of the simple run, dodge, and shoot right affairs we've seen so far. The worm thing here was probably my favourite because you have to attack it so that it can attack you, but then you use its own attack to get higher ground and then attack it back while avoiding aerial attacks. It's really cool stuff. As for the ending Wily bosses though, they are probably the easiest we've had to deal with so far, with the final form being a much slower version of Mega Man 4, in the dark, only hittable for a second and with lots of lasers to avoid, but with beat on your side it becomes a battle of patience more than anything else. After all this, the ending sees Wily running away like a little bitch and Mega Man saving Dr. Light. But oh no, the castle starts crumbling yet again so Mega Man can't catch Wily this time and holds the ruins up to save Dr. Light. Wily then decides he's Michael Jackson for a second and then Proto Man jumps in once again to rescue us, letting Wily escape AGAIN and leaving us open for Mega Man 6. Mega Man Bow Bow. Before we get to that one though, I have to show you how lovely it is if you decide to use one of those special tanks that refills absolutely everything. boy, so it appears as though everything has gone a lot less doom and gloom despite the fact Wily is loose again. This game is about a rigged robot fighting tournament with a sponsor known as Mr. X. <laughs> what, you mean Dr. Wily? Who's taken all the ticket money and stuff in order to fund his goal to reprogram eight robot masters and, you guessed it, take over the world. He says he's been ordering Wily around this entire time, but come the bloody hell on, I haven't seen a disguise that unconvincing since my great granddad disguised himself as a corpse to get out of my fifth birthday party. Oh wait, that was real. Mega Man 6, I can't add much more onto what I said about 5. It's more or less the same game, but with once again slight tweaks and just not as good as 5, if you ask me. Which for 6 games in really struggled to leave any kind of impact on me, but that could be from marathoning all of them back to back. Presentation wise though, I think this looks the best of the bunch with the same visual fidelity as 5, but with way more creative themes. Medieval stage, Greek stage, glistening sun-kissed desert stage, these are brilliant. And this is probably my favourite screen of classic Mega Man so far, it looks so wonderful for 8-bit. You even have an Arabian level theme theme with lots of oil and a flame man robot master that wears a, a turban oh dear is this as insensitive as oil man in mega man powered up though don't you got a place near your house for phillips i'll let you be the judge of that because i ain't touching that subject with a 50 foot hard man once again i'm saying that a lot aren't i the soundtrack is great the controls and mega man's moves are the same the bosses are all challenging yet not like three with uncontrollable spamming and their patterns feel good to nail and there's a few new obstacles added in here like sticky oil that's safe to move in if a little rigid but if fire comes near it it'll kill you instantly so making sure you kill enemies before that happens is vital to keep the stage a little easier there's also a few twists on the existing mechanics like with Rush, instead of him acting as a separate interactable gadget, he now combines into you to give you permanent upgrades while they're equipped with no ammo but their own charge meter that either comes back after a short period of time or lets you know when it's ready for a powerful attack. And this little twist is enough of a reason for me to recommend giving this one a look despite how identical it is to 4 and 5 and change the way you approach stages in a surprising amount of ways. You can choose to tank damage but give a lot back in the power suit at the cost of low range, and the Rush Jet next to the Metal Blade in Mega Man 2 is probably my favourite ability in the entire classic series. It isn't a weapon but instead a a literal lifesaver and a fantastic secret grabber. You can't slide or charge shot while it's on, but that's a small price to pay for the temporary flight and boosted floating jump. It's so damn good to use, and it doesn't last as long as the rush jet, but really doesn't need to. It's amazing enough as it is. As far as the other boss weapons go though, I mean, I must be honest, I can't say anything about any of them for the first time so far. They are either copies of previous weapons or are outright just different versions of the Mega Buster. They are all majorly disappointing, except the spread shot blizzard attack. Not since 3 have I felt like this actually. But I do appreciate the game actually showing you what each weapon does after you beat the boss for it, a lovely detail. And for some stages, instead of a dark patch on the main menu to signify you beat it, you get Mega Man's face there instead almost as if to say, Yeah, I did it! But I mean, this is basically the exact same game in enemy and platform design as 4 and 5, which is, well, fine, but not as good as either of them, so my feelings overall are... Meh? Meh. This could be seen as an extension to Vive, I guess, and the Rush Jet adapter alone is enough to make me say I enjoyed it, but like, you don't even have the collectible letters for that extra sense of rewarding exploration and getting past treacherous situations like what Five does. To get beat, you just find alternate exits to some of the stages. Even the run through Dr. What- sorry, Mr. X's lair is full of objects and bosses that just aren't all that new or surprising, especially in the last few bosses on the home stretch. They just keep on getting easier, I swear it. And in a plot twist that should shock absolutely nobody, Dr. Wily is the one behind everything and so we chase him off to his fortress of- okay, come on now, this isn't funny anymore, that is a blatant prick and sack. There is no excuse for imagery this disgusting and blatant, what the hell is wrong with you, you creepy old codger? <laughs> 
And after the exact same bosses I swear to god we've already done with another fight against Wily in the dark, after a few bops to the head we seize the day. Oh no look, your plan has failed. I hope this means you won't be jailed. Oh my god he has been! Holy shit! Mega Man actually arrested the stupid crazy asshole and the game ends there! What could possibly go wrong now? Well I guess everything because he's Mega Man 7! After the slight disappointment overall I felt towards 6, I was really taken aback to see that we're on the Super Nintendo now, and this game looks and sounds absolutely marvellous. Just look at this, look at this, the game doesn't even bother hiding it. From the starting gate it comes out, shoves its pelvis in your face and says, Yep, yeah, I'm hot, suck it! And with the soundtrack, I mean I have got nothing against the old soundtracks, but after 22 hours back to back of 8-bit crunches and screeches it was starting to get on my tats. And here the music is not only upbeat and atmospheric, but also smooth as butter to my ears. As is the gameplay itself actually, there's no stutter no slowdown, incredible animations and colours. This is the best looking Mega Man next to Mega Man 8, but I haven't got there yet. All of this visual detail is clear even from the cutscenes and such. Let's see here. The plot this time is that Dr. Wily has been captured, finally, but he expected this to happen all along. I really don't know why. The police here are so useless, it took six games for that to even happen to you, you daft ape of. And so he created four Robot Masters to spring to life after six months to start searching for and release Dr. Wily so that he- SWEET HONKING CRACKERS! They actually called him that! They knew he's a sick and disgusting- lonely old man too! Anyway, as to be expected, they break Wily out of prison and he heads off to take over the- Aside from that horrible typo though, the dialogue itself is much better and features actual character too, and classic tunes and jingles have returned but remixed into 16-bit bliss. offset, despite updated hardware and Mega Man X already being out for two years when this game came out, it's clear that Mega Man 7 isn't concerned with jumping ship entirely with the classic formula, and instead uses the power of the Super Nintendo to pay as much homage to the classic series in the prettiest and nicest sounding way it can possibly manage, and I'm totally okay with that. Plus you've still got the silly feet, so that helps. <laughs> You begin the game this time by picking between only the four robot masters mentioned in the earlier cutscene, which in all honesty is a big departure from what we're used to so far and shatters replayability in half compared to all the other games before it. So yeah, that's really strange, and also not seeing their names until you enter their stage is just simply a pain in the arse since you'll never be able to guess what weapon would be best for the stage if you don't know what the robot master is even called to guess what they'd be weak to. You do unlock the rest after the first four are gone, by the way, but it's still an odd choice. Despite all of this though, the game isn't just calling back to Mega Man's roots in the most faithful way it can muster, because this is actually a full on big step down in terms of stress and difficulty compared to what we've been through so far. Maybe it's the more pleasant visual style, or maybe it's because the game feels a little bit more zoomed in than anything, meaning not as much can be going on on the screen at once. Or maybe it's the smoother feeling controls and animations without any stuttering at all, but I found Mega Man 7 to be the easiest game so far. It's not insultingly easy, don't get me wrong, and it kicked my sorry shitter a good few times before I understood how some enemy stages and bosses worked, especially in Turbo Man stage, which, I mean, just screw it. Tires that push you into bottomless pits everywhere that will always succeed unless your timing is pinpoint perfect and a one hit kill fire attack that appears out of nowhere. Whack me off and call me Sandy, we're seven games in and still trying to do this bollocks. And knockback can still be a bit of a bitch too, along with those lovely enemies built around bottomless pits, but all in all seven is still a much more comfortable time compared to the other games. You have all the same abilities too, including sliding and charge shot and rush comes back in gadget form and not suits, but everything here just doesn't feel as aggressive as it did before, it's a far cry from the other games. My guess is that they were trying to stay away from the insanity of Mega Man X so it didn't feel like the same game, but that's a huge speculation. Boss attacks are back to 4, 5 and 6's quality of readable and fair attacks that will punish you until you learn them too. And once again, I couldn't tell you much about the boss weapons. Not because they're identical to previous ones or anything, but because I never found myself relying on any of them at all because of the difficulty drop. And that is a bit of a shame considering how valuable they were in the previous games and the fact that you can swap between them on the fly with the trigger buttons is incredibly useful. I mean, I thought they were cool in a few places like lighting up a dark room in Shade Man's mansion with the electric weapon, but... That's all I remember really, and a few enemies stand out as particularly annoying like the cockroaches and the bobsled spherical things, but because of the lack of standout moments and it being the same game since 4 but easier, it's probably the most forgettable one so far to me. Not bad whatsoever, in fact I recommend you start here along with Mega Man 2 and 5 for your first time ever if you want to get into the series. It's a much more enjoyable time with minimal teeth grinding frustration, but it's still lacking any kind of, you know, 
Cha-cha! It even has the introduction of a shop which you can use bolts you find in the stages to spend on grabbing new items from backup E-Tanks to extra lives and one-use spike repellents. This is a great addition, I must say, and makes the final product less stressful to deal with along with everything else the game does. In fact, I only use the other weapons whenever shooting straight ahead didn't do the job or against mini-bosses, and I think the devs realise this too, because to compensate for the slightly more forgiving playtime, they changed a number of small things against you, like having stage lengths usually doubled from what you're used to, way more unique and pretty dangerous hazards, a charge shot that takes a bit longer to charge up than you're used to, a really fast drop speed in between screen transitions so predicting and reacting to what's ahead really isn't that easy, your iframes after attacks have been significantly reduced, and if you want to get access to those rush abilities, you don't just get them, you have to find them and then get to them without dying, and all of those are a nice compromise to make for the slightly slower pace of 7. The best way to play this game in my opinion however is with the newly added rapid fire button to fire 3 pellets at once of your mega buster insanely quickly or over and over again if those 3 are off screen fast enough for you to keep the chain going. I don't know if this was on the Super Nintendo version but it was given a button command on the Legacy Collection too so I used it all the time and it makes some of those moments of dodge filled panicked rushes way more fun to deal with since you can attack back very fast yourself. And that's what Mega Man 7 is to me, fun. Very fun. It's still the classic structure, still the classic formula and enemies, still the classic controls and items like E-Tanks, but it all just flows a little smoother and doesn't feel as chaotic as any other game before it. Protoman's also here to give you hints that you already knew about. Okay. It's not easy easy, but definitely the easiest Mega Man I've ever played, so yeah, start here if you want a taste of what classic Mega Man is like without you wanting to rip your own hair out. Which I already did years ago, so now I have no choice but to slice it off instead. For the last stretch of this game, we have a strange rivalry with a new character known as Base, along with his dog Treble, and yes, I know they're in a game called Mega Man and Base, but that game wasn't in the Legacy Collections, and honestly, after seeing some people's videos about it, this abomination of a boss battle. I wouldn't touch that game after I went to the toilet and didn't wash my hands. And they begin with wanting to help you out, but it turns out that he was was a creation of Dr. Wily the whole time, and so decides to take you on in a fight to the death, which, I must be honest, is a damn good battle, especially if you didn't have his weakness like I didn't. And the last few stages and bosses then remember it's a classic Mega Man and so amps up the difficulty by a fair degree, leading to some pretty nail-biting encounters, and then finally against big old Wily himself, whose first form I had no problem with. I could take him down without taking a single hit, no problem at all. But the last form of Wily, my god, he can suck on cold meat. The hardest ending boss in a Mega Man game so far, as far as I'm concerned. This dude is close to impossible unless you stock up on tons of items beforehand in the shop, because no matter what you do, you will, I repeat, will take hits. Look at the damn attack patterns here. Unless he is right above me, I can slide to the side and jump over the elemental attacks, but anywhere else, fudge if I know what to do. And every one of these attacks, except the electric shock, takes off so much health it's borderline unplayable without E-Tanks to keep the battle going. And if you reach this part of the game without any backup items like I did for my first time, just, just, just give up. Go back, farm bolts, buy E-Tanks, and go back into the stages. But I suppose this final form of Wily is so difficult to the point that it gives Mega Man a decent excuse to finally justify murdering him in cold blood. <laughs> I wonder if I destroy the ball section first. But of course he doesn't do that damn sense of right and wrong getting in the way, and so Base drops in, saves Wily at the last minute, and then we're on to Mega Man 8. Also, Wily, I don't know what's going on with your chest here, but I like it. <laughs> Okay, sorry everybody, but I am going to do a little bit of a cheat here. I actually already did an entire Kenekaris video all about Mega Man 8 with my good friend Gilly the Kid, which you can go and watch there. Yeah as well. Magic, isn't it? It's crazy. I would go over all of that game's twazak again, but the thing is, I don't feel like I need to repeat myself. It's already there in another video, so you can go and see it right now, and if you don't really want to go and see it, well, here are some highlights from it. Birds flying, lots of colours, running and jumping around with jolly music. Mega Man can now swim. Damn, that's satisfying. Brand new abilities for Rush. Holy shit, the trees attack you! But I found all of these guys a great and fun challenge with totally varied and interesting methods of fighting them, even with the correct weaknesses. I'll be nice on you! You must recover all the energy immediately, Mega Man. I don't think you will. Jump, 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 slide, slide, jump, slide, slide, jump, jump, slide, slide, jump, jump, slide, slide, jump, jump, slide, slide, jump, jump. And then 12 years later, Mega Man 9 happened. So hey, what do you do after you're done making classic Mega Man for the Super Nintendo? Jump to the Nintendo 64? Jump to the GameCube? No. Wait until the Wii, PS3 and Xbox 360. Okay, fair enough, but what really shocked me was that despite the more modern console release, the game went back to 8-bit. <laughs> Then I was even more shocked to see that there was no intro cutscene either, and instead you jumped straight into the level select from a static menu. <laughs> then I was even more shocked to see our first ever female robot master. <laughs> oh, and we also have Plug Man.
Yes, Plug Man. At least now he can join forces with Hard Man and we've got both ends covered. For a second I was a bit worried we were calling back to this 8-bit style and lack of story for the sake of laziness for a game released in 2008 and the ninth entry to a classic series, but then, luckily, after the first Robot Master you take down, we do get a bit of story with cutscenes and dialogue, so at least we haven't gone that far back. In the simplest terms, Dr. Wily is back again, but with no apparent connection to a string of attacks from 8 Robot Masters and a video shows up of Dr. Light making these robots himself, <laughs> causing Wily to ask people for donations in order to combat the evil Dr. Light. Why anybody believes this creature is beyond me, considering Wily has done this eight times before, but what do I know? I don't live in Building City. Maybe the residents' heads are so full of cement that they're actually buildings themselves. And so the rest of the game is about stopping the robots and proving Dr. Light's innocence. Alrighty then, let's go. You'll also notice it's not only visually where the game is stripped back, we are now back to Mega Man 2 levels of control. As in, we can no longer charge shot or slide. You still have rush gadgets though, and the turbo fire button from Mega Man 7, which I still love, and the shop system from 7, which will save you more than once. As far as the rest goes, it's as close to 2 in terms of set piece platforming and enemy waves as it gets, especially with the more limited control, but it also throws in even more experimental obstacles that I really didn't see coming. There are swings that you have to shift your weight around so that they can be exploited in many different ways. There's pink launching capsules that fly you all over the place, and more surprisingly, the game is built more around preemptive warnings of what's coming up in the stages and showing you how things work before giving you a challenge to conquer. For instance, with this new enemy in this space stage, the game lets you get grabbed by the first one in safety to show you how it works, and then tries it on you again but with life-threatening obstacles to test your understanding of it. I even loved the subtle design choice here when you run past one of these things dropping from the top of the screen with no problem at all, you'll miss it. But once you make your way up to the above platform, you won't be able to run past it when it drops again, and if you weren't paying attention earlier, you'll get grabbed by it, but you still have a chance to save yourself from the insta-kill spikes if you remembered that you walked past them a few seconds ago, ready for you to try the run again. This above all the other games in my opinion is the most interesting with giving you a tough but totally fair journey, but it does test your attention more than the other games too, like with some obstacles you assume you're totally familiar with for the game to only stick its finger up at you because hey, this is a new game after all so don't expect an identical copy you arrogant ignoramus. <laughs> The game still has optional trickier routes that massively reward you, the stage lengths are shorter again, this is way closer to classic Mega Man than 7 was alright, and despite being 9 games in it still managed to surprise me, like in Tornado Man stage with these balloon enemies. When I shot them expecting them to go away immediately like usual, only for the balloon itself to burst and then have the enemy fly towards me for one last attack, that was pretty funny and totally unexpected for me. As was when I got attacked by this octopus here and got covered in oil, and when I saw some extra lives that then turned out to be those prickhead shell enemies in disguise, I can't tell you how charming I found that to be. Bosses are fantastic as well with the same readable and learnable attack patterns and even some managed to surprise me once again like with Jewel Man, which took me too long to figure out that he was only jumping when I was jumping meaning that you can use that to exploit his movements and punish him. That's a really clever twist. And their weapons are back to being amazing like the Magma one that's like another spread gun that's only one shot at a time to balance out its power. The Hornets are a homing missile that don't only lock on and destroy targets but even pick up the dropped items from enemies and gives them back to you. The Laser Trident is essentially the replacement to the charge shot except usable in rapid fire. The bomb, I love this weapon. You fire it, activate it when you want to, and it sucks up any enemy and projectile straight into its void for easy room clear outs. The dual shield as well is the best shield by far since it mixes all the previous shields together. You can run and jump while wearing it, unlike the leaf shield in 2, fire it whenever you wish, like in 2, or keep yourself guarded instead and just protect yourself like with the last few games. The tornado attack is essentially a screen nuke and very fun to use. Concrete gives you a temporary platform for spike pits and climbing, but also kills most enemies instantly at the cost of no item drop, and the plug balls fire straight downwards are very fast and stick to any solid surface until it hits a target. This may be compensating for your lack of charge shot and slide, but I don't care. Mega Man 9 has the best selection of boss weapons in the whole series bar none, and every single one of them was so useful to the point that I saw myself running out of ammo more than any other game before it, I loved them so much. The final stages also show off that Wily actually somehow managed to talk nearly scrapped robots back into working for him, which is all caught on this one robot master's data chip, but before we can send this to the police, Wily steals the chip, meaning another trek to his house in order to take him down. As for some of these stages though, well, not since Mega Man 1 have I seen right angular jumps with strict ceilings this awful. There's no room for error here whatsoever and I hate it all with a passion.
pressure to get this far and constantly game over because your timing isn't absolutely pixel perfect over an insta-kill trap is so ridiculously unfair it nearly made me rage quit. And for the love of all that is holy, the ending bosses and stuff aren't the hardest in Mega Man history, but do not, I repeat, do not die at the ending portions and lose all of your items and tanks, because if you die there learning the attacks of bosses and stages, get through the Robot Master rematches and all that jazz and then game over at the very end, unlike 7 where you can start off at the Wily stage you were just on, here you begin all the way back at the start of Wily Castle all over again! With all of those piece of shit horrible jumps that could cause you to game over all over again. Seriously, this is my least favourite stage in all the classic Mega Man games for absolute definite. This ending ruins the whole game for me because of this restarting system. I know the games aren't the longest and it's all about replayability to figure stuff out and come back stronger, but why force players to go through every single boss horrible level and rematch again just because you weren't 100% sure how the final Wily encounters worked when you got there? No joke, at this point I'd played so much Mega Man that I hadn't washed in three days straight and I started to smell like a dead rotting pig. <laughs> so while stacking up on items in the shop, I even bought Mega Man the chance to get his hair out so he could at least let a bit of air get to it. After a rematch with the bloody sodding devil, which is, uh, well, not too bad actually, we then get a very cool fight involving bouncing eggs back at Wily, followed by a tricky but easily telegraphed fiery attack flying Wily, and then a difficult yet much easier version of the asinine Wily capsule fight from Seven, which then ends with an actually funny scene of Mega Man showing off all the times Wily has begged pathetic for forgiveness and yet keeps on being evil. Should have killed him when you had the chance, Megs! Then Wily agrees to give up and takes us to Dr. Light's prison cell, which Proto Man immediately warns us is a trap, but we ignore it because Mega Man's head must be full of cement too, leaving Mega Man shocked on the floor, Wily detonating his own damn castle. Where does he keep getting the funding to build these things? And then after being rescued, a very cute credit sequence happens, showing us all what happened to the originally planned to be scrapped Robot Masters doing much more friendly and helpful jobs. A lovely touch to a lovely game. And yes, aside from the run of the end game, I massively enjoyed Mega Man 9. It's basically Mega Man 2 again, but with much better weapons and rush gadgets, so logically this would mean I like it more than 2, but... I don't, and I'll tell you why. If this were 3, I'd be way more inclined to say this was better, but this is a 2008 eighth sequel to the original Mega Man. There's not enough different here for me to say it's one of the best this late on into the series, especially since it went back to the 8-bit aesthetic. It's brilliant fun and a great Mega Man game, but it's not a great sequel. It takes too many steps back from 5, especially for me, to confidently say that it's better than 2, but hey, like I said, it's still a terrific action platformer. Before we jump to the final game though, Mega Man 10. Can I just warn you on something very important? In the shop, do not buy roll space for 200 bolts. I nearly did, thinking it was actually worth something until I looked up what it does. It changes her appearance. If I wasted 200 bolts on that, I would have screamed so loudly that my vocal cords would have been splayed out across this table. Oh my god, I really have played nine games for this series, haven't I? Well, I mean, to start off with, this is different. You get to pick between Mega Man and Proto Man, the latter of which has the slide and charge shot. <laughs> yep, I'm sold, I'm picking him first. And what's this? Difficulty options? We haven't had that since Mega Man 2. What a lovely addition. I'll pick normal, though, since I have an advantage with Proto Man's moveset already, and the fact that he can deflect bullets whenever he jumps. He can't fire more than twice at a time instead of the three times like Mega Man can, making the turbo button a lot less useful, but eh, I like the added acrobatics more. It was then I discovered after crying in my mom's blankie that Proto Man is in fact the hard mode of this game. Yeah, because he has half the health as Mega Man. So four robot masters into the game's worth of progress and dozens of deaths later, I decided it was too hard for me, it was too much, so I decided to start the whole game from the beginning and I hate my life! Here we have a slightly darker story though, which I wasn't expecting. There's a deadly infection to robots going around known as Roboenza. Don't ask me how robots get sick. This is coming from a series with this on its front cover. Wily then actually comes to Dr. Light, Proto Man and Mega Man peacefully after Mega Man's sister Robot Roll gets infected and says that an infected robot master has stolen the machine that he built to create medicine for the illness. So off we go to save everyone yet again, and well, damn, this couldn't be any more similar to 9 if it tried. That is, if you pick Mega Man at least. It could be because at this point I'm totally fatigued on the games, but this really is the same game, just with a character select and lots of different dotted obstacles all over the place, some of which were really cool actually. The way these power belts worked into the mini boss for Sheep Man stage was a fantastic touch, and yes, Sheep Man is now a robot master, don't question it. Bah. And it was cool to see some more modern real life themes in the stages, like that point and click 
dragging mouse. A bit jarring to see at first, but equally very cool and different. And how about a pooey old sewer level? This is new. And a football stadium. Why not? It's even got an evil goalpost robot, killer bouncing balls, and evil robot lockers. This is very creative stuff, all right? Since you can pick between the characters, though, the game, once again, isn't built around sliding since only Proto Man can do it, leaving it as mainly an evasive action. But this, aligned with the fact that Proto Man has rushed jet from the start of the game, just isn't worth the extra difficulty, in my opinion. Especially with the added amount of bullshit here. Compared to 9, there's plenty more stupid, annoying moments that really hold it back, not only as a sequel to 9, but as a 10th damn entry. For instance, how do you feel like fighting a transmorphing devil monster that takes up to a third of the screen and can push you into a bottomless pit that's all around you? Because it's here, it's boring, it can hit you only around four times before you need an E-Tank. This is worse than one's yellow devil, if you ask me. Screw this boss and every hole it possibly has. Off-screen kills here, like in the sewer stage, are all over the place. The game loves overflowing you with enemies and bottomless pits, and there's a few more aggravating gotcha traps to drain all your lives to, especially with holes. Do not trust any holes in Mega Man 10, otherwise Plug Man and Hard Man will pop out and surprise you. Enemies will be jumping out of these things all the time just to piss you off, and this all feels more artificially tricky for the sake of it being the 10th bloody entry. As Proto Man, there's even less items in the shop you can buy, and along with every other handicap he has, like lower health and lower damage output, it's terrible that nowhere in the whole game does it even hint at this being a harder version of the same game. I thought I picked my difficulty at the, you know, difficulty menu. What's with this secret difficulty here? And it's a very cruel trick considering that Mega Man lost the slide and charge shot in the last game, so of course you'd want that back. Why wouldn't you pick Proto Man? If you do pick Mega Man though, this whole game is essentially 9, just not as good. I enjoyed it fine enough, but for the number 10, any impact it had of anything slightly new just isn't there anymore. I mean, I liked the sandstorms here and how they blind you and blow you around bottomless pits and easy smaller enemies. That was pretty cool stuff. And those trucks that honk to warn you that they're coming off screen before running you down, but you can also use them as a platforming obstacle. And the platform that moves left and right as you stand on each end. And the entire sports stage, now I think about it, but that's all that really stuck out to me. Solar Man stage, though, is easily my least favourite in the entire series, all because of these jumping flames. They do so much damage, take up most of the screen, and you have to avoid them while getting attacked from flying enemies, while avoiding lasers from a flower that is only vulnerable when it fires the lasers, but if you jump to avoid the laser, there's a chance that the jumping fire will be above you anyway, making it impossible to not take damage in any situation. And you try climbing ladders while all this stuff is going on, because every mistake throws you all the way back down the ladders, not only meaning you lost your health, but lost all your progress and meaning you'll go through the hard stuff all over again. I hate this whole stage. But I mean, the game in its entirety is fine, but it's just there. Can't say much about the powers either. We've got another shield that isn't as good as a dual shield because you're still open to attack if a certain part of the shield is damaged. The thunder wall is kind of cool, but it takes far too long to activate for it to be useful. You can freely control the bombs where they fly, but firstly, they move way too quickly and you won't be able to steer them with all this other crap going on. The blades are okay, but only fire up and down depending on if you're running or jumping. And do you want to freeze enemies? but nothing else, because you can do that now. The solar attack I use the most. Powerful, cuts through waves of enemies in front and behind you, and has great coverage. And yes, by this point at the ending of the game, I was smart enough to stock up on E-Tanks and weapon refills ready for the end, and I'm glad I did, because you don't only get a nice callback to all the other Mega Mans by fighting all the different robot masters from his history, but it also means you'll spend a lot more E-Tanks just trying to guess what weapons you have that could possibly be the weakness of a totally unrelated boss from another game. This then leads on to a cool little throwback to that Mega Man 5 boss, where you had to use platforms and avoid aerial attacks in order to punish the boss from high up. The only time I found the Thunder Wall to be massively useful, actually. Look at that damage. Oh, cure. Then we have more damn rematches with this game's robots because the game hates you, and then we reach Wily himself, whose first form is once again reminiscent of that fight in Mega Man 5 and a great little battle to nail down. Then the second phase, which is a little more aggressive, but nothing you shouldn't be prepared for, especially for number 10. And instead of an immediate capsule fight, you instead go all the way up to bloody space for a zero-G encounter with a slightly easier version of the same disappearance reappearing fight you all know all too well by this point. After defeating him, Wily then turns out to get sick from the robo virus despite not being a robot. What? But before you can even wonder what that's all about, it doesn't matter anyway because a few days later he's recovering in hospital and just leaves with all the medicine for everyone else behind. D why? Wh why? What? And with all those unanswered questions and a complete anticlimax, we finally come to the end of Mega Man 10 and we won't see the rest of the story unfold until Mega Man 11. Okay, to conclude this absolute beast of a video series, all I can really say is this. Firstly, do not play these games back to back in any kind of time pressure like I did. I swear to God I knocked off 10 years of my lifespan by doing so. And secondly, despite my raw, pure anger that most of the games gave me with their particular moments, 
I actually did enjoy these games a lot overall. I was just really, really stressed out and under time to do it. That's the difference. And in my opinion, if you want to get into Mega Man, I can only recommend you doing so with the classic series with the legacy collections because of the save feature. If you're new to the series and don't want to throw your controller at the TV, then this save feature will be your saving grace. I mean, I don't know how, especially in the 80s and 90s, they expected kids that they were advertising to to do all of this without that. And if you were one of those kids back in the day, I can only salute you. I don't know how you still have your sanity intact. You're braver than I am. That, and despite the immense similarities between every single game, they manage to follow from each other really well. It does feel like a quest of truly epic proportions, and it doesn't matter how similar they all feel because they still somehow manage to be engaging. The gameplay at its core is just that solid, even if a lot of it is the same stuff. If I'm going to be honest, I really don't like the tradition of fighting every single robot master all over again just for the sake of it near the end of the game. It pads them out more than anything and just drains your resources before the final bosses with Wily, but I suppose that's what you get into when you play Mega Man, so you just need to be ready for it. If though I had to pick from my favourite to least favourite classic Mega Man game, not because I majorly dislike some more than the others, but if I just had to put my favourite ones into a particular order, 5 is my favourite without question for the power-ups, variety and tightness of the whole experience, followed by 2, then 9, 4, 8, 7, 6, 10, 1, and then 3, because at least with 1 I can forgive it shite for being the first in the series, but 3 games in, that is one that I can honestly say I really didn't like all that much, despite all the cool staples that would appear in the future games. And with that, well, I'm done now. No more Mega Man until Mega Man 11. And do you think I'm ever going to do a video series like this ever again? <laughs> The best dream I ever had was when I was walking down the street in the middle of the night and said hello to the postman, but as soon as I waved at him, some sticky stringy stuff flew out of my wrist. Ah! Nine months later, the postman had twins, and then Spider-Man for the PS4 came out to let me relive that very same dream. This is the closest outfit I have, shut up. Is Spider-Man on PS4 the best Spidey game ever made? Well, if you're asking me... You're goddamn right it is! This game was so good I nearly finished it 100%, which I never do for modern releases. And the best thing about it is that if you have a favourite 3D Spider-Man game of the past, there is something here for you. There's something here for everybody. Do you like the indoor level styles of the PS1 Spider-Man series? Great, because this game's got them. Do you like the pure and utter freedom and moment-to-moment -moment crime stopping from Spider-Man 2 on PS2? Great, because this game's got that too. Do you like the amazing Spider-Man 2 on PS4? Well, it doesn't matter because that game is shit and this one's better than it! In fact, I'd argue this game has too big of an ego for its own good. It's freaking amazing from the second it starts. You get a brief intro cutscene, Peter Parker grabs himself some lovely and sticky webby toast, and then off you go! You're playing the game already, seamlessly transitioned from the cutscenes, and you get to feel firsthand how great this game feels right then and there, which will last until the end of the game. You don't even get that whole tired shtick of starting a Spider-Man game with Uncle Ben with the whole, Oh, isn't he lovely? He's like the dad that Peter never had. With great power comes great responsibility. Fuck it! You you know the story, you know the spider bite, and this game knows that it doesn't need to waste your time with it. You're just off straight away, zipping through buildings at 100 miles an hour, spinning webs of any size, catching fuse just like flies. Look out, here comes the spider man. Christ, Peter Parker, slow down! You're gonna give yourself a heart attack before you're 30! I think someone's been eating a little bit too much Peter Bix. The actual story though starts off with a bang. You're on your way to stop the lord of all New York City crime, the kingpin, Wilson Fisk. Wilson West. And this whole segment kicks off the rest of the game beautifully. It not only provides you with every basic enemy type and allows you to fight one of Spidey's oldest and most dastardly foes straight away, but also explains organically why all the crime in the city goes haywire right after you finish this intro mission. You've locked up the Godfather, of course the crimes will increase with everyone trying to take over. And despite the crime fighting being a part of the gameplay, it doesn't feel video gamey because of that, it feels real. This is true for the rest of the crime syndicates and corrupt organisations you uncover as the game continues, but even when you complete the checklist amount of crimes needed for completion in each district, you can still get intercepted by undercover operatives from Fisk trying to avenge him, and muggings will still be happening at random points all over the place to increase the authenticity and give you more XP. After then taking down Fisk, you're sitting there thinking, well god damn it, I've just locked up the head of all crime in the city, time to web the game into the bin! And just then, the plot then switches gears and focuses on this guy known as Martin Lee, supervillain alias Mr. Negative. Not only because he's literally photo-negative in his design, but because his name fits his character. He's definitely more of a glass half-empty kind of guy. <laughs> You know what I'm saying. Oh, and by the way, Norman Osborn is the mayor in this game, and not a single person yeah. likes him. That's it for the setup, though, because for most of the game, and I mean most of the game, you find yourself flying around this absolutely bustling and gorgeous cityscape with your dubious white substance, very similar to that bit in Silence of the Lambs. And let me just say very calmly, this game fucking nails the fucking cat infested shit web swinger! This game makes you, without sounding cliche, feel. 
like spider. No, 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 no. Uh, <gasps> become the Batman! <laughs> I'm not kidding though, there's a reason that saying has been repeated by games journalists over and over again more than my grandma says that hurts. Whether you're stopping a car full of drug dealers or catching bloody pigeons for a close friend, you feel like the spider. There's no other way to describe it. Every ability Spider-Man has is utilised to the fullest, and even side missions have you doing all sorts of things you'd see in the comics or animated shows, like stalking people and taking recon pictures while climbing buildings, and even high-speed chases. And the swinging itself? It's heavenly, it's bliss, it's delicious, and the way the game's soundtrack dynamics dynamically shifts to a grand adventurous score the second you get some speed going adds to how great it feels. To be clear for a second though, most people swear by Spider-Man 2's swinging controls and how realistic the weight felt. You could even stay stuck on a building and not move at all if you wanted, but here that kind of manipulation doesn't work anymore. I mean you still need something to attach to to make the web swinging work, which does work with the physics very well, but this game is entirely built around much faster and expressive swinging with a singular trigger. And saying that, even the game itself takes a jab at Spider-Man 2 as it stands. Totally worked last time. You've got some guts, game. But hey, I did love Spider-Man 2 when it came out all that time ago, but taking nostalgia shades off for a second, I don't even think you can compare that one to this for how much different everything else is. Consider Spidey 2 a foundation that the PS4 game expands tremendously upon and being made much more animated and flowing. By holding and letting go of R2 in the correct intervals, and depending on if you jump at the lowest and highest point of the swing, you increase either your speed or verticality. And based on that, you can control how Spidey flies around to a T, as long as you have something to web onto, of course. The web swinging is integrated beautifully into the speedy parkour, and in order to do this in the most natural and efficient way possible, the game helps you out with many simple actions you can activate on the fly while doing the rest of the complicated positioning yourself to never make it feel like a chore. You can speed towards objects in front of you with a quick zip command, link building top parkour into perch launching and quick zipping directly onto other rooftops, quickly change directions with more quick zipping onto things directly next to you, launch high into the air and skydive to increase your speed for the next swing, and I was even learning things never explained in text boxes directly to you, like holding web on the building you're attached to allows you to then detach and wall run automatically, and then using the high speed web zip command while wall running allows you to fly upwards. And holding L2 usually slows down the game into an aim mode so you can put yourself onto objects or fly towards enemies, but if you're already swinging and holding R2 to swing then you can just tap L2 to lock onto the nearest perch and keep the momentum going, especially if you leap off of that. And the first time I did a web swing through grates, I lost my shit! Look how smooth this is! And this is me only talking about the web swinging and nothing else that the game does dramatically well, like the combat for instance, which if you've played the Arkham games before, you'll recognise, but I found this a lot more reaction based, a lot more skill based, and I died a good few times trying to learn the ins and outs of it. Overall though, it is great stuff. At its most very basics, it is Batman Arkham. You dodge when your spider sense flashes, attack with basic action buttons, have to use different tactics during brawls to take down shield enemies, brute enemies, and sword or whip enemies, but it is also a little trickier and way more flashy and impressively animated. Honestly, I prefer it. It's more punishing for mistakes, a little bit more free in the movement, and it looks a lot cooler, so what more can I say? Dodging when your spider sense tingles doesn't do the Arkham thing as well when the game automatically lets you counter and gives you a biscuit every time you press the button whenever you see the prompt. Here, it just gives you a rough idea when you should probably dodge, and using enemy animations and sound cues is what helps you get the timing perfect. You can dodge away from attacks, or in some cases dodge into them, which allows Spidey to slide underneath the enemy, hit them, and then keep the combo going at the risk of being closer in the middle of the danger zone. And like web swinging, there's loads of tricks you can do never explained to you directly, or until you unlock them through XP. You have punches and kicks on square, but then everything else web related map to triangle, which can be used to home attack in on any target wherever they happen to be on the map, grab and swing enemies at each other or pull them towards you to kick them away, pull them upwards into the sky to get an aerial combo going, disarm them, and this isn't including grabbing all the other objects and items in the world around you to cause utter devastation when swung around or pulled down. And since the game is built a lot around Arkham styled soft locking, you'll find that keeping combos going between enemies by web attacking towards them or launching them into the air ready to ground slam them all, or even web swing kick the arseholes off building is done pretty accurately most of the time for the most natural looking and graceful superhero combat I've ever seen in a game. You can pull off Tony Hawk pro skater level ridiculousness here, it's great. Even to the point of dodging into walls mid-air and then launching straight back off of them again into someone's face to get into the action again. The way that health works is neat too, since it's not one of those games that lets you recover over time by escaping the danger and coming back when you're ready or giving you items for it, no. Instead, if you want your health back, you need to trade your focus points for it, which is built up depending on how well you do in the combat, you know, 
keeping the combos going, not taking damage, etc. Get better at the game, take more risks and be braver in group brawls, use more gadgets if you want to, and you'll see the focus bar go up pretty quickly. After which, you can choose to press the down button to get a portion of your health back depending on how much focus you have, rewarding those who adhere to the rules established by the game that makes it the most fun and satisfying way to play in combat, being in the middle of it. If you're overconfident though, you can trade a massive chunk of your focus for a one-hit kill attack instead, which you then have to charge the focus up again with if you need to heal, so deciding on what to use your focus on as and when is a subtle yet extremely effective mechanic, especially in the middle of all this chaos. And yes, all the one-hit kills are indeed uniquely animated and look bloody incredible. Oh, and even better, you can turn off quick time events in the pause menu, yes, even for the cutscenes, which I did straight away, because do you remember what happened the last time Spider-Man used quick time events? <laughs> Once you get new suits from tokens you earn through side missions, you can also get new special moves to unlock that build up over time to be used whenever they're ready. Decoy holograms, times 4 damage, electric fists, shockwaves, iron spider arms, drone attacks, there's all sorts here. All of which affect the playing field in totally different ways, can be swapped when one seems more useful than the other in the middle of combat, and once again all look extremely cool. And in the same vein, there's different equipable web shooter gadgets that can be used on the fly or during the combat for insanely powerful and useful moves that once again look really damn cool and you'll get refills depending on how well you do in stealth or the combat. The soft lock works really well with this too, so you don't feel like you have to keep on going into L2, but that does help sometimes, especially when there's a lot of people and you need to web up one person. These web shooter gadgets can be used at any point during the combos and are equally brilliant and fun to use as much as everything else here. And the game encourages you to experiment with all of them a little bit to increase your focus meter a lot quicker than usual. You can use basic web shooters to distract people or tie them up on the spot briefly. Use ultra powerful web launchers to fly and stick people up against walls or different objects. Use web trip wires that do the same kind of thing, fire web bombs to cover everybody in the gucky stuff, electrocute people, there's so many things you can do here and some enemies even require the use of basic quick reloading web shooters to even fight in the first place like brutes. It's completely nuts, you're webbing up people with your cream like a French baker with an icing bag and two kilos of crack. Do you understand why people kept saying that you feel like Spider-Man here then? Yeah, it's very cliche to say at this point but it really does such a fantastic job of it. Some missions you complete make the audience of people around you burst into applause and you can walk on the ground level and say hi to your you're adoring fans. Or you can be horrible. <laughs> And this stuff may make you feel like you're in Spidey's shoes for sure, but that's not all we have here to make this a joy to play and experience. I mean, just look. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. How is the PS4 doing this exactly? There's tons of people walking around, so many colours and textures flying by faster than you can fart, and doing it all at a consistent frame rate. No, actually, I changed my mind. This game is terrible. It's worse than shit on toast. Wanna know why? Because they don't even use the pizza delivery theme from Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man on PS4, this is not a sin that can go unpunished. Oh my god. Is that it? Mamma mia! I mean, it isn't flawless, it does have weird moments like when all the traffic stops moving for no reason and all the cars look exactly the same, that's kind of strange. And Peter Parker himself kind of has a Thunderbirds thing going on. But everything else from the sunlight streaking through the skyscrapers, the birds scattering as you disturb their rest, the way Spidey realistically reacts with his body to buildings and objects while parkouring, and I mean on absolutely everything. The way he sometimes uses double webs when you use the quick zip forward command if there are two buildings there for that extra level of immersion. And how about that escaping electro mission? Look at this shiting bastard blow up everything and I should be angry but it's just so damn beautiful that I wanted to murder everybody in the city! My god I was completely speechless through this whole part and the fact that it wasn't a cutscene just makes it all the more impressive. Also this bit happened which was simply funny. Vulture. Long time no see! We're going to have so much fun! There was one part though that I actually got stuck on during a mission because the Sable agents fitted out and wouldn't let me attack them. Oh. Uh, are you, are you all right there, mate? I think there's a building in your way. I mean, this shit was funny enough, and then eventually I was allowed to attack them, but then, oh dear, another one just buggered off to the far reaches of space, meaning I couldn't finish the mission whatsoever without restarting the whole thing. What are you doing up there, coward? Overall, though, I mean, you have eyes. I assume, so I'm sure you can see that this game is luscious. There's nothing else I can say other than Spider-Man truly is a visual marvel. <laughs>
<laughs> the presentation wasn't the only thing nailed though to accompany the game feel, because this, New York City, it's wonderful. Better than Arkham City by far, but this is to be expected, I mean this game was made by Insomniac, the same people behind the original Spyro trilogy and original Ratchet and Clank. So when it comes to fantastically realised worlds oozing with life, I trust Insomniac with defleeing my dog with a blowtorch. The level of thought here is so brimming to the point of fast travelling being represented by a brief cutscene of Spidey riding the subway, and that moment I recorded when he finds a cosplayer and starts chatting to him left me gleaming. Okay, stop, that's too much. N no, no, stop it, seriously. Enough. No, I, I said I said that. As did the parts later in the game when Spidey is essentially a fugitive and has to hide on the outside of the trams when he fast travels. And this bit made me smile too when he ends up teaching one of the side characters basics of self-defense, awkward handshaking from a fanboy and everything. And the relationship between Mary Jane and Peter, I actually cared about them both. And one of the coolest things about Spider-Man to me is how relatable and down to earth he is. Once you remove, you don't, you know that. He's just a guy at school struggling to pay the bills, and that is a lot cooler to me than eccentric billionaire Brucey here being miserable all the time. This texting moment where they misunderstand each other hits a lot of relatable notes for tons of people, I'm sure. But can I just give a word of advice to you, MJ? Like, I know you and Peter Parker have had your ups and downs, but come on, if he isn't good enough for you, if pissing Spider-Man isn't good enough for you, no one is. The way the game handles crimes and responsibility is top notch too. Crimes pop up on your radio via the police scanner, and whether or not you help out or leave them to it is left entirely up to you. There's no obligation in the gameplay to do this other than having the residents not be very happy with you when you get to the ground level for messing everything up. It's all up to your conscience basically, which I suppose would be the same thing in real life. And hey, even if you decide to help out with every other thing that pops up, you get tokens for upgrade parts, XP for unlockable abilities, and much like the web swinging, the flow of the game is never compromised no matter what you decide to do, you're in and out before you even realise it half the time. Unlike this game, where you get interrupted constantly with loading screens and cutscenes every time Spider-Man decides to stop off and scratch his hairy ass on a bit of scaffolding. And I must be honest, seeing the combat stuck to one camera angle when you stop armed robberies is a lovely touch. Aren't you really him? Not just a seriously good cosplayer? Lady, that can't be the best cosplayer Spider-Man you've ever seen. Do you even know what Spider-Man looks like? Side quests and things to do around the city are pretty sweet too, and like I mentioned earlier, all link into your upgrade crafting for new suits and upgrades with what the game calls tokens. So they're not only a fun distraction and very varied, but definitely worth doing anyway. Even better, with suit upgrades specifically, with every new skin that you unlock, you also get a new super move to play with. But if you like the move but don't like the suit, it doesn't matter because you can mix and match whenever you want and are never tied down to an ugly suit for the sake of a power-up. Assassin's Creed style towers to unlock more of the map are here to find, but you know you are Spider-Man! So it's automatically more fun and quicker to do. There's collectible bags Peter left hidden around the city just in case of emergencies full of Spider-Man easter eggs and little gadgets, and my favourite distraction quest was taking pictures of landmarks. Not only a tie into Peter Parker's old photography job, and not only a great excuse to mess with the game's light to see how gorgeous you can make it look, but once I discovered even this was incorporated into the flow and the speed of everything else since you could web swing, leap, whip out the camera, aim it to slow the game down, take the image and then keep on swinging along without a second second breath, I'm pretty sure I had to change my pants. It's like everything was thought of here. There's also some pretty decent pace changing puzzles of a few varieties, both visual and logical. There's timed missions putting things under pressure for you, and scanning the environment is nowhere near as broken as it is in the Arkham games by revealing absolutely everything. It mainly just shows you certain enemies, objective markers, and doesn't change the look of the game, which is good, because if the game looked like this for 80% of it, I wouldn't want to make out with it anymore. You want to know the best bit of this game though? Like, my favourite part of the whole thing? Once you reach the midway point, you get to fight. Okay, yeah, there's actually a fair few parts of the game where you play as either Mary Jane Watson or Miles in these watered down and drawn out stealth segments. And they aren't awful, don't get me wrong, but easily are the worst parts of the game in comparison to everything else. Since Spidey can do all of what MJ can do, but more, it just feels like an unnecessary restriction for no reason, and not enough of a good excuse to slow the pace of the game down. Although I did love it when Spider-Man was actually involved with these missions and you could command him to come down and make the enemies frigging launch up into the air like a deflated balloon. <laughs> if there is one thing I'm not too keen on though, to be honest, it's the sodding climbing. Okay, to be exact, it's fine, but it just isn't that great, and for one of Spider-Man's main abilities, it's kinda shit that it isn't as perfect as the rest of the game. And I don't mean just inside either, in fact, indoors I kind of understand why this doesn't work 100% of the time, because you're cramped into a confined space, and Insomniac probably didn't want us sticking to every single surface around you while shanking bad guys in the teeth, but anywhere else in the game it can often be downright broken. Luckily, wall running and speedy parkour is great, and that is what the game is built around 
around, but there are many moments of precise climbing that's needed, yet the game just doesn't allow you to do it. Or you logically should be able to do it, but the game just doesn't let you, forcing you to awkwardly flip backwards and lose your place, or more egregiously, get spotted while in stealth mode. Even in this bit, a square room, a square bloody room, I was stuck in this room for a good 10 minutes because I tried going through what I thought was the right place, but it wasn't, all because I came at it from the wrong angle. I mean, come on, even the PS1 games got this right. And this is a huge shame to me because the descent ability is easily the best in any Spidey so far, if you ask me. It's not just a fancy move with no purpose. It allows you to aim your webbing or zip towards new vantage points when you're stuck upside down to a wall or even do stealth kills. And this janky weird climbing can affect the smoothness of the stealth system itself, actually. I mean, the stealth system works, it's fine, but this is a game more concerned with the speedy reactions and fast hitting combo building than slow strategy. If you're looking for something as smooth and simple to understand as Arkham, you're not going to get it here. Most of the time you get one chance to be invisible, and then that's it. If you're spotted, you aren't anymore. And as far as I could see, there was no way to escape and rehide yourself. I mean, there might be, I just couldn't figure it out how to do it myself. I did try. Oh, and sometimes the stealth doesn't work at all, like here. <laughs> Are you telling me you didn't hear that, you pillock? It's got the basics at least. You can distract, plant traps, travel around vantage points and hang people up in webs, sneak up behind people and take them down silently, but yeah, like I said, it's not Arkham levels of smooth and experimental. It's more for the sake of a bonus to make clearing a room out a little easier. And again, if the climbing was a little bit more refined, I'm sure I'd be singing a different tune. How many other heroes fight crime and fix your shower? You know Mario is actually a plumber, right? Now as far as the rest of the story goes, it's not a major focus. It's as close to a campy, light-hearted comic book plot as it gets, and more like a week in the life of Spider-Man with all the twists, turns, and darker moments included for decent drama. But the interactions between every character and the witty remarks from Spidey himself, and even JJ abusing his callers and spouting anti-Spidey propaganda on the radio are all extremely well done. It's clear we are at an impasse. My best to you and your husband, madam, Jared. Go to commercial, then fire yourself! Then rehire yourself before the commercial ends. But no, your job hangs by a thread. If I paid you, I'd cut your salary in half. The dialogue makes the characters who they are and the story entertaining. And the voice acting is great too. Well, except for this bit. First, I need a natural steroid. My brain will create nightmares that my body thinks are real. There's the greenhouse. I mean, I know that you're poisoned and you're dying and everything, but what is this? Am I playing Spider-Man or watching a really shitty Shakespeare play? The smaller details in the plot and the thought gone into why things work for the gameplay are what make it stand out to me though. For example, the spider suit upgrades are from Dr. Otto Octavius, who thinks that Peter is the gadget designer for Spidey after he catches him working on his own suit. And by the way, yes, you are actually partners with Doc Ock before the shit hits the fan. You also have to hack police headquarters satellites to get real-time crime and map updates. It's not just a random go and clear out everybody here and jump on the top of this thing then you unlock a thing. No, it's not like that. They even nailed Spidey's character down to the point of an unlockable move in your XP menu that lets you flip around and do tricks to get more XP and focus. And all the side quests relate directly to what Spider-Man actually does in the city during the game instead of just having more crimes to fight because why not? Like in that quest when you had to help out the police and in return they won't tell anyone that you've been hacking their own satellites for your own map. That's ridiculously Spider-Man in terms of how it feels. And there's that part where you're so wrapped up in your hero work that you end up evicted from from your apartment and have to stay with Aunt May in the shelter she works in. Or there's that moment where you have to help out an absent Harry Osborn since his father Norman cuts the funding to your research with Octavius, meaning that you aren't only helping Harry with his experiments, but also keeping a business venture for both of you alive for the future once you lose your job finally. There's plenty of personal missions here as well as the ridiculous hero action 24-7 and I appreciate that, along with all the appearances of most of the classic Spider-Man villains we all know and love. And they don't disappoint here at all, all of which have quests that are more than simple running around and beating them up like in other games. They can jump in and interrupt your side quests related to them. They all have interesting plots to uncover aside from just being evil. And with the Sinister Six twist, yeah, that's only for the last quarter of the game to be fair, but their appearance is way too epic and changes up the city a ton since they release every prisoner onto the streets and their boss battles are some of the best in the game. They may be here briefly compared to the other characters but still leave a huge impression, are a major threat that affects the future events of the game and just look at them. This is the dream Spider-Man game from my youth. Black Cat's hide and seek missions to unlock a new suit in particular felt a lot like the Riddler trophies in Arkham. 
you know, if if the Riddler wanted to sleep with you. Maybe it's time to reignite the flame. And I loved how most of the villains, no matter how big or small, directly tie into the events of the story and the other characters. They all have their own motivations and grudges against each other, and it isn't simply a kill Spider-Man because he locked them up plot. Having Peter working alongside Doc Ock to create the arms and seeing the gradual auto transformation from gentle, brilliant genius to unstable, insane monster is so cool and more sympathetic and understandable compared to other incarnations of the character that I've seen. I desperately didn't want him to become the evil Dr. Octopus because of his character and relationship to Peter, but there you go, this is Spider-Man after all, not psychologist man. More importantly though, the story knows to have fun with itself. Have you ever played a game with a mission involving a streamer sending her murderous fans after you and staging a kidnapping for the clicks? Cause it's here! Or how about one mission where you need to stop a fake Spider-Man getting too deep into everything and getting himself killed? Like usually it's a case of someone impersonates Spider-Man to frame him or something, but here it's just a guy that wants to help out but he's getting a little bit over his head. Or how about that mission that sees you going to a Halloween party where internet memes live? And surprisingly what I didn't see coming was the ending, which I found to be extremely emotional and a very satisfying conclusion to the events that have happened throughout the whole game, displaying some of the most character-driven moments in Spidey media history aside from the comics. And the cliffhanger ending is done correctly, concluding the story as telling perfectly fine, but opens itself up for a sequel with unanswered questions and teasing on unresolved conflicts that are hopefully going to be epic beatdowns in another game. This is how you do it, God of War! Not by building up the biggest, baddest gods throughout the entire game and giving you the same shitting repeated troll boss fight over and over again, only to end the game right when the actual bloody fight against something new is about to happen I'm sorry I still liked God of War okay I just didn't love it I know that's got absolutely nothing to do with anything but if I don't make that very clear the internet will skewer my nuts on a bottle opener <laughs> There's no sign of a few of the classic Spidey villains either, opening up more possibilities. The Goblins, Craven, Carnage and Venom, Sandman, Lizard or Mysterio, well, I mean, Mysterio is kind of in the game, but he's a little bit... Hey, what's wrong with you? So yes, I think the game earned itself a little teaser for another game, and do you know why it earned it? Because this may be the best superhero game I've ever played, which used to be Arkham Asylum, but not anymore. The open world is a sprawling playground and is just the right size, but circumvented by the fluency and speed of the web swing in case you find it a little bit too big for the same city visuals from start to end. It's funny, it's badass, it's action-packed, it's beautiful, it's impressive, it's epic, it's difficult, it's satisfying, and it looks a lot better than this game! If you have a PS4 and haven't got this game yet, you should get it right now. You're doing yourself a dis service by not doing so. And if you haven't got a PS4, well, it's pretty expensive. I think you should probably sort your bills out first. And unfortunately, I don't know any other way I can finish this video other than with Spider-Man, Spider-Man, nicer than my nanny's flan. By the game, you will see. It's so good it'll make you weep. Watch out, PS4 Spider-Man. His real name is Bruce Ban. <laughs> Spider- Ah! Word of advice, don't ever polish your weapons, because you'll never know when you'll hear bad news and accidentally fall on them. And this is some pretty bloody bad news we're dealing with today, everybody, because today we have yet another PS2 game from Phoenix Games to add to their flawless repertoire. And I'm not joking when I say this is the worst one I've seen so far, and I know I say that with every single new one that I see, but... Come on, look at this! Why did the referee blow his whistle? If you're a Kadikaras veteran, not that you'd want to be, you already know about Phoenix Games. I've been covering them for years, ever since Dalmatians 3, over four years ago, and they're responsible for some of the highest viewed videos on my channel. Since then, I've taken many looks at other desperate Disney dodgies from them, like Peter Pan, Pinocchio, and one of my personal favourites, Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys. <laughs> Essentially, the games themselves are exactly the same thing. They're all badly coded and pissingly programmed puzzle compilations. Jigsaws, slide puzzles, matching tiles, you know, real bottom of the barrel stuff. And yes, they are always the same on every Phoenix game, with the only thing making each entry stand out being a terrible cartoon based on the titular characters on the front of the box. Sometimes. I mean, in Dalmatians 3, this bitch is nowhere to be seen. 
But this bitch isn't in the game either. I'm not joking, they bastardized classic Disney characters for their box art, even steal concept art from other games onto their box art, and even after that, can't be asked to go through the effort of using their own abominations in their own films. That's the level of uselessness we're dealing with here. That, and I swear to God, they just use one person to voice over absolutely every single character. Take pity on me, Excellency. What will happen to my daddy? How on earth did you find yourself on that tree? These games were licensed by Sony, sold on the shelves, and the films on the game discs themselves could be as short as six minutes long. Sometimes Phoenix Games couldn't even be buggered to get their own original films on the discs and so outsourced some of the movie making to another company known as Dingo Pictures. So where many Phoenix Games look like this. First there was Cubby who was like a small bear. Dingo Pictures movies look like this. Yeah. <laughs> where we're going there is no god because Dingo Pictures made the film that we are watching. Today! I still stand by what I said earlier, Animal Soccer World is easily the worst Phoenix Games production I've ever seen. And just like the mythical bird itself, no matter how many times I slaughter it, it seems to keep rising back from the ashes. In case you weren't sure, Animal Soccer World is based off of that one scene in Bed Knobs and Broomsticks where animals play soccer, you dumbass. And one must ask how on earth you drag that on to a 30 minute cutscene with a beginning, middle and end, but I suppose we're going to find that out, aren't we? What's that got to do with my knob? The film starts with the greatest walking theme I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Christ's sake, it's not even in time! By the way, if you've seen my Dalmatians 3 video, yes, that is the exact same dog from Dalmatians 3. In fact, all the same characters from Dalmatians 3 appear in this game, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Long time no see. Okay. Long time no see. What? Long time no see. Oh, it's Sonic. Long time no see. What are you doing today? I don't know yet. Yeah, I don't know yet either. I don't even know who you are. We can visit some friends. Okay, wait a second here. You go to see your friend who you said yourself you haven't seen for a long time, don't address him by his own name, and then order him around by forcing him to accompany you to seeing other friends? We're 20 seconds into this film and I already hate the main character. That has to be a world record. Gotta say though, I really do love that walking theme. In fact, it's so good it even butts in and interrupts the rest of the music. <laughs> But will it be as good as the hardcore running music in Dalmatians 3? Let's get one thing straight, nothing will ever be as great as that. Okay, so back on track. Our main character is an abusive dictator. Simba here is just rolling over and taking it, so off we go. Uh, are we not going to address that? Oh, Mufasa and Narabi are there now? And then they're gone. We're not going to talk about any of this. <laughs> so these two are off to see their friend Harry, apparently, and off they set from the jungle to do so and end up inside a Greek village. Hold the phone. Where did the jungle go? And who the hell are you? Ladies and gentlemen, did you see it? Of course you didn't see it. Because you can only hear me. Then why did you ask? We're only about a minute into this masterpiece and already I'm completely lost. At least in other Phoenix games, they had easier to follow plots and characters despite me not understanding a single word half of them said most of the time. I don't want to hear every word. But Animal Soccer World? I mean, he's Harry, but I don't know who these two are. I don't know who these two are or why they appeared on screen for less than three seconds. And there's no excuses here. This is a PS2 game that came out in 2005 next to the original God of War and two years after Dalmatians 3 changed the industry! Are we also going to completely ignore the fact that Harry is a six foot tall street flasher? Anyway, as it turns out, Harry is actually pretending that something is going on so that he can report and commentate on it because there's nothing going on, hence all of his ramblings. But this is only a guess from me here, since I can barely understand a single conversation going on. As you can hear, the voice acting is so out of this world dreadful, but when you stitch it back to back with other characters trying to have a conversation, it sounds like someone having a stroke. But what is supposed to happen? Something that even scares the dog. Excuse me? I wasn't talking about you. I didn't edit or cut down any of that, including the overlapping lines on the wrong characters moving the wrong lips. It really is that bad. I see. That is hard. <laughs> really? Well, I'm not. The whole overlapping lines and wrong character lip syncing bullshit is something the film keeps up terrifically from the start to the end, like a demented art project. But would you believe it even has scenes of the complete opposite effect right next to them? Because as soon as Winnie the Turd over here comes out, he's given far too much screen time for a tiny line. Can I sell my candy somewhere? Like, who is in charge of the edits here? Somebody had to watch this back and think, hmm, this is shit. And then cut it down so that all the lines could at least fit. This is a disgrace. Even Dalmatians 3 wasn't this bad. And what's even better is that right after that abrasive silence, 
It goes back to the way too fast overlapping normal cuts again. There is no party. Oh. It's driving me crazy. But nothing. I repeat, nothing, not a single thing on God's green repugnant earth can prepare you for what is about to happen in a second. This transcends any kind of awful I've ever seen in a game cut scene, a TV show, a YouTube video, a film, anything. Uh, it's that bad. I haven't got anything else to say. Commence. Uh, e -oh, e -oh, e -oh, e -oh. Now you tell me. What in the holy mother of crack was that about? Was that from a bull riding tournament where a person was dressed as the bull? E -o, e -o, e -o. Was that a deleted scene from The Exorcist? E -o, e -o, e -o. Was that my auntie's final words? E -o, e -o, e -o. I don't know. Back on track though, that thing just arrived for some reason. And why was that? Oh right, there was some pretty nasty fight going on in the middle of the street. That's why we had the... E -o. And so the emergency duck appears to calm the situation down. <laughs> Well, the duck calms the situation down without waking their parents in the next room anyway. Why were these two fighting though? Well, as it turns out, this dog who lives in the jungle next door to the Greek village found a red ball. This panther wanted to play with it, but the dog wouldn't let him. I tell you, this argument gets a little bit too PG-13 for my taste. That's not true. You are just mad because I can shoot the ball, Fred. No, you can't. I can. No. Yes. No. Okay. So instead of fighting, the animals all get together and decide to arrange a soccer game to sort out the argument. Ah, okay. Because that's apparently how all disputes are settled in the animal kingdom. And the panther is so happy about the situation, his neck vibrates, while the dog is so happy his legs collapse in on themselves. Don't you also need nurses at such a game? Hey, do you mind at all if you speak up just a tiny bit because of... <laughs> will never let me play for the jungle court. Speak up! This isn't a quiet place, it's animal bloody soccer world! So after all of that, we then follow on to Harry the Six Foot Flasher taking photocopies. I'm assuming of his privates. No, of course he isn't. He's getting ready for the big soccer match, of course, which Puss in Boots here hears about and tries to get the inside scoop. First of all, I have to hand out all these flyers, and I have no clue how to do all that. Then why did you arrange a bloody soccer match, you... Dance! All of a sudden, these birds then arrive with soggy old socks for their beaks and say that they will commentate for one team, the Jungle Kings, while Harry will commentate for the other team, the Wild Dogs, which is apparently so funny that the head of one of the birds starts to do itself in the neck hole. And then just when you were thinking, Oh Christ almighty, I can't handle any more birds. Another bird then comes in and offers to spread the flyers around, which he does a pretty miserable job at since he's dropping them all in the same place. And then he flies all the way to the barnyard. Next door to the jungle, next door to the Greek village, and the pigs here get so excited with the news of a soccer match In two weeks there is a soccer championship That the chicken grabs a saxophone and the dog starts drumming the intro to a Rick Astley song this is seriously the laziest slop I have seen from Phoenix Games slash Dingo Pictures yet. I mean, reusing the same characters is bad enough, we've already discussed that, but in this whole part where the rest of the Wild Dogs team is being recruited, I'm convinced they just straight up copied the entire scenes, backgrounds, and character placements from Dalmatians 3. And if not, they're scarily similar. That's a new one, I'll give them that. And at least the mould is broken a little bit in this scene where we move on from the vibrating head laughing to this instead. Hey honey. Knock knock. Who's there? Juicy. Juicy who? Juicy that stupid dog over there. <laughs> so then we cut to the wild dogs team who are deciding who is going to do what in the match. You look a little bit small, but you're fast. And you can run between the legs. What can I be? Nothing, Grummel. You are way too small. This goes on for much too long, after which they all head out for the shooting practice, and this guy thinks he's playing basketball, so that's a very good start. I always have to do everything, just because they're bigger than me. Did Tommy Wiseau voice that thing? I want to give her a second chance, after all, she's my future wife. And no less than nearly 10 minutes into this 30 minute film about soccer, we finally have the first football kick, which is followed by this. <laughs> This dog is then sent away to find a better goalkeeper, and luckily we find one, but for some reason someone added a bouncing ball on top of the dialogue here and I'm about to give up on my life. Uh, goalkeeper? Why a goalkeeper? Okay, we're done here. Time to move on to- <laughs> No! Well, would you look at that? Mufasa has moved on from the jungle and now lives in a lovely holiday villa on the Spanish coast, and he's gonna train the jungle kings. He decides to make the panther guy over here the captain, which he finds very exciting. <laughs> And at this point, the voice actors, or 
voice actor gets so lost to the point that he even asks the same question twice right after he asks the first question. With soccer, can you also play with your hand? Uh, can you also use your head with soccer? No time to focus on that now though because the elephant has been named the goalkeeper, which seems horrifically unfair to me, but whatever. I won't be the goalkeeper. I'll stop all the balls. Yep, I'm sure you will. And I bet you've had a lot of practice with that trunk. Hey, Samsung. Wait, what? Hey, Samsung. Is the bear's name Samsung? Hey, Samsung. Wow. <laughs> And I mean, this isn't even me talking about the other classic dingo picture staples that are present in all their other films. There are bootleg Disney characters seeping out of every crevice. Not only does the dialogue constantly overlap, but so does the music. And how about this for Miss Potential? Puss in Boots is in this film, and he doesn't ever play football. And he's wearing boots. <laughs> so anyway, Simba, and I know he has a different name, but Jesus Christ, he might as well be called Simba, steals the football away from the Jungle Kings and plays with it while his tail spins in an impossible full circle. He's just learning. You have to explain it to him gently. Oh, well, how understanding. What a lovely father he is. And now give me that ball right away. I'm going to take that back. But the good thing is that this is totally made up with perhaps the most epic wind-up to a kick in video game history. <laughs> Do you think I added that music in? Cause I didn't, that's in the game. We have reached the Nirvana people. Indie devs around the world, give up. You're never gonna be as good as this. You will never create anything as immaculate as this. But the real question is though, can the elephant catch the ball with his loose skinned and overworked trunk? Yep, it appears he can. Then Mr. Crocodile over here has a very important point to bring up. How can we score goals when he stops all the shots? Right? Right? No? And then Mufasa comes back to give us more advice, which- Wait, hang on! Where did Sarabi go? She popped in at the very start of the game for about two seconds next to Mufasa and then never came back. Why was she there? Well, where is she now? Did Mufasa eat her? With a face like that, it wouldn't surprise me. And so the awful muck heads off to get uniforms in the most logical way this film can muster. You know... In the middle of the street with a goat who is also a tailor! Little bit of red. And he also sounds like that. Can you make juice for us? I'm sorry, what was that? Can you make juice for us? Excuse me? Can you make juice for us? Just say that one more time for me, please! Can you make juice for us? Oh! You know, I make everything. Well, it's like this. <laughs> Okay, I think I need to explain something here. You know film, when cartoons do that, it's because the characters are having an enclosed and secretive conversation that no one else around them is supposed to hear. <laughs> you can't just do that in the middle of an open street with two carriages on each end of the bloody road because one carriage was only going to be able to hear. <laughs> My God! And you know what? Finally, 17 minutes and 20 seconds into this Oscar winning epic, we finally have the titular soccer match that the whole film is about! Oh my god! Hi there Bambi! Nice to see you can make it! How's your mum doing? I thought we were for the Jungle Kings! And now there's a rebel biker duck gang! You guys are going into Area S. Okay, don't think I really want to go there. If you're making one wrong move, I will eat you. Oh Jesus, I guess we have no choice. And after everyone starts getting angry with the lack of a soccer match in a film about soccer, 18 and a half minutes into the film... Start the game! Start the game! Start the game! We then see two pregnant monkeys pooing on the floor and then we're finally ready for... The Sucker Game of the Year! The Sucker Game of the Year. How appropriate. Although, I think... We all really know, deep down, who's gonna win that one. <laughs> After this point, we have a musical number. Oh yes, a musical number. And these have always gone perfectly in other Phoenix games, so consider me hyped. Wake me, Nookie, wake up. It's time to tell your story. And the thing is, I would make some jokes about this whole segment, but I don't need to. As you're gonna be able to see in a second, the jokes write themselves. Like, there's nothing I can say to make it any weirder than it is. I don't even know if this bit coming up is in English, I gotta be honest with you. So yeah, I'm just gonna let you enjoy all of it in its entirety, just like I had to. I dare you not to leave the video. And I don't have anything to say here either. One, two, three, we are the biggest cheerleader. Yo, 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 yo. 
But okay. In all seriousness, though, I don't think I can add anything remotely productive from this point onwards. I mean, a few interesting things happen, like nobody actually playing soccer most of the time, and the referee is actually friends with one of the teams, which I'm sure is slightly scandalous, but as far as anything else goes, I'm completely out of words to explain anything that we are all looking at. So instead, now what you're going to see is a little montage that I cooked up of all of the weirdest, most screwed up, most uncomfortable, most awkward moments of the entire soccer match, because there's too many moments to count, there's too many things I can say, and the film does all the saying for me. It's all condensed right here, and it's ready for your scrutiny, so please enjoy. The referee blows his whistle, and... Over the line, over the line. Ladies and gentlemen, Custer has the ball, and yes, yes, Custer passed them down to go. What an excitement. Did I see that right? Yes, indeed! Uh, e, uh, e. Here he comes, here he comes, he shoots it in his hole! Ow, 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 ow! Faster, Charlie, faster, Charlie! It's gonna be a goal! It's gonna be a goal! Yes, no, yes, yes, no, yes, no! The halftime is coming to an end! Get your nice color balloons! He's gonna shoot no! And after all of this, the yeah. game chickens out and the match ends at one all. Cop out! So then Mufasa returns and calls for a rematch while sounding too much like that voice in the original Street Fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, because there was no winner in this soccer match, you've got a lot to run before you beat me. And the story ends with the dog and Simba from the very beginning saying that It was a great game, Jovi. Yeah, it was beautiful. Now we can be friends again. When weren't they friends? And when do you think this next match will take place? Get a load of this. Yes, but we still have six long, long weeks. This is in the jungle! Why does any of this take six weeks to prepare? What else have you got to do in all that time? Decide which front of the litter gets made into supper! So in conclusion, what the hell was any of that? I don't know, and I don't think I ever will know. I'm gonna put a pinned comment below this video, and you can all reply to it. You can tell me what the hell any of that was, because I'm sure that one of you out there is supposed to know, and you can help fill my life with a little bit more clarity. <laughs>Good evening everyone, I'm Lawrence Fishpond. In a lucky turn of events, the PlayStation 2 video game Animal Soccer World was shot down by authorities after local man Jim Caddick was found locked in a room of his own house by the video game itself. Police were able to find him after a neighbour complained that they heard screaming coming from the house that lasted for over three hours. <coughs> Nobody during the investigations were able to decipher what the screaming was supposed to mean, but doctors say that Mr. Caddick is expected to make a full recovery in about five minutes. Oh wow, I haven't played Super Mario 64 in donkey's years. Oh well, you know, it is October, it's getting rather chilly outside, and if there's any game that can warm your cold, dead heart, it's Super Mario 64. Dear Mario, please come to the castle. I have baked a cake for you. Oh yeah, cake. We know what that really means, you've... Filthy bitch! <laughs> oh damn, I forgot how much I love this game! It's nearly started, yes, come on, come on, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go! <laughs> okay, what well, the fuck? It's that time of the year again, October. The wind is picking up, the hoodies are back out, the birds have flown away for the winter, the leaves are turned orange and are absolutely bloody everywhere. Get out of my god! And Halloween is fast approaching. Which also means that this channel has officially entered once again. <laughs> That very special month dedicated to spooky things, video filters, and scares that will fill your pants. And speaking of filling your pants, who has heard of Bowel's X? I'm sorry, that was disgusting. Seriously though, if you're well versed enough in internet culture to be watching this video right now, you probably know everything about Bowel's X at this point. In case you don't though, during one of Nintendo's most recent Nintendo Directs, they went into a little bit more depth about new Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe for the Switch, at which point they announced that Toadette would be a playable character. What happened next though, nobody could have predicted. Toadette donned a new power-up, the Super Crown, and morphed into a Princess Peach look-alike, adding further credence to my theory that Peach is nothing but an old parasitic fungus. With that, the fuse was and the fan-made Dream Super Crown scenarios were inevitable. All started by the Twitter user AIG92, who brought forward the idea that Mario and Bowser are so sick of the shit Peach has put them both through for over 30 years, so Bowser himself equips the crown and then fucks and s*** with Mario's 
the Italian c and bar. What started as a concept of the Mario universe that nobody saw coming eventually led to a concept that had everybody coming. This is Bowsette, a twisted amalgamation of what happens if Bowser were the one who used the super crown power. And despite the fact he turns into a version of Peach with giant badoingies for no real reason, don't let that fool you. That is not Peach. That's still Bowser under that disguise. You're beating your peony to this, never forget it. Cute. And if the idea of being tricked into getting excited over an angry Barney the dinosaur with no Johnson isn't scary enough for Halloween, I don't know what is. Plus it gets even stranger once you consider that Peach has most probably had her way with Bowser at least once, according to Super Mario Sunshine, when she gets confused about Bowser Jr's existence. Mama Peach! Aren't you so now the idea of her making out with herself, but with sharp teeth and massive breeks doesn't bode well for anybody. The Bowser craze hasn't only found its way to pen and paper though, because what I discovered recently was one of the most demented and terrifying things Things I've ever laid eyes on. And no, I'm not talking about Mario forgetting his Botox. Super Mario 64, a classic in every sense of the word, revolutionary for the time, and it still holds up marvellously today. I mean, I could do without the occasional camera fits and 100 coin stars appearing in impossible to reach locations, but it really is still one of the best Mario games ever made. And I say that as someone who only ever played it for the first time a few years ago. I am not nostalgic for Mario 64 whatsoever. And when I'm talking about scares and Mario 64, I'm going nowhere near the cliched bollocks that everybody mentions. Welcome to our list of the skew Serious video game moments. Number 15, the piano in Super Mario. I'm looking for the properly deranged, stuff beyond your imagination that you'd never expect to see in a Mario game. And I think I found something. Uh. While browsing Tumblr one day, I found the most intriguing ROM hack for Super Mario 64 I think I've ever seen, developed by a guy known online as Kaze Emanua, or Kaze Emanua, I'm really sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, who's best known for making loads of other high quality Super Mario 64 ROM hacks like Mario 64 Odyssey and Portal 64. But with this hack specifically, like a seagull to a cone of chips, I snagged it up as soon as I could, while screaming at all the children walking past. <coughs> I downloaded it, installed it, ran it, and then this happened. The game opens up exactly like it always does. The memorable menu theme springs to life. Charles Martinet makes my morning. Hello! Okay, actually, before all of that, there was this noise. <laughs> which made me dumb, but everything else is as you'd expect. Princess Peach, oh, sorry, Princess Toadstool, beckons Mario to her castle with the promise of cake, which once again we really know means that she wants him to f***. And then Lakitu pops up with his camera. We follow him through a sweeping shot of the castle grounds, circle around the edge of a conspicuous green pipe, and then... Oh my god, Mario has breeds! Mario has breeds! Maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's Mario Billy. <laughs> Okay, so ignoring the fact that for a mod, this is actually surprisingly well done, even to the point of the correct sound effects being spliced together really well. I mean, just look at this. Are you terrified? Because you should be. Lara Croft, move aside. I thought you were one of the most shameless character designs of early 3D gaming, but Bowsette 64 over here has you beat. Check out those wiggle physics. Look how far these bloody things stick out. It looks like someone strapped a cushion to her nips. And please, for the love of our lord, please explain why Bowsette's default standing position is Waluigi. Believe it or not, I can look past most of what's going on here, including this. I mean, what's going on here? I don't know and I'm not sure the wall likes it. But I cannot for the life of me ignore the fact that Bowsette stands there like a bowed-legged horse jockey in S&M gear. With all the effort gone into the animation, sound effects and everything else, why the spindly Johnny standing pose? <laughs> Hold on a bleeding breet, I just realised. If Toadette wears the super crown, she becomes Peachette, right? So wouldn't that mean if Bowser donned the super crown, he should be Powser? Or Peacher. The name Bowser implies that Toadette is wearing a super crown that morphs her into Bowser. I mean, what the hell would that look like? Oh god, don't look it up. No, don't look it up. Don't look it up. No, no, don't you do it. Stop, stop, stop. Don't you do it. Oh, great. Bye bye, sleep. Anyway, I'm sure you're curious. Is this simply a Mario reskin and nothing else? Well, actually, no. You have a new special move to play with along with your own chest. You can do absolutely everything Mario can do run around, walk around, somersault, long jump, triple jump, break dance, <laughs> kick. But since you are Bowser, obviously, you can breathe fire. And this isn't just an attack. It's so powerful that you can outright destroy elements of the environment, enemies, bosses, and even NPCs. Hey Toad! Oh what? Your princess is in another castle? PISS OFF! Oh look, it's that useless penguin mother. You love your child so much, yet you somehow totally lost it somewhere. Screw child protection services. YOU DESERVE DEATH! Oh yes, now we have the problem of a homeless baby penguin with no mother. Um. 
Say hi to your mum for me! I also accidentally discovered that you can blow up other random interactable objects like platforms, which isn't very useful at all, and doors. Yes, even locked doors of the castle itself, which is more useful. And where some doors will lead you to a black void of nothing, most of the block dust star doors will just let you walk right on through, completely removing the need for you to collect any power stars in the first place, which is the main point of the game. But where's the fun in that, eh? I want to burn everything in my path. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, well, come on. The game crashed. Yes, sadly, as good as any ROM hack can be, unfortunately, as far as software goes, it isn't the most stable thing you can use on your computer. It will do that kind of thing. But hey, nothing stopping you from resetting the game and trying again, is there? What's that? Oh, really? Uh, you're joking, right? Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. That's Yep, I've officially lost my shit! Okay, the standing pose was bad enough, but this is just bloody ridiculous. Time to throw this block away. <laughs> oh right, yeah, that's something else to mention with this mod. While blowing everything up around you is great fun and totally breaks the game, it breaks it in more than one way, unfortunately. Whenever you hit the attack button, the same button used for dashing, grabbing and throwing, by the by, you will throw a fireball regardless of your situation, meaning that if you're already holding an object or an object is close enough to you, the fireball will make contact with the thing immediately in front of you and explode right in your peachy little face. And that unfortunately is what makes the game itself slightly impossible to play in some places. For instance, the Bowser fights. Well, more accurately, the fights with yourself. Ever since Fight Club? Sorry, I digress. You need to do these in order to progress, yet unfortunately every single damn time I tried to spin him, I couldn't help but throw a fireball, which then makes Bowser spontaneously vanish. I mean, yeah, it's funny and everything, but I can't go any further now, and all I can do is throw myself off the arena to try again which then doesn't work when I come back, so I'm totally stuck, which is a shame, because even if you don't like Bowser as a concept or can't ignore the yeah that, the idea of playing Mario 64 with a world-ending fireball attack is one that's very appealing, but moments like that combined with the crashing unfortunately means I didn't enjoy it that much, but hey, maybe you'll be luckier than me. I'll leave some download links for the hack in the description below for you to try, and hopefully Nintendo won't mind the fact that Bowser now has breeds and won't take any of those links down in the future. I mean, you can even make Bowser pole dance, which I'm sure would make at least two-thirds of the internet Next dreams come true, so they can't take it down just yet. Well, this was a good start to the month of terror, wasn't it? Pretty spooky stuff, if you don't mind me saying so. But the question is, is this going to match up in terms of frights to the next thing I'm going to look at on this channel? Well, tune in to the next episode of Kedekaris, where I'm going to be covering... Jesus Christ, that's why Bowser's chest is so enlarged. Her bags are filled with helium. She's so buoyant, she's floating above the floor. Oh, God. Halloween is getting closer. I can feel it. I've already been jump scared twice today. Maybe if I play a scary game right now, I'll desensitize myself to the next scary thing that's gonna happen to me. <laughs> yeah, great idea, me. Let's see what we've got here. Ah, not you! No! No! Not no! Now I know what you're thinking. It's October. It's the month of terror! What on earth does Mega Man have to do with Halloween? In case you weren't aware, I finished every single classic Mega Man game from the Legacy Collection a few weeks ago. I didn't wash for three days straight and nearly went insane with some of the bullshit that the games threw at me. And if that image alone doesn't scare the bejesus out of you, I really don't know what will. But the reason I did that was because Mega Man 11 was due to be released and I wanted to catch up on the series ready for when that game came out and I'd already done a singular video on Mega Man 8 for the PS1. And you know, since the best game ever made, Mighty Number no. 9, hasn't been released on the Vita yet, I guess we'll have to jump on to Mega Man 11 instead, how unfortunate. Yes, I'm a little butt hurt by him. Mega Man's arm cannon up there will do that to you. But in all seriousness, after playing Mega Man 11, I thought the game was completely fantastic. It was hard, don't get me wrong, but I massively enjoyed every single stage, challenge and boss from start to end, and it's now in my top favourite Mega Man games from the classic series. Maybe even my favourite, but I can't be 100% sure on that, since I did finish every single other game back to back and it made me smell so bad that my beard was secreting a smelly fluid. But now, I'm here, I'm gonna play the game in a more comfortable time frame, and I'm sure that Dr. Wily isn't the bad guy once again for the 11th game in a row. God damn it, Wily! Well, you know what they say, when you see the words Mega and Man together, we'll find Dr. Wily. Speaking of that though, Mega Man 11 actually features the most story the series has offered since Mega Man powered up on the PSP. There's original artwork depicting more of the history between Dr. Light and Dr. Wily, and fully fledged voice acting that's cheesier than my pants. I can get down with all of this, and the story here revolves around Wily waking up from a bad dream. <laughs> He's so evil, he has skulls on his pyjamas. And in that dream, he's reminded of one of his earliest robot part experiments that was outright objected by every single co-worker around him many years ago. The special robot part in question was the double gear system, which allows any robots to either increase their power or speed temporarily with the flick of a switch. So with this information refreshed in his head, he sets off to take over the world before even having a complete breakfast. Wait a second. 
You mean to tell me that Wiley has never thought about this invention that he came up with years ago that he was publicly humiliated and rejected about? After all this time, he's only just remembered it. I don't want to fight him anymore. I think Wiley's going senile. This was all just a flashback though, because in the present day of 2000, <laughs> they still don't know what year it is. We're 11 games in and nobody thought to buy a calendar. We follow the exploits of Dr. Light, Auto, Rock and Roll as they do what they always do. Nothing. And then all of a sudden, what on earth? Not that noise, no. not that Auto. noise, not Three, two, that. Surprise, surprise, Wiley came back. Couldn't you tell from his pajamas? And this only begs the question, why does Rock ever take off his Mega Man suit? Why bother at this point? Wiley is clearly deranged and delusional enough to keep on coming back forever. Taking the suit off to only put it back on again is a huge waste of time at best. You see, I recalled some old research. The very invention you so coldly crushed when we were students together. Or has your memory failed you? Oh, shut up, Wiley. You forgot all about your greatest invention ever until you you had a wet dream. We can't just let him get away. Oh uh, what, you mean like you do at the end of every single game, you complete tosspot? Okay, so this story is pretty bloody terrible, but the main thing is that it doesn't ever take itself seriously and is a lot of fun to witness and listen to despite everything taking place in rather static situations. It's got a little bit more focus than the previous games, but it's appreciated. And you know what else I appreciated? The visuals here. My god, this is a pretty game. Granted, it's not the most beautiful thing I've ever seen or the best looking side scroller ever made in my opinion, but this pseudo 3D style in a 2D plane that isn't quite 2.5D because of the lack of Traveling between different dimensions is pulled off extremely effectively. No. That joke is dead now. Does naughty. I would have loved to see a 16 or 32 bit Mega Man 7 or 8 style tried out again with brand new hardware to push the animations to the absolute breaking point, but this to me is a fantastic substitute. It looks familiar yet totally fresh, extremely colourful, and lends well to the themes of each stage. It runs on a buttery smooth 60 FPS, the cell shaded style is extremely unique and fitting for Mega Man, and my favourite thing about it is how it manages to take all of the anime aesthetics Mega Man is famous for and places them directly into the game, such as the way that the fire of Torch Man looks. It's a cartoon flame on a 3D body. How cool is that? And those explosions? Every single explosion? I've never felt so good about blowing shit up before until I played Mega Man 11. Pfft, well, except for in Mighty Number no. 9, it's pretty hard to top this. They look like old Rice Krispies. And it sounds great as well. The soundtrack may not be the catchiest in Mega Man history, but I could jam out to these tunes any day of the week. Anyway, let's kick off into the game. No, Same no, poo, no, different no. hole. Eight Robot Masters and four Wily stages until the end of the game. Except Mega Man this time decided to turn into Jiminy Cricket. And actually, now that I think about it, there is one major use of the 2.5D mechanics that I can think of. This mini-boss in Impact Man stage. He spins around into the foreground and background, meaning that you have to jump over him while he comes into your plate. Yeah. I think more moments like this would have been great to really add, not only to the added depth to the visuals, but how they work within the gameplay too. But at the same time, Mega Man 11 doesn't actually need to add anything, in my opinion, with everything else it brings new to the table, 11 classic games in. The tents are enemies. Tents as enemies in a video game. The year is 2018, and we have tents as enemies in a video game! Yeah, I'm sorry, and the new stuff the game brings to the table. Well, for one thing, Wily is not the only one using the elusive double gear system. Mega Man also has access to it, which allows you to either slow down time or ultra power up your shots for a very short amount of time with the flick of a trigger button. And to be completely honest with you, I found this to be an extremely welcome change to the formula that added a totally new dynamic within the running and gunning Mega Man is best known for. In fact, it totally changed how I played nearly every single stage, yet it didn't make them insultingly easy since many of the obstacles and enemies are built to be ideally taken head on with these abilities by your side. Enemies can even drop gear coolant that immediately adds more time onto the current power that you're using, but it's well balanced in the sense that the game discourages you from spamming them. The time limit these abilities last before you burn out the chip is pretty short before you need to wait for it to cool down and use them again, and the power and speed gears also share the same meter, making it all the more tricky for you to decide what the best timing is to use what power and at what point. And if you get bad at managing it and end up burning out the gears, not only do you have to wait a much longer time for a cooldown, but you also can't use the gears at all until they're fully cooled down in that situation. Situation. A huge punishment for being careless with such power at your fingertips. It's not only a really cool mechanic, but creates another layer of thought for you as a player that weaves in and out of the other things you need to consider, such as your confidence in running and gunning itself, your time management of the double gears, your knowledge of the stages, and making sure that you're not getting over-reliant on the double gears anyway. However, out of the two gears, I use the speed gear all the damn time. I loved this move. And you can even use it to slow down your invincibility frames, which can save your life on the odd occasion. Also, this is all mixed in with Mega Man's classic moves that he's had given back to him since losing them in Mega Man 9 and 10, charge shot and sliding, opening up more chances for interesting enemy challenges, level designs and last minute life saving with an extra powerful shot or dodge manoeuvre. But Mega Man doesn't look terrified anymore when he's sliding. Oh my god! Here he just looks... 
Bored. Rush even makes a return and for the first time ever is set to a separate button command while you're in the normal Mega Man mode, which makes him even more fun to use. And in case you think the game would be made too easy with the addition of the double gears, have no fear, because other little things were tweaked to compensate, like the knockback, which now staggers you for a long ass time before you can move again, massively punishing you for getting cocky no matter the situation. The shop system has also made a return where you can collect many different types of bolts in the stages in order for you to buy tons of permanent upgrades to Mega Man, from reduced knockback to non-slippy shoes and usable items like weapon tanks and E-Tanks. Yes, 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 thank God. Beat the Bird unfortunately isn't a weapon in this game, but he can be purchased for one-off uses in the stages to save you from bottomless pits. And the best thing is that on normal difficulty, these items don't burn too much of a hole in your wallet. I mean, you can't go crazy after every stage, but you can buy a good few of these things. Yes, I played on normal difficulty because screw you, I earned it. Oh well, that doesn't matter because it's time to eat my own words. The first boss is here. But luckily, with a little patience and some charge shots, I was able to get- Oh, oh god, what's going on? What's he doing? Oh, don't do this to me, game. Don't do this to me, game. <laughs> Yes. Just like Mega Man, the bosses themselves can use the double gear system as well. And with this guy, yeah, it was a total pain in the ass to nail the pattern down and he dealt a load of damage. He probably wasn't the best first pick of a robot master to go with since I had no backup lives or E-Tanks at this point in the game, but I finally got the pattern down and destroyed him with only a fraction of my health left. Yes! That's how we do it in my garden. Come on then, Mega Man 11, I'm ready for whatever you have now! <laughs> Stick yourself in my mossy garden! Jesus, this is classic Mega Man, alright? But in all honesty, for as annoying as some of those moments can be, I really enjoyed all of the bosses. Not just for the lack of totally unpredictable random spamming like in Mega Man 3's bosses, but because they test you in more ways than any Robot Master has ever done in any previous game because of their uses of the double gear system. And not just with their unique attack patterns. If you were able to use the gears where the bosses weren't, these would all be pieces of cake, but the fact that they all use your own powers against you in separate segments of the fight, almost like different forms, not only gives you more reason to use your new utilities in different ways, but also just makes the fights that much more exciting and less repetitive. And once you beat them, it's also really nice that you can actually test out the new weapon in the ideal gameplay situation immediately after acquiring it so you don't need to waste ammo, time or lives figuring it out in the next stage, which would have been nice with Top Man's weapon, the piss And it's in these moments that you can really appreciate the OH MY PISSING GRANNY, YOU CAN MIX THE BOSS WEAPONS WITH THE POWER GEAR FOR ULTRA POWERFUL BOSS WEAPONS?! Okay, for anybody that says that the double gear system is bad in Mega Man 11, you're entitled to your own opinion. This alone makes the double gear system one of the best additions to Mega Man, and even without the double powered boss weapons, every single one of these weapons I found to be extremely useful and badass in every sense of the word, and not only for reaching other optional hidden goodies. I found myself running out of weapon energy the most in this game since Mega Man 9, and amazingly, even with the double gears, it still doesn't make the game a cakewalk since the amount of stuff to deal with has been increased dramatically, especially in some of Wily stages. These want you deader than dead more than any Wily stage before. Blockman's weapon is fantastic for dealing huge amounts of damage in a torrent of raining bricks, and is great for reaching those impossible upwards locations. Fuse Man's weapon not only fires upwards and downwards and sticks to a flat surface until it hits a target with two beams going opposite directions, but it also leaves a long-lasting blast radius. And speaking of blast radius, this is, this is, Blast Man's weapon may be pretty useless on its own since it takes too long to actually attack anything even if it sticks to the target, but with the power gear being utilised, it's immediate, massive and utterly brutal. Acid Man's shield may not be the best shield in terms of attacking actual enemies, but makes up for it because it lasts for a certain amount of time to block any amount of projectiles you can before it runs out, and even allows you to melt through armoured enemies with a powerful acid blaster attack. Tundra Man's weapon was one of my favourites. It isn't quite a screen nuke, but for how useful it is directly above and below you, it might as well be. And now that I think about it, it practically becomes a screen nuke when you use it with the power gear. <laughs> <laughs> Christ almighty, Mega Man, I know that we're 11 games in and everything, but calm down, you're gonna give yourself a hernia. <laughs> Torchman's weapon is a little tricky to aim, but once you figure out the triangular upwards to downwards motion of it, it completely melts everything in its path and blows up sensitive explosive areas in milliseconds. Impact Man's weapon is fun too, since it not only gives you a mid-air dash, but can slice through smaller enemies like butter, and pushes back other enemies like butter! And the Bounce Man weapon not only fires upwards and downwards, but spread shots into three places and lets all of those shots bounce multiple times everywhere to clear out rooms pretty easily. Even cooler, you can not only use the pause menu or the triggers to swap between the weapons, but also cycle through them in real time with the right analog stick, making for a great shortcut if you remember which direction to point the stick for each weapon. And before anybody asks, yeah, I did look up the boss weaknesses. 
and I'm not ashamed to say that whatsoever. I know that repeating the stages and experimenting is part of the course with Mega Man, but here's the thing, I'm way too busy to bother going through all of the stages over and over again until I figure out which weapons would have been best in which situation. Also, have you seen some of the boss weakness logic here? Acid destroys impact, bounce destroys fuse, blocks destroy acid, shouldn't that be the other way around? When was the last time you heard about melting a body in a barrel full of bricks? Not to mention, there isn't as many gotcha traps or extremely picky jumps compared to games like Mega Man 1 or 3, but this game does have them still, and the infrequency of them makes them actually all the more annoying, they stand out more because of that. You have absolutely zero chance for error on these parts, you either do it right the first time or you die, no ifs, ands or buts. And the worst part of the game by far is this segment right before the boss door with Torchman. Even with the goddamn speed gear this part is close to impossible unless you have enough energy for any kind of weapon to help you, or unless your aim with the basic Mega Buster is goddamn perfect and you use the speed gear at just the right sodding moment so you don't have the one hit kill fire wipe away our life straight away. The timing is so tight and the knockback stagger time could be the difference between life or death from the enemies that freaking swarm you. At moments like this the strategy I was able to get into was by grabbing as many bolts as possible in the stage itself that piled up with every game over I had, which after a few minutes led me to enter the shop on a following game over and then I had hundreds more bolts than usual allowing me to grab a lot more lives, e-tanks and one use spike protectors and stuff like that. Although be forewarned if you decide to go to the shop and buy any more than one thing from Roll in succession, Get ready for the most annoying thing you'll ever hear in your life. Are you sure? Ta -da! 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 Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Oh god, I'm so close. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Ah, shit! But hey, at least there's a new life I can grab and the life ran away. Good second! Good second! Well, that was a noise. What was that all about? <coughs> God damn, if I didn't know any better, I'd think they found a pretty handbag in a shop. <coughs> At this point, we also discover that Wily's switch around to the dark side may have actually been because of Dr. Light's behaviour the entire time, and how he, along with fellow superiors, treated Wily for his reasonable ideas. Which is an interesting concept for a Mega Man game, absolutely, but doesn't really change the fact that Wily is still a bumbling, pathetic old father that has tried to take over the world 11 individual times, and come on, Dr. Light might as well be Santa Claus. How could he be possibly considered evil? Have you heard him say anything? Anything recently. We may be able to. If there is one thing I'm grateful for Wily for, though, it's that he's decided to stop the whole wiggly eyebrow nonsense. That was just starting to get very uncomfortable. <laughs> Although that doesn't excuse the fact that the Yellow Devil has returned. <laughs> yep, he's back, and my god, he doesn't just do. Uh, well, you know that, but also does all of this shit as well. Look at this. Just when you thought he couldn't get any more irritating, well, he did. However, with the speed gear on your side, the battle is a lot easier, so that's a plus. That's why he does all of this wibbly wobbly bollocks to compensate, but overall, it was easier than all those times that Mrs. Incredible gave birth. Think about it. And this is then followed by my favourite Mega Man tradition, rematches with all the other Robot Masters. Oh, no. No! But being blunt, I was completely used to all the different attack patterns and weaknesses by this point, so I was able to take them down with no sweat, including the Wily bosses, which are great fights and visual spectacles for sure, but still not that bad on normal difficulty. Even the final Wily capsule fight with all the double gear abilities being used isn't that big of a threat. Just stock up on E-Tanks and Lives before you get to this part of the game and you'll be golden and ready for Wily's what? Plan B. Give me a break! <laughs> I'm a helpless old man! Alright. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny. But what isn't funny is Mega Man and Dr. Light letting Wily go for the 11th f***ing time! Meaning the inevitable Mega Man 12 is due very soon, I'm sure. But until that happens, I can massively recommend Mega Man 11 to anybody, honestly. Well, if you're into tough as nails 2D platformers in the first place. It's great for veterans with the level of depth and experimentation with the new mechanics, but even better for newcomers with the backstory flavor text, updated and kick-ass driving techno soundtrack, more explanation and chances to play with all the new moves, and of course the difficulty options not seen since Mega Man 2 or 10. It's not too late to jump into the series, everyone, so please, before you consider going out and getting the latest update for... Fortnite, which is a really stupid name in the first place, you might as well call it Weekly. Please consider picking up Mega Man 11. It's a little pricey if you want to just go through the campaign once, but the additional challenge modes and endless replayability of it makes it worth it twice over. You know, this was the most positive way a video of mine has ended in quite some time, now that I think about it. When was the last time that happened? That's a good question. It's October. It's October. It's hell. It's October. It's October. Do you want a squishy fat controller? It's October. It's October. Ah, that's better. Can we at least get Halloween out of the way before shoving Christmas down our throats, planet Earth? Shh.
kids, I'm coming for you. Yes, I know it's the Halloween special and we're not wearing a costume, but here's the thing, guys. We just came out of a really nice, warm, long summer, especially for the UK. So you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna dress up all summery because God damn it, I'm gonna try and keep it alive. No, it's not quite the same, is it? I'll tell you what. I won't go extravagant or anything, I'll just get a little costume. I've got to do something for a Halloween special, so, um, I've got an idea. <laughs> okay, that's a bit better. Anyway, today we're going to be covering the one and only, the unmistakable Resident Bloody Evil. The genre-defining survival horror classic. Now, I've been making videos on PS1 games ever since May 2012, so why on earth has it taken me until 2018's The Month of Terror? <laughs> <laughs> for me to finally cover one of the biggest games on the system and one that helped cement big budget horror games from that point onwards? Well you see, much like with how long it took me to get to Silent Hill or even Toy Story 2, there are a few games from my childhood or teenage years that just meant that much to me that I honestly wasn't confident enough to dedicate a long time to script for it in order to make the best video I could. With me in my upload schedule for how big some of my video projects are, you need to wait for lightning to strike twice on an abandoned tractor tire in the middle of a desert for me to feel comfortable enough to jump on the chance to do a video out of the blue, and as luck would have it, I feel like I'm ready now with Resident Evil, so let's go, mother fungus! What can you say about this damn game that hasn't already been said? Well, I don't know, so I'll say it again. What do you want me to do? In the offices of Capcom in 1989, an already legendary video game designer known as Takoro Fujiwara was there to direct one of the first ever survival horror games of all time, Sweet Home for the Famicom, or the Japanese NES. But how the hell do you make this scary? <laughs> You don't. So for his next project, he wanted to produce another big survival horror adventure now he had basically established the groundwork years before Alone in the Dark came along. How was he going to make this next game truly terrifying though? By enlisting the help of a man known as Shinji Mikami. And he had just finished designing Goof Troop on the Super Nintendo, so he was clearly the perfect man for the job. But Fujiwara was smart about this, because he knew that Mikami was actually a total baby scaredy cat with wee wee in his poo poo pants, so who better to design a scary video game? I mean, Mikami could easily tell everyone what scared him because of his weak horror backbone. It was a genius decision, and a decision that would would eventually morph into a game that would go through multiple redrafts and even got slated for an original release on the Super Nintendo, but once the power of the little grey toilet seat was unleashed to developers everywhere, the end result became the gory and intense 3D explorative horror roller coaster known simply as Resident Evil. Biohazard. Yeah, it's called Biohazard in Japan. The name was changed overseas because of stupid shit. Many online sources say it was because of a DOS game called Biohazard being released in the US sometime before it, but I couldn't find a thing about that game anywhere, and only Bio Menace, so if any of you can answer that riddle, be my guess. Either way, I love the title Resident Evil. It sounds way more imposing and invasive. Like, evil being in your own residence? That's a scary thought. And today, I'm replaying this game for what must be the umpteenth time, and I consider it a pleasure every single time I go back to it. I love this game to pieces, but to spice up my next playthrough a little bit, I decided to look online for a ROM of the uncut version of the game, which has content that I've never actually seen before. For instance, where the original FMV intro looked like this, <laughs> and this, Joseph! And seriously, can you even see what the hell's going on? Because I can't. What's chasing us? Dinosaurs or some shit? Why is Jill laughing? Cut it out, Jill. This is a very serious matter. The uncut version of the game, on the other hand, looks like this. It's in colour for one thing, and you can actually see that this guy's hand holding the gun has been ripped off of a body instead of just looking like you've picked up the hand of a guy who fell asleep holding the gun. <gasps> But more importantly, check out all of these incredible practical gore effects. I can actually see that they're shotgunning rabid zombie dogs in their faces until their eyes drop out. This was one of the most badass surprises I've seen revisiting one of my favourite games, and why this wasn't included in the original runs of the game, I couldn't possibly tell you. Jesus Christ, Albert Wesker's hair is Pikachu yellow, yes! If you ask me, this would have made the game even more memorable and probably scarier for 1996 audiences. And yeah, you do need to remember that with the more cheesy horror aspects to this game, well, yeah, it's commonplace now, we've seen a lot worse, but back in the day this was actually kind of freaky stuff. This game came out at a time when no one had seen anything like this, especially in an interactive medium, so yeah it may be very dated nowadays but it is definitely a product of the time and you just need to remember that. But hey, what's the story in Resident Evil exactly? Is it about an evil residence that comes alive and eats people? <laughs> no, the game is actually about a rescue operations team from the Raccoon City Police Department known as STARS, who sends out one of their divisions, Bravo Team, to investigate a gruesome series of murders in the Arclay Mountains. There are outlandish reports of family being attacked by a group of about 10 people. 
victims were apparently eaten. At least that's what the news says, but I'd be pretty skeptical myself. You see, this news guy in Willy Wonka, his last name backwards is Leek. You wouldn't trust anyone with that name, would you? However, this all bollocks up as to be expected once their helicopter has an emergency crash landing in the middle of the woods with no responses back to HQ. So then Star's Alpha team gets sent in to not only find Bravo team, but maybe even solve these cannibalistic killings in the meantime. Look at young little Chris Redfield's face there. That's a face that's ready to punch the piss out of the boulder. But of course, zombies happen, and your helicopter pilot, Brad, turns out he's a bit of an arsehole and decides to panic and leave you all in the woods once the chaos begins. No! Don't go! Yes, Chris. Just stand there slowly moving your hand down to your chest like an interpretive dancer. The remaining members of Alpha Team book it to the nearest sanctuary they can find, a totally not conspicuous and horrific old mansion, and figure out what to do from there now that Chris has gone missing. And it's at this point we get introduced to some of the greatest video game voice acting of all time. What is this? Wow. What a mansion! In a so bad it's good way, I mean. This voice acting is worse than naming your whiskey brand Knob Creek. And the voice acting throughout the whole thing isn't only terrible, but makes absolutely no sense half the time. What is it? That's a gunshot. How do you not know what a gunshot is? You're holding one there. It isn't a water pistol. See if you can find any other clues. I'll be examining this. But you don't have the tools needed to examine it. What the hell can you do with this blood? Stare at it. Let's search for him separately. I'll check the dining room again. But we just came from there two minutes ago and found nothing! Why the bloody hell are you going to go back? And furthermore, you aren't even in there when I follow you! What's your damage? Beats me. Well hey, at least I can steal some ammo off of the corpse of my old friend that's buried in his groin. Oh, also, we slowly discover that a pharmaceutical company known as Umbrella may be involved with some of the experiments going on in this mansion in total secret, but as I'm sure you know, that doesn't stay secret for very long. Onto the gameplay though, how does one play Resident Evil? Well, the game itself is laid out in a five-act structure. You begin searching around the main mansion looking for a backdoor exit, which leads you to the mansion grounds and outdoor guardhouse, which nets you a special key to open more rooms in the mansion again, which then leads you to an underground cave segment, finally capping off with a secret basement lab. This may be a linear series of events, but the gameplay within each of these segments is anything but linear. I mean, some areas are more linear than others, like the caves, but most of the time it's a fully explorable survival horror that lets you go, doesn't hold your hand, and lets you figure out how to find keys to open more doors to progress, with only the occasional safe room to stop you getting more to death 24-7. And when I say explore, well I mean if you have the appropriate keys, you can end up having to choose between three plus doors to enter, and new routes with most new keys that you grab. Not only great for replays, but just a cool choice left in your lap to test how confident you are with wandering around and seeing how everything fits together. If you aren't familiar with the term, survival horror games are a lot different from something like Amnesia The Dark Descent, which is just pure stealth first person horror. Survival horror places more emphasis on how good you are at item management and trying to decide in the moment what you should be using your weapon ammo and items on, hence the survival element. You can't just run around and gun everything down and you can't just heal whenever you want either. The combat itself isn't deep, you equip, point and shoot, but every single bullet counts and each shot can turn the tables for you later on in the game if stronger or faster enemies pop out from behind a corner. I like to look at the gunplay here almost like making a move in chess. It's more strategy over skill, you need to decide when to sacrifice your ammo and when to keep it for later, and the combat is merely there as a choice to even the odds instead of running around them, because sometimes you will need to do that if you aren't careful. Ammo itself along with the health items are not common whatsoever, with guns like the Magnum only letting you discover around 30 additional bullets in total throughout the whole game, and enemies can often take more than half a clip of your regular handgun ammo to take down. So often the best course of action is to actually run away from enemies if you feel it's safe enough to save tons of ammo for later, but then risk getting and caught by one of the monsters on multiple treks through the same rooms, meaning that you have to use some first aid or herbs to stay alive. By the way, serious question for Americans, why do you call them herbs? Why is there a silent H there? What, do you live in an house? But this isn't the only dynamic at play here, because you have limited inventory slots, meaning that you have to think about every single thing you pick up. Do you collect that rare bit of ammo in case you find a giant creature? Or do you leave it behind and grab later, but risk getting killed because you didn't pick up that health earlier since you had too many key items on you? If you use the shotgun, you can either play with it safely and fire at enemies at point blank using a bit more ammo than usual, or wait for them to be so close to you they're practically breathing down your neck and then aim at their heads for a risky instant headshot kill. Or how about the herbs that you can heal yourself with? There's a lot of different mixtures you can make with green, red and blue herbs together. So do you pick this herb up and use it straight away to heal a little bit of health right now, or keep it and save it for later, risking the chance to not grab an important key?
key item later, or mix that herb with another herb nearby to save the space but give you a much bigger health item to lose just in case you need to waste it in order to pick up another item later because you can't drop items in this game unless you find an item box somewhere. This added amount of stress and strategic planning on your part is what makes every enemy encounter all the more tense because even if you sort out the ideal inventory set, there's still a chance you could end up missing all of your shots as you waste ammo or even get hit more than you were planning meaning more health should have been on you. And even worse, you can only save your progress via ink ribbons that are once again extremely limited and must be picked up in order to use a typewriter that's closest to you, adding yet another thing to consider when picking up health, ammo or key items. You also have to pay attention to the zombies themselves because once you gun them down they could fall to the floor but if their blood doesn't start pouring out around them that means they're not dead yet. So if you run past them they're going to grab you making you lose a little bit of health or you can use a few more bullets to finish them off while they're on the floor. The choice is up to you and even the tiniest little mechanics like giving you a choice of whether or not you want to pick up an item or hit a switch. Even if there's no threat of anything going wrong when you hit this switch and you just need to turn a light on, it makes you think twice about what you're doing and second guess what your choice may or may not mean. Especially with the amount of traps in the mansion, you never know what's going to happen so that tiny extra little choice just makes you feel all the more stressed. By the way, if you die, it doesn't matter how far you got, you go all the way back to your last save. So do you use one of your limited saves now or do you save it for a little bit later in case you die? It's another choice left up to you. The more confident you are, the more you'll be able to get around with less ammo and health in your inventory to fall back on, meaning that you'll be able to grab key items a little bit quicker and get through the game a little bit faster. Which means that Resident Evil, above most survival horrors, even of recent times, creates a vivid connection between you and the areas you explore. Even Silent Hill didn't have this feature. The map is also very handy whenever you need it and whenever you find it hidden in one of the rooms in the first place, but I find myself never really using it since the game is so great at naturally pushing you to learn every single shortcut and layout of the mansion's rooms and surrounding areas, making all the backtracking once getting appropriate keys all the more easier and less life-threatening. Which you will be doing a lot, especially for your first playthrough, since figuring out the correct order of events and using correct items in relevant places of other rooms is a huge aspect of progression here. Whether it's the original Resi or even the GameCube remake, I never forget the best routes and where doors lead you because of how beautifully woven and connected the areas actually are, especially in the mansion. And hey, with the main mansion itself, clearly the most effort was put here and it really shows. And not just from how well it's designed and how much it feels like a big old house, but also with how the game nudges you towards learning it naturally to make the whole quest that much easier for you and more satisfying. Especially if you need to do a bit of item swapping in the occasional safe room and then head back to where you just were. There's even a mission in the game where you find another one of the missing team members who's been attacked by a terrible demon. Terrible demons. And in order to move the game along, you have to rush back to a safe room to get an antidote to come back. I mean, the guy dies anyway, so it's kind of pointless, but it's a good test of your knowledge of the mansion. Ouch! I suppose then it's really lucky that all the item boxes spread out all over the game work like this. Hello! meaning that they're universal and keep the same items in them no matter where you are, which makes no sense, but I can't imagine how much more dull and annoying the game would be if it were any different, honestly. Now, there's something else you might have noticed as well. Even though Chris Redfield is on the front cover of this game, or at least I think it's Chris Redfield, it doesn't look anything like him, so it could be anybody, I don't know, it might as well be my dad. How come I'm playing as a girl, Jill Valentine? Well, you can actually choose who you play as at the very start of the game between Chris and Jill, and every time I pick, I go 80% of the time with Jill, because she's the better character to play as by a far margin. And when you put these two together side by side and judge them by their appearance and 90s media stereotyping, why is it that little Jill over here is way better to play as than and big burly man muscly Chris Redfield over here. Because when you play as Jill, you'll be saying out loud to yourself, Whoa, man. You suck! Chris may be able to run a little faster and take a little more damage and has another story mode with different character interactions for replay if you so desire, but Jill completely kicks his ass into orbit from having a lockpick at the start of the game that gets her through many locked doors and desks automatically without the need of small keys to find and take up inventory slots. And speaking of, she has an additional two slots to her inventory to boot. Which doesn't sound like too much, but in this game, inventory management is a huge component and the more space you have to play with, the better your experience will be. It's hard enough with eight slots, let alone Chris's pathetic Six. He probably needs more space in his jacket for his rippling biceps. The only thing I'm not too fond of with Jill is her attitude to things. It's questionable to say the least. Nothing special. Hey. What, you mean the rows and rows of deadly virus capsules in front of you? Nothing useful. How could you possibly know that? Look how many chemicals there are. Read the labels. Nothing unusual. Are we looking around the same mansion here, you daft oblivious pest? All those things are niggles in the grand scheme of things, though, because the real reason you want to pick Jill is for her campaign story alongside one character in particular. And that is none other than Barry, bloody, buggering, bastarding, person. You saved me! 
Yeah. He's the best character ever put into a work of fiction. What is he like though? I mean, it's kind of hard to describe really. He's like, he's like- Mary, you're so optimistic. Is there something wrong with you, Jill? Barry alone makes Jill's campaign one of the most unforgettable experiences you'll ever have in a horror game. Actually, no, not just a horror game, a video game in general. Just listen to some of these porkers here. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. What? Okay, how the hell does someone become a master of unlocking? Unlocking what? Something's wrong with this house. Whoa. This hall is dangerous! Was something dangerous supposed to happen in the middle of that sentence? Because nothing did. And by the way, this is the safest hall in the whole game, so I don't know what you're talking about. What is it? Oh, you know, Barry, it's just that thing that ate one of your closest friends five minutes ago. But, you know, you can laugh about it, whatever. Now, Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. Honestly, it's just the delivery of that last line that really bugs me there. I mean, what is it with the whole granddad sitting on the rocking chair with his grandson on his knee, you know? I told you, don't worry. I'll just go and get some fresh air and be eaten by a monster. Well, that escalated quickly. It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. As opposed to using a weapon against a dead thing. Oh my god. God. I think we all know what everyone's favourite line is. A line so infamously shit that everyone knows it even if you've never played the game before. If you decide to pick up the shotgun on the wall here without replacing it with the wooden shotgun, you end up activating a trap in the next room. As Chris, this will kill you, but as Jill, as the ceiling is just about to come down on your head, Barry saves you at the last minute. Oh dear, are you stuck? Master of unlocking my ass! And in this near-death situation, with you being saved just before your untimely demise, Barry thinks it's more than appropriate to spout out this. That was too close. Close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. You know, when I was younger, I always used to think he said Jibble sandwich because of that little cough he does in the middle of the line, but it doesn't really matter, it's just as dumb as the original line, so whatever tickles your jibble. <laughs> You're right! The game also has light puzzle solving to access particular items or even optional goodies like health and brand new weapons, which is pretty damn light, honestly, and mostly revolve around pushing items around rooms in a 3D space in the correct way. But a few may catch you off guard, especially those puzzle rooms that may end up killing you if you rush through them without thinking, meaning that you have to go back to your last ink ribbon save. I tell you, you will not trust any single room in this game because of that. Observation and patience is as much a key to playing the game as quick-fire decision making when things are out to kill you and it can make you very on edge when over an hour's worth of progress is hanging on by a thread and makes any puzzle, no matter how simple, memorable. Are the puzzle Silent Hill levels of good? No, not at all. But with everything else going on in this game, I really don't think they needed to be. They're just a nice little change of pace. What else adds to the tension? Well, the controls themselves. This game operates on tank controls, which means that no matter what direction your character is pointing on the screen relative to you, pressing up moves you up, left points you left, right points you right, you get the idea. People like to slag off this control style like nothing else and call it a bad stain of early 3D game design, but honestly I think it has its place in some games and Resi 1 is built perfectly around this control style with all the angular room designs and static fixed camera angles. It doesn't take long to get your bearings and once you start transitioning from one crazy camera angle to the next you'll be glad this has been implemented. No matter what happens, knowing that you don't have to constantly flip your button presses around depending on where the camera throws you to next is actually kind of smart. And I can't say it's a restriction because of that, I mean why do you think they kept this control style for the remake as late as 2002? Not only that, even when you get used to it, this is what early Silent Hill and early Resi were best at with that control style, making you think twice for just an extra millisecond to add another layer of panic when you're being chased by a stronger enemy or need to dash around something else. Even if it's just for a microsecond, you second guess where you should be running, which direction you should be pointing, and where you should be pointing your gun, and that makes it all the more fun to figure out, and makes the combat all the more engaging. It adds to the atmosphere as much as anything you actually see on screen, and I love it. And hey, what about what you see in the game? I mean, okay, yeah, it has dated quite a lot since it first came out. It's not the best looking game out there, and especially compared to like Resident Evil 2, yeah, the game doesn't look as good, but it still does its job really well. It gives each room of the mansion, every environment, its own sense of identity. Most of the game is built around pre-rendered backgrounds that real-time 3D models are placed on top of, not only making for a very unique looking game, but was probably the most logical thing to do with the size of the environments and the amount of detail needed to make it feel like a real mansion. It also makes more sense with the fixed camera angles too, not only to to hide away the 
the threats around every single corner to keep you on your toes, but to make sure they load quicker and look far more visually distinct from each other, making the backtracking a lot less monotonous and making the eventual choice of which door you want to enter with the correct key all the more exciting. You never know what secrets, traps and surprises lurk in each room, and the fact that they all have their own personal mood to them with the lighting and colours makes them all easier to remember in terms of positioning with the map. Also, I do absolutely adore the darkness and subtle dimly lit corridors in the GameCube remake, but I equally feel like the bright, garish and ugly wallpapered walls are just as eerie. With all the lights still blasting away, it's almost like you've intruded on this house during an important event. It's like you're right in the middle of the experiments that are happening all as you are there, and that's kind of freaky. The pre-rendered backdrops also help you distinguish where interactable objects, pickups and even secret doors are to give you hints on what you need to do in each room without them being way too obvious. But this thing on the wall in the garden area though, what is it? Why can't I pick it up? What, what is it? And hey, how can we talk about Resident Evil without talking about the door transitions? Probably the most effective and creepiest loading screen in gaming history. Every time you go up and down stairs, ladders, or through doors into another major section of the mansion, lab, or guardhouse, you get given the model of the door surrounded by a pitch black void, which then slowly clicks and creaks open to give you just a few seconds of stewing in your seat, wondering what could possibly be behind the door. And the more rusted and decrepit the door looks, the worse the feeling gets. And once the screen quickly fades back in from black after the door closes behind you to only throw a monster right in your face, you begin to distrust every single door in the game. You just never know what's on the other side and what could pop into the frame. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's only Jill. Still a pretty weird camera angle though. And don't forget, I'm talking about a loading screen, yet how the game masks it to make it a part of the survival experience is nuts. It's nuts. And these FMV clips that play throughout the major events of the game really add to the uneasiness simply from how jagged and uncanny they look after all these years, with my favourite being the one where the fastest and deadliest enemy in the game, the Hunter, is introduced. You come back from the guardhouse to explore the mansion again, only to see that something incredibly fast and vicious was behind you the entire time, dashing after you with deep throaty breathing and intense music backing it all up, and before you see the hunter in the flesh, you're left with this horrific image of a green scaly hand opening the door you just came in through. And yeah, it looks kind of shit, but that's what makes it so creepy. You don't know what it's gonna look like. And you can't forget one of the most standout and important FMV sequences in the whole game that's so iconic that most of the Resident Evil games after this would make a tradition of replicating it. The first ever zombie reveal. Now including a half-eaten head rolling on the floor in the uncut edition. <laughs> okay, it's pretty laughable nowadays, but at the time this was one of the scariest things anyone had ever seen. If you can believe that. Actually, I take it back. This was the scariest moment in gaming history at this point in time. And to make things worse, once you get over the whole OH MY GOD WHAT DO THE CONTROLS DO moment when you've been taken off guard, it happens again right after you survive the first encounter. Hang on a second. I was able to take down two rabid zombie dogs jumping in through the windows in a narrow corridor, but Wesker won't let us go back outside the front door of the mansion because we were chased into the mansion by those very same dogs. Don't open that door! In fact, we're more than okay to stay in this mansion while being eaten alive, gassed to death, sliced up by lizards, poisoned by giant spiders, but still refuse to go back outside the front door. The entire Resident Evil series wouldn't have happened if the characters just left through the same door that they first came in because that was the safest option. Who missed that oversight? By the way, wanna jam out to some of this music? Check it out. Okay, a lot of the game is just really quiet hallways with nothing but your echoing footsteps and distant groaning creatures to keep you company, but whenever music is used, it's completely incredible. Just listen to some of these pieces while looking at some of the visuals and you'll see what I mean. And the save room theme particularly stands out. It's the most peaceful and comforting piece in the game, yet is still unsettling as all hell to let you know that you aren't as safe as you think you are.
Fun fact! Did you know that the original composer for Resident Evil, Mamoru Samuraguchi, actually admitted to paying off a ghost composer who wrote all the music without credit? He unfortunately was losing his hearing for many years during his composing career, but it got so bad at Resident Evil's development that he couldn't actually do it. Which means that if you get any digital copy of the original game on the PlayStation Store nowadays, for legal reasons, you're stuck with the Joel Shock Edition soundtrack that was a last minute release replacement for legal reasons. Yep, I'm not joking, this is actually in some versions of the game, and it's the best thing I've ever heard! Well, the game itself may not be very scary nowadays, though, I gotta admit, there were a couple of occasions where it still managed to get a jump out. Ah, get off that! And what Resi 1 has going for it against most other horror games of its time, is the atmosphere. And I don't mean just from the gameplay and controls working together or the visuals and music working together, it even works with the backstory and tragic notes left behind by innocent scientists and mansion grounds workers that you can read on different desks. Despite a couple of translation issues, they can be surprisingly ominous, especially when you're reading about the writer in question slowly getting infected into a mindless zombie. And this one, the itchy tasty memo? The fact it appears right after a jump scare from the cupboard behind you insinuating that you were reading the memo left by that very same zombie that's a little bit disturbing. I mean, why you don't get infected whenever you get bitten remains to be said, but I suppose this is in the same game that tells you it's too dark to see what you're picking up in this room, so the only way to see it is by lighting a candle in the other room. And why in the goddamn bloody hell is there a door with a very important item locked behind a piano that has to play a very specific piece of music to open? What if you need it in an emergency? Can you play the piece faster? And what is this poster doing in the lab? What is that? And you pick up an ink ribbon hiding underneath it. Ugh. How many inky ribbons do you think enjoyed that poster? And how about this diary here? You played poker. Okay, who with? Scott the guard and alias, alias? Is he best friends with four names? And this voice acting is starting to get really distracting, not just from the deliveries, but the awkward pauses too. Wesker. Jill, so you're safe. That's what I was going to say. It's so awful that even Jill can't handle it while her friend is dying. Jill, here's my radio. You should keep it. I'm... Oh, that really was a dreadful performance. Why on earth are you here? Uh, I just had something I wanted to check. Oh my, it's Jill! Oh, Barry, it's you! But where did you... I apologize for interrupting, Jill, but I just heard that Dr. Foster got stuck in a puddle in the middle of Gloucester. Anyway, if it isn't clear enough already... Despite all of the flaws, the stupid bits, the funnier moments, and just how dated it is overall, Resident Evil I can still massively recommend. It even still set me back a good six to seven hours, and that's of pure gameplay, not including replayability. Let me tell you, the fact that this is one of the earliest 3D survival horror games, yet it manages to get so much right on this early attempt, just goes to show how good it really is. It's a testament to its quality. And it's a lot better than the new Silent Hill games and the Tinko. Especially with the Resident Evil 2 remake around the corner, give this a go. Do yourself a favor, start off Resident Evil the right way. Or get the remake on the GameCube, that's even better. Or the HD remake of the GameCube remake on the PlayStation Store or Steam or something. That's Play it! I need to wrap this up though, this video has gone on long enough. What else happens in the story itself? Well after that first zombie encounter that Wesker told us to investigate, we head back to the main hall to look for him, but he's gone. WESKER! Barry Burton then tells us to look around for more clues to where he and Chris could have gone. Help me look for him, Jill. And please let me know if you find the top of my wig. This leads us logically into the attic where a giant mutant snake is ready to eat us. Oh god, oh, oh god! And then we need to find a back door in order to escape, leading us to the guardhouse and towards a giant mutant plant blocking access to another mansion key. We take that thing down and Wesker comes back, but acting in a very sketchy way. You disappeared from the hall all of a sudden. I'm sorry, but I have my reasons. And no, not just from his voice. The key leads us to another room where the snake comes back before smacking its head into the floor, ready for good old Blurry Blurry to help us down the hall. Alone. With a rope. <laughs> that he drops. Christ's sake, what's wrong with these people? After searching around the basement for a battery to stop some water flowing in the sewer pipes, we end up in a series of nasty underground caves with tons of hunters and traps waiting for us, where we then meet up with another member of Bravo team that we were supposed to rescue. Frank Oz? The stars are going to be finished soon. He tells us there's a traitor on our team before being shot himself, but come on, it can't possibly be Barry Burton, even though he left us to die in the middle of a hole. We need to get to the bottom of this mystery as soon as possible. Ah! It is time, as people 
Okay, seriously, I wasn't ready for that. I very nearly died, and I'm immensely grateful I had my bazooka on me. This leads us eventually into the secret mansion basement labs, where we can view some photo slides in the offices to not only find out the names of all the bioweapons we've seen, but even see who was on the umbrella team that created the T-Virus and messed around with these experiments in the first place. <gasps> it's Wesker! He even works in a secret shady organization with his damn sunglasses! What's wrong with him? How did they get Kiefer Sutherland after some more perfect voice acting? I was looking for you. Barry. <laughs> it turns out that Wesker was blackmailing baby button to work for him the entire time by threatening his family, poor old teddy bear. And then we finally get taken into the deepest part of the lab, ready to see what Wesker and Umbrella were working on this entire time. Tyrant, the biggest, most aggressive and powerful ultra zombie you can imagine. You don't mean you're experimenting on real people. Okay, I take everything back. At the start of the game, pick Chris. Jill is stupid. Speaking of Chris, actually, after Tyrant escapes his cell and slaughters Wesker, the sleazy neon yellow head bastard, we take him down for the time being and do a little bit of side questing involving a key that Wesker dropped and using a load of items we've been collecting throughout the whole game in order to reach Chris himself, who's been locked in a prison cell. Oh, Chris! So you're okay? Yeah. Well, judging by his pants, I think he's a bit too okay. This here, though, is far from happy when we find out that is bleeding out on the floor as we're escaping, and his last request is for us to give his loving family a picture with a message on it addressed to Moira and Poli. Is her first name Roly? Oh, it's also worth saying that to add to the replayability, you don't just have this ending either. There's multiple endings where different people survive for both Jill and Chris's story, so that's pretty cool. But there's no time to think about that now, because we are now in the elevator, ready to reach the helipad and escape. And that is a face that's ready to kick the shit right back up someone's ass. I reach the top, grab a flare, set it off ready for a helicopter to come and save me, and what? then... Uh, the the what? game ends. <gasps> I have never had that ending before. Every time I played Resident Evil, I always get the ending where Jill gets to the roof of the building and then Brad the helicopter pilot comes along and drops you the rocket launcher and you fight Tyrant one last time and then you blow it to pieces before the entire lab self-destructs. Well, screw this for a laugh. I'm going to pretend that that's the ending I got. And so with that, we get the rocket launcher, blow Tyrant to pieces, destroy the entire mansion for giving us so much shit, and that's the real ending of Resident Evil. <laughs> More like... Rubble Evil. Resident blew up. What a perfect way to end the video. <laughs> Okay, honey, I'll be right there. What are you doing? I'm just finishing off this script. I need to save it. We don't got any more ribbons. Oh, fuck. <laughs>
by the end, but this doesn't mean that a fantastic and effective story can't be told just because it's a prequel, and I'm immensely glad to say that Red Dead 2 exceeds in almost every way with telling a great story, and provides so much brilliantly detailed flavour text and background to all the characters I loved and hated in Red Dead 1 that I struggled to even care about what I already knew. Aside from that, as a game, Red Dead 2 is an incredible Wild West outlaw simulator, and that's the best way I can describe it. Because as a third person action adventure game, I didn't think it was the best in its field for controls or smoothness of your movement whatsoever, but as a simulator mixed in with a bloody and intense action adventure game with the amount of paths you're able to take, the amount you're able to do, the level of depth to the atmosphere and how well it succeeds in making you feel like a struggling and oppressed outlaw, that's what ultimately pulled me in. I mean, just look at how realistic this game is at Five Finger Filet. Oh my god! So today, I'm going to review it for you all, and I suppose it goes without saying there are going to be some gameplay spoilers in today's video, but I'm going to keep certain fates of certain characters completely out of this video. I'm not going to ruin any of the character quest lines or anything like that and what happens to specific characters. I'm just going to be talking about the game as a whole and not ruin the major plot events. But you know, still, just to be safe in case you want to go in completely blind. Spoilers are right, okay. Nice. And hey, if you didn't enjoy this game, that's completely fine as well. I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong. This channel is all about having a good time and me just sharing my personal experiences. I mean, I wouldn't take what I say that seriously anyway. Did you see what happened the last time I was asked to make a sign for a frat? party. In Red Dead 2, you take control of Arthur Morgan. He's a fiercely loyal, dryly humorous and vital asset to the same gang you end up hunting down as John Marston in the original Red Dead, led by Dutch Vanderlyn before he went crazy and started recruiting Native Americans to harass the town's vote for giggles. The story sees you going through a chunk of Arthur's life from the moment the gang starts to fall to pieces after a failed robbery in a town known as Blackwater, with every effort of the gang trying to stick together and pull off more illegal stunts to fund their escape, bringing in worse returns at the cost of more and more blood, eventually until the gang disbands because there is literally no point in fighting the rapid speed of the changing social system. A bit of the mystery for me was ruined indeed by the original Red Dead's existence, however that doesn't mean I didn't absolutely bloody love the story here, and honestly couldn't see where much of it was going. I found it extremely engrossing with mixtures of hilarious, heartwarming, gritty, awful and totally tragic all in a stewing pot of whiskey and urine that I like to call pisky. And as someone who adored the character of John Marston in Red Dead 1 and didn't think Arthur would come even remotely close to his level of interesting and likability, he bloody well did as well. I'm counting. One, two, three. Milliken, is it? Yes, sir. Will you count for me? I got talking to do. Uh, yes, sir. Of course, sir. <clears throat> From one or four? Oh, so? very funny. No, we must be at 11 by now. I loved his dry wit, his aged, non shit taking attitude, his expressive dialogue, and his gentle yet brutal nature. And despite him being an outlaw, you really feel for the dude, you know? No matter what atrocities he would be a part of in the story, I always felt his humanity and morality struggling against his loyalty to what he considers to be his family within the gang, no matter how badly he thinks the war they're fighting against the system is going. And since he has nothing else he can possibly do to rectify his guilt this far ahead into his days as an outlaw, all he can do is try and get the best possible outcome for those closest to him at the expense of other people in the most justifiable way possible. Ideally without getting anyone innocent hurt, but as we know, this is a Wild West story and they are never ever happy-go-lucky. The way the game unravels the plot too is extremely natural and great stuff. You spend a lot of time during quests back and forthing with each member of your gang and getting really attached to them, making any eventual betrayals, deaths, kidnaps or more even more gut-punching. And aside from a couple of bad apples looking at you, Micah, it is really damn ironic how most of the morally grounded and likeable characters in the whole game are the outlaws themselves despite how far civilization has moved on. I mean, look at Agent Milton from the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Everything he does in this game is completely understandable and justifiable, but my god he's such a bloody bastard. And it's his partner in this game that becomes the next bastard in the original Red Dead, so that's how much of a bastard he is. His bastard runs off onto other people until they become bastards. All the characters in the gang as well, no matter how small a role they play in the plot, I ended up remembering, which doesn't ever really happen for me in modern games. They all have completely different personalities, distinct senses of humour, and the game as a whole does a great job with showing us what many of the characters in Red Dead 1 were like in their heyday, and how the American landscape changed them as the Wild West era came to a close and puts a different spin on everything in Red Dead 1. Seeing Dutch, for instance, one of the nastiest assholes in Red Dead 1, go from a genuinely lovable and charismatic leader to a bitter and hate-filled psychopath is extremely depressing. And Arthur's entire story arc is even more depressing despite the fact he's a new character to the franchise, especially with how 
he helped out many of the gang members get out as things turned to shit, and the amount of guidance he gives John Marston ready for his eventual redemption plot in the original game. Not just for his actions as an outlaw, but the treatment of his family too. And because of that, I was a little shocked to see some of the scenes with John, to be honest. Not because he's horrible or anything, but because he's a totally different person at the start of Red Dead 2 compared to the start of Red Dead 1. The themes of the changing times are hammered in greatly from gameplay too. I mean, you can keep your bounty as low as you possibly can, but story missions, like it or not, force you into situations as part of a rebelling outlaw gang too stubborn and too far gone to bow down to the changing political and social climate, leading you to get bounties regardless, meaning the game is made just that little bit harder for you out of your own control just because of who you are. You can't just keep paying off your bounties and remain clean. There's this constant struggle between the law and the lawless that gets more and more extreme as the game continues, eventually culminating in scenes where instead of giddy up fast paced intense battle music, things get gradually much more sombre and slow as more and more innocent people die at the plight of Dutch slowly losing his mind and you truly feel the weight of that. So much so that the game ended up depressing me with its incredibly done tonal shift. It's not like one sad moment after another sad moment, it's more of a collection of moments that pile on top of each other and then just all fall to pieces. All in all it paints an overwhelmingly bleak picture of what the Wild West was more like instead of this delusional romanticised version that Dutch and many of his followers still believe that it is. Before anything else gameplay wise, I really must praise the agonising level of detail in this game, and that's another thing that makes me feel comfortable in saying it's got a lot of simulator-esque aspects to it. The attention to detail here is absolutely exquisite, and the only way I can illustrate that is by listing some of the things that I personally noticed. The way Arthur's body reacted to different levels of terrain felt eerily real with the insane amount of animation on his body, and I loved the way he tried to at least walk down a steep hill before eventually falling over. And when and where your horse trips up in the middle of a gallop feels extremely well done too. Realistic, weighty, and for me at least, always happened at extremely awkward bits of rock or tree stumps the horse couldn't possibly jump over in time. Not only does your hair grow throughout the game that you can trim and style depending on the length, yes, you need to be patient and play for hours to get your own custom hairstyle in this game, fabulousness doesn't come for free darling! But you can also get more and more dirty throughout the game and choose to wash it off in a local bathroom, along with other services. Every time you eat or drink something from your inventory, you discard the rubbish on the floor, and the litter will stay there physically in the game world for you to shoot or kick around. There was one time I saved a man from a stagecoach robbery, and as thanks, he offered me whatever was in the safe box at the back of the coach. However, I didn't have the correct tool to open it at that point of the game, a lock breaker. So I thought, hey, why not use my gun? And wouldn't you know, it bloody worked. If you keep dead bodies or dead wildlife on you for long enough, they will eventually decompose and provide automatic bait for vultures and other random wildlife wanting to nibble their bits off. If you stay out in the cold for too long without the correct clothes, you eventually get sick, meaning that items like cigarettes that would usually up your stamina or slow-mo dead-eye meter will actually damage you and cause you to cough and give away your position. Birds can randomly attack fish from busier ends of rivers to give you an easy kill for selling or cooking. You can not only have your hat shot off during gunfights or smacked off of your head, but you can also pick up any other random person's hat on the floor. Or gun, now that I think about it. If you run out of ammo, that is. If your horse has a bit of a fright, it shats! And Arthur isn't having any of it. And speaking of, after bonding with your horse for a long time, it will begin to follow you without you even calling it. Also, if you're having a conversation with someone else on horseback, you have regular loud-ish talking volumes if you ride alongside them. Did you two ever think about getting out of the life? No, we did briefly. You don't remember? But if you drop back too far in the middle of a sentence, not only will you get the typical Uncharted 4 and God of War PS4 trick of having the characters ask you where they last were before being separated, but if you're just close enough to them before that happens, you'll continue speaking, but shouting even louder to compensate for how far away you are. Why are you getting involved in this, Dutch? You know me. We shoot fellers as need shooting. We save fellers as need saving. Feed them as need feeding. Not this again. It's been quite a while since we held anyone but ourselves. This only happened to me twice in the whole game, but does this mean that every single potential line for horse riding chatter was recorded twice just in case you were too far away? If so, Christ almighty, that's impressive. And when your camp is celebrating a good job well done or the return of a missing partner, you can choose to either join in with the singing, dancing and drinking, or just go to bed and ignore it until the morning. And that particularly impressed me because that's exactly what I do in real life. And as for the visuals and music, shit the bed, it's incredible in both departments. Musically, it has one of the most varied and enrapturing scores I've heard in a long time, with every spectrum of emotional and totally badass being covered with the same instruments for radically different scenarios. And hey, those tracks with actual singing in them, whether it's for a happy montage or a reflective, depressing trot back home after a devastating event, they were all memorable, brilliantly performed, and actually contributed to the parts of the game they were used. Unlike like the most awkward scene in gaming history, Skullface. What kind of a name is that anyway? Everyone has a skull. That is what your face is. Oh, you'll show me your demon 
will you? Great, well then why don't you say something about your demon for five pissing minutes? And the visuals, I mean, my god, I knew this was going to be fantastic stuff from the very beginning of the game when you see the hoof prints left from the horses walking in the snow. That is perfect. That is... Italian kiss. Some of the best quality horse snow footprint graphics I've ever seen in my life. 61% on Metacritic. Five star! Pre-order at Target now and get exclusive horse nappies! And it isn't just immeasurably detailed, brimming with life and way more gorgeous even in desolate wastelands compared to the first game, which still looked great for the time, but it can be downright vile and nasty on many occasions to accentuate the position you're in and how horrible the life of an outlaw could be. With some of the details found around the world as well, it doesn't hold back on what some humans were capable of at that time and can even be more horrific simply in implications without anything actually happening around you. I tell you, it can be more explicit than the lyrics of Nicki Manage. and my god, some of the death animation you'll see will often see body parts fly off, holes appearing from the entrance and exit wounds, or even have a crimson flower of blood pour out as their heads explode. And sometimes, your horse turns into Michael Jackson. Oh look, there's also a typo there. Good to see those 100 hour work weeks paid off, eh? Disclaimer, cheer up everybody, this was just a joke. I deeply respect every single hour of sweat and tears that went into making this game from every person involved. However, I do think it's a completely unrealistic and dangerous work ethic that the head of a company should never boast about, and I really, really hope that the team got rightfully compensated for this unhealthy lifestyle, because if they didn't, then Rockstar can go and get f***. To be serious for just a second though, yes, the game does have glitches, but as far as my playtime is concerned, I didn't find absolutely anything aside from like three bugs in total throughout the whole massive story mode, and for a game this huge with so many variables working together, that that's mighty impressive. There was this part where a body started floating away from me. And also this part where I went to the barber shop for a haircut and as soon as the next story mission began, my hair grew back even longer from where it was originally. What the hell was that about? But aside from that and the horse glitch, there really wasn't that much else going on wrong. And there are so many different areas of America that you explore through too. There's highly advanced cities, dusty desert towns, wastelands, swamplands, mountains, cliffside forests with waterfalls, and for a brief moment, you even go on holiday to Guama. But it all does go to shit within a few minutes, so I do hope that holiday was at all protected. I did catch another bug here too when I was trying to cover behind a rock but instead of doing that Arthur decided it was a perfect idea to ignore that rock, leap like a lord over the bloody thing and stick to the wall nearby which then got me shot in the head, thanks game! Also there was this one mission where I was escaping enemies down waterfall rapids and my god for how fabulous the rest of the game looks, what the Jesus Christing hell is going on with this water? Look how pixely it is, it looks terrible! Come on guys, what is this? Tomb Raider 2. This hot dog sausage with googly eyes looks more like a snake than that looks like water. There's a snake in my boot! The gameplay is great stuff too. Nothing mind-blowing or that different if you've played a Rockstar game before, but in terms of immersion, and like I said, the simulation aspect to everything, it's one of the most enveloping I've ever played. Shooting guns feels really damn good, dashing around the countryside, or just simply taking one step at a time to take in the gorgeous views contributes so much to the atmosphere, the story with character conversations, and also allows many different NPC events to happen around you that always feel totally natural within the environment. The weapon wheel and inventory is quick and easy to use, and I quite enjoyed the core system for health, stamina, and slow-mo Deadeye making a return from Red Dead 1. You have a certain amount of health, stamina, and slow-mo time for sure, but it regenerates over time unless you consume medicine to get it back immediately. But in order to get it to regenerate, you need to keep your cores up by eating and drinking appropriate things. Be careful though, because eating too much or too little, despite how low or high your cores are, can cause you to be under or overweight, which causes its own problems that affect stamina usage, core regeneration, and defense. These are just the main ingredients to the game though, because there is so much to do in Red Dead Redemption 2. So much in fact that even if some are simple mechanically, they contribute so well to the plot, simulation aspect, or atmosphere, I found them all entertaining no matter what. And I swear to the lord that at least three hours of my playtime was just patting this dog over and over again because look at his tail go! Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Not you, Stan. No, you're not good. You're not in Red Dead Redemption 2, how good could you possibly be? There's hunting in the game where you can just kill things while on your way to the next destination for food, or slowly stealth around and track their prints to grab rarer animals for more money at butchers, and even legendary animal hunting for some of the best prices and equipment. Be forewarned though, they can not only fight back and give you some incredibly tense moments, but also need to be taken down as gently as possible for the best possible carcass or fur quality, so you're talking bows and arrows instead of shotguns, which is a lot harder to do, but the rewards are worth it. And if you aren't that quick with doing whatever you want to with the body, it will eventually rot and be of no use to anybody. And you can skin them I suppose, but that's just... 
You can get attacked by rival gangs when out and about, some of whom don't even have time to recognise you if you run by fast enough, and if you end up getting killed by them and having legendary animal pelts or something else stolen from you, that makes you feel so low I can't even possibly describe it. There are other strangers in the wilderness to run into though, and you can try talking to them, but sometimes you'll just upset them, so you can either rob them, carry on, or kill them, whatever you want to do. Some strangers are being attacked by animals, and if you don't come and save them quick enough, they'll actually refuse the medicine you give them, leaving you no choice but to put them out of their misery. You'll be going along and you'll find random people in random situations all the time. Some will be friendly and give you a quick hello, or maybe even clue you in on a secret for something. Others are just other people in your position that don't want you getting involved in their shit. Some call you over because they found a load of harvesting materials to share with you, or you can rob them and kill them and take all of their stuff, but I felt too bad doing that so I didn't. I'm a very nice owl. Some people are even being taken in by the law and claim to be wrongfully arrested, but it's up to you whether to question them, question the guards, or break them out. And everything you do has consequences to your honour meter, affecting tons of things from prices at shops, to body looting item drop rates, and even types of gear to unlock. But a lot of the time you can get away with naughty stuff, just make sure that you firstly equip the bandana to hide your identity, very important, and don't forget to unequip it either, good lord that upsets people, and hide the bodies that you're done with, after you've done all of this stuff, you'll be fine. Don't feel too bad for these people though, because you know what they say? Is this town ain't big enough for the both of us? Also, you see that train there? You bet your hairy ass you can go for it. Ride alongside it, jump on board, and have a go at robbing it before it pulls into the next station. And whatever you do, make sure no guards see you. Because when that happens, you most likely aren't getting away with anything and will just keep piling up the bounty the more people die as the train is stopped by the police. And if the passengers don't want to give you their money, either beat them up or draw your weapon out at them to persuade them. Yeah. I'm a very influential young man. There's also maintenance mechanics too, not just with things like buying additional parts to your guns and customising their look and upgrading their attributes, but with things like making sure the guns you use more frequently are kept spick and span with gun oil so that their performance is always up to scratch. And you need to look after your own horse by feeding it to keep its separate stamina and health cores up, calming it down when it's stressed, brushing it when it's dirty, and even just patting it whenever you hitch it outside a building. Which sounds tedious, but this horse I ended up falling in love with. Oh god, no, not in that way, you disgusting twas! I mean more in a companion sort of way. This horse, if you look after it and unlock all the moves for it through bonding, will quickly become your best friend. And I named my horse Philippe because that is a good name for a horse. He or she stores all of your equipment on the saddle, looks after your weapons, saves your ass more than once, carries people and animals alike, follows you like a loyal best friend, you really get connected to it. And when I was attacked by that bastard O'Driscoll gang at the canyons that one time, they ended up nearly slaughtering my beloved horse that I spent hours and hours bonding with, and I just so happened to have sold my only horse revival medicine right before leaving town. So do you know what I did? I panicked and ran all the way back to the town that I was already wanted in, paid back my bounty at the post office, grabbed the tonics that I needed and got back as quick as I could all the while my horse was dying and nearly blinking out of existence. This whole process took a long time and tons of stamina medication because I was that connected to- but that's how desperate the whole situation made me. I haven't been this stressed in a non-horror game in my whole life, and I'll never forget the experience because of that. And hey, wanna talk about stress? How about this mission in particular when you're helping out the Native Americans? One of my teammates kept dying and failing the mission in the exact same place over and over again for no real reason at all, and I had to redo minutes worth of gunfights about six times before I could carry on. I don't know what happened here, but screw this entire bit. I'm going off topic though, there's more stuff to do. You can try and defuse fights from people in the streets to avoid getting bounties for unarmed assault. You can buy things legally or hold cashiers up at gunpoint and when making particular house robberies you can even keep one person in the area alive to threaten the secrets of their house out of them and where they keep treasures or if you don't trust them running off to tell the police you can just kill them you don't just jump onto trains for robberies but other vehicles and coaches too to contribute funds to your camp in order to upgrade it which isn't cheap but always gives you a safe backup for ammo and items in case you die and get robbed in the open world from your wallet and i know this is going to sound really weird and really obvious but even though being an outlaw in this game is tremendous fun, the game doesn't half make you feel bad about it. Those debt collecting missions for Strauss make you go through some pretty uncomfortable lengths to get the money owed to the gang back, which never made me feel good. And there was this one homestead I accidentally ended up robbing while I was just looking around the area. I know, accidentally robbed, hear me out, okay? I heard a nasty argument going on indoors from the outside, so I thought I'd make my way in to see what was going on. But I forgot to take my bandana off, so I barged into the house and got the father shooting at me. So out of instinct, I shot him right back and realized I just made this poor guy an orphan. But like, I I was already here, so I figured, hey, why not? Let's threaten the son so he can tell me if any treasure is around, and luckily there was. So it wasn't all for nothing, at least, but god damn it, I felt so awful after this, I seriously needed to take a walk with the dog to call off. 
you know what? I don't need this guilt. Now what I'm gonna do instead? I'm gonna shoot this guy in the head after I nearly died doing a favor for him and it turned out he was just a disgusting slave trader. Oh, and he's on fire now. There's the same treasure hunting from the first game with drawn images and clues you need to cross-reference with the map and world around you. And with side quests and story missions alike, you're left a lot of the time to decide what the best course of action is or whether or not to do it in the first place, which doesn't only affect the current quest, but the whole story overall. With some long-term effects being the hiring of new characters to your gang or killing them, and even the way the ending plays out. There's this new cinematic camera mode as well that gives you very pretty shots and auto-drives your horse when you need it to. And yeah, it isn't the most useful game mechanic ever implemented ever, but I do like how it's there if you want to use it. It once again really contributes to the atmosphere, and the first person mode was actually kind of a shock to me that I accidentally discovered and the, despite me not using that much at all, I thought was a great alternative to third person if you prefer it. There's different animations, it plays very differently, and more importantly, it changes how you move around the game since, I must admit, the walking and running speeds in third person were a little bit off for me. Not terrible and it didn't bother me at any point, but it wasn't the best. Your walking speed is really damn slow a lot of the time, and even though sprinting has its uses, your jogging speed can often be too damn fast and it gets you into trouble with bumping into people and such. There's no decent fast walk or middle ground speed to jogging that I found really strange. First person mode fixes that entirely, but like I said, I rarely used it. It was just really cool to see it implemented into the game. Speaking of bumping into people though, you don't even need to aim your gun to get people riled up. And remember to holster your guns unless you plan to use them. Just having them out makes some people on edge. And you could be reported for doing things even like self-defense because after all, you are the one that looks like the outlaw, so what else would people think is going on? All of this not only adds once again to the immersion, but equally ties into the themes of the end of the Wild West and how people's sensibilities are shifting and tolerance is dropping for people like you. And though that's ultimately a good thing, it does mean all the odds are against you and you feel this push from the world around you to just give up and move on. But fighting through is the point of the game. You've got the people you love to look after, so you don't have any other choice. And you can do this! Oh, and how about this? Yeah, you can rob shops at gunpoint whenever you'd like, but then sometimes you can discover secret shady back alley dealings in the same buildings and then try to use that to blackmail the cashier into letting you into the back room to clear out the scum and steal whatever they were hiding. And yeah, the bounty you get for doing all of this may be insane if you mess it up and it all ends really badly, but the rewards are often very much worth it. And the amazing thing is that most of what you do in the game is purely satisfying just on its own. There's no skill trees, no doing things for the sake of XP, new strangers and missions don't flash up with AH LOOK THERE'S A NEW OBJECTIVE with a huge garish marker superimposed on the game world. You play the game at your own pace and everything can benefit fit or cost you depending on how you play. Your health, stamina and dead eye levels upgrade naturally as you play with more rewards based on how much you experiment. Health for instance is upgraded by using creative combat methods like explosives or getting right up in the enemy's face with a knife. Or even going fishing, weirdly enough. The more you sprint the more your stamina will go up and with dead eye in particular I found that really clever because as long as you have the tonics to refill it constantly it can be a bit of a game breaker with how useful it is. But in order to make it last longer which is massively helpful in bigger gunfights in the later half of the story you you need to get better at headshots and general shooting without touching it to slowly build it up. Essentially, the less you rely on the dead eye, the better version you'll get of it in the future when you really need it, and I found that really smart. And by doing in-game challenges such as hunting particular animals, using particular weapons or picking particular plants, etc., you also unlock the choice to buy new equipment upgrades for your clothes to increase ammo capacity and let your guns last longer before cleaning. And this all means that you can get a really bloody good setup to Arthur in the earliest moments of the story as long as you're smart enough to get funds and just explore around. Upgrading your camp not only lets you access a safe haven for ammo and provisions, but even extends to the ability to fast travel from the camp and even call your horse back to the stables no matter how far away it is from you. And seeing your camp grow and the people you care about actually grateful for your help as you jump around the country without a single place to call home really gave me a warm, tingly feeling inside. Which then has its downsides because when members of your gang then get attacked by other gangs once you're spotted or other shenanigans happen, you don't only feel the gameplay implications but the impact of the character being attacked and the whole campsite being affected by what's going on. The vibe of the camp changes slowly throughout the game beautifully. And once you do that Saint Denis bank robbery mission that goes horribly wrong at the midway point of the game only to lose a massive chunk of your team you spent the whole game doing missions with and getting to know and love, which then ripples off into you losing the camp that you spent god knows how long investing into and briefly losing your horse all at the same time, you really feel that sting. And that's when one of those vocal track songs decides to play once you come back from your escape from that robbery after you accidentally end up in Guama since the escape ship you were on capsized. See, this kind of 
everything actually makes me feel an impact of losing what I've built in a story. And with how the story unfolds, things get even more tender once you rebuild the broken remnants of your camp, but slowly start losing the abilities to grab ammo, medicine and provisions from your camp as easily as you could before once everyone starts leaving to save their own lives and nobody trusts each other anymore. This means that instead of investing into the camp to fall back on supply topping up, you then find yourself doing more unsavoury things out in the world just to get more money just to survive and keep your horse healthy. But you don't feel good about it and neither does Arthur. Is everybody ready for me to go negative though? Because I'm gonna go negative. For as great as I found Red Dead Redemption 2 to be, I must admit, it has one of the most stale, boring, and perplexing beginnings to a game I think I've ever played. This game may have completely sucked me into the world and outlaw lifestyle for dozens of hours, but hot damn does it take a long time to actually get there. At first I was a little bummed out that we didn't start the game off with the job in Blackwater that went horribly wrong and that kicks off the events of the game, which was apparently so bad that nobody would shut up about it, but once I tried to get my head around the controls, I totally understood why the start was so slow. Now here's the thing, I play games with controllers 24-7, I never use keyboards even on my PC, not because they're bad, but because I'm a controller man, I always will. Be. But saying that, and as someone who only recently finished Shadow of the Tomb Raider and played a fair amount of Assassin's Creed Odyssey with zero control issues, why was the aiming so ridiculously sluggish to use at the very start of the game here? Rockstar, I'm eternally grateful for the huge amount of settings and things to tweak for a console game, but even after getting my ideal settings after a good hour of fiddling, it still didn't feel as great as it could be until I got used to it at least three hours in. I turned free aim mode on, aim assist off, left the acceleration on default, turned down the sensitivity a tad, and removed the dead zone zone from the analog sticks entirely and that made it fine, but that was all it ever was to me. Fine. And once I got used to it, I loved the gunplay. I was able to do things like shooting people in particular places in order to trip up other horses around them, and that felt great. Plus, I became a speed freak with the dead eye free shooting once it unlocked, but I couldn't jump into it, and it felt really sludgy compared to other contemporary games. Maybe it's the 30 FPS or something, I don't know, but in my opinion, it could have been much smoother. Uncharted 4 did this absolutely fine, so I don't get what happened here. Also, the context-sensitive actions seemed extremely all over the place for me too, and again, once I got used to it, I was absolutely fine with it and was able to rely on muscle memory, but to start off with, talk about a confusing mess. Picking up things off the floor and opening chests and drawers to then pick up things inside the chest or drawers changed how you press and hold or tap the triangle or square button all the damn time, and opening some menus like your satchel required holding another button while getting to the map required holding another button, but only if you hadn't already paused the game by tapping the same button or while making sure there isn't any other prompt on screen to look up the descriptions of things by holding that same button. There was one moment that I was in a train gunfight and a friend got caught, but instead of me just aiming at the enemy when I swear I had my gun already equipped, I instead just stared at the enemy, and then what usually is the firing button became the equip weapon button. And this funnily enough happened again in a late game mission for me too. I kicked a door down, tried to save a lady, but I just looked at the lady instead of aiming at the guy. I tell you, this entire learning curve slows the intro down even more than what it already is with the whole slow and painful trudge through the snow and all the story missions that deliberately lock out mechanics and abilities. For instance, showing you how to hunt while on the move, but then not allowing you to equip any weapon or hunt any animal in a mission following right after it. I mean, damn, it's brilliant learning about the characters and getting wrapped up in the world, but it's at the expense of teaching me fun mechanics and then taking them away from me until a certain point in the story where it then decides to open up. And yes, in comparison to the rest of the brilliant stuff the game does and how many hours I loved it, this was a tiny percentage of my entire playtime and it gets a lot better after the first few hours, but that's just it. It very nearly drove me away with how silly some of this stuff was. The game is an 18, I'm an adult, I can live with my own mistakes, so why can't the intro at least let me experiment a little bit so I can get used to the controls in my own comfort. I am in an outlaw gang after all. And as every outlaw does say, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. Once you reach your first campsite after winter passes, that is when things start going from convoluted and restrictive to very slowly brilliant. You start getting quests that don't just move the story along, but also unlock more weapons and items to play with for use whenever you want from that part of the game onwards, and many of the quests are deliriously entertaining in terms of what happens in them. There's a brilliant moment when you're tasked to take out your mate Lenny to the saloon and get him wasted so he can cope with all that's been going on, but then you end up getting so wasted that you don't just end up wandering around looking for him screaming like an ogre. <laughs> But then you get so drunk that you start to think everybody around you is Lenny, leaving you to just randomly annoy people until you find out where he is. There's a quest where you have to save one of your gang members, a priest who is constantly wasted, from losing one of his money at a game of cards, starting fistfights with people, and eventually climbing up to some train tracks on a bridge over a canyon. There's a quest where you need to pretend to be a brain-dead farming idiot who killed his own mother in order for you to waste a load of stolen bourbon at a saloon, and then end up getting caught from the people that you stole from. And now that I think about it, many of the funny missions usually involve some kind of alcohol. There's a quest where you book yourself 
yourself a hot air balloon with this adorably hapless pilot and then convince him as a customer to take you to a prison island so that you can spy on a captured John Marston, followed by you getting caught again and then having a gunfight during the balloon ride. Look at how ridiculous this is! You even get a quest where your entire gang is walking in a badass line formation ready to shoot up a house for everything they've put your friends through. Look at this! If you weren't sure about how serious we were about killing people, this proves it. I know it's cliche for Wild West, but it's just so cool. And you had better be ready to shoot down every single person in that mission in particular, because when you're in a gang of outlaws, you know what they say. Is this totally broken off as both of us? A few story missions restrict access to certain weapons and things, which is a little lame, but I get it, because it's mostly due to the fact it's a story mission, and you need to canonically follow the orders from your gang. But there is one mission here where, no joke, you're stuck on a stagecoach for minutes and minutes while you can't do anything other than sit there and move the camera and wait. And good Christ almighty, it's so slow. You can't even jump off the thing. Who thought this was a good idea? And something else I wasn't fond of. What was going on with the weapon switching here? I have absolutely no problem with the idea of storing guns on your horse and equipping them from the horse when you need them, along with only carrying a few guns on your person at once. Again, it was immersive, it sucked me into the world, but I swear that multiple times I'd equip certain weapons only to have them swap around and unequip at complete random. And I don't mean like with stuff like after you die, I mean generally throughout the game. After leaving my horse after a quick ride, after gunfights, I couldn't figure it out. I wasn't sure if this was because I was getting weapons shot off of my back in the middle of fights or because I was automatically storing guns on the back of my horse while I was riding him so I wouldn't drop them. I don't know, but I mean, I don't want you guys to think this is like a broken mechanic or something. It only happened on the occasion, but when it did happen, it was really bloody annoying. I mean, can you guys figure any of this out? Are you experiencing this on Xbox or are you having the same issues on PS4? Please tell me, because I can't work this shit out. This though is a small problem in the grand scheme of things, because Red Dead 2 is full of moments that don't even contribute to gameplay or mechanics, but just exist to heighten the experience tenfold and truly suck you in, unlike most other open world games. There was this one part I was cooking at a camp and a gathering formed around me once Javier sat down next to me and improvised on his guitar. If a gang member starts talking to you at the camp, you can choose to listen or tell them to shut up if you're in the middle of something. So far, it seems okay, I guess. I, th uh, I can't talk right now, sorry. We'll find them. One time I was looking around and heard some gunshots, so I ran off to see what the issue was, and it just turned out to be a man practicing his aim with some cans. But instead of getting to talk to him and join in, possibly, I accidentally knocked all of the cans over, which pissed him off and caused him to leave. And many, many other things happened during my playtime that unfortunately I wasn't able to record. There was one time a man couldn't calm his horse down, and by the time I ran over to help him, he was kicked in the back of the head and died. There was a prospector that didn't like me standing behind him, thinking I was looking at his gold, and after a few warnings, even though I never touched him, he started trying to beat me up. I even found a guy who betted me money that he was a better shot than me with killing flying birds, and when I figured out I wasn't allowed to use the dead eye during this bet and didn't hit a single bird, I felt kind of cheated out, so when he asked for his money, I didn't give it to him and I shot him in the head instead. And how can I not talk about this game without mentioning the ending portion? Don't worry guys, I'm not spoiling how you get to the ending portion or how it ties into everything or what happens in the ending portion, but rest assured, my god, if there was an award for longest epilogue to anything ever, I think that the ending of Red Dead Redemption 2 at four hours with John Marston definitely takes the cake. Okay, to be fair, I'm in two minds about this. Firstly, I wasn't sure about this ending because it does go on for a long ass time and is such a massive departure from the rest of the flow of the gameplay that you just finished, it may end up fatiguing you, especially after jumping from one character to another. And it only means anything to you if you played and enjoyed Red Dead 1, since it directly links in with that game. In the context of this game as a whole, aside from the the very end of the end, it does kind of just exist. It sticks out a bit. On the other hand though, I love this ending because the closure of Arthur's story is just as bleak as the rest of the game and doesn't really pay off anything. A fitting end in terms of the context of the story, but it doesn't feel like it ends the game that much. So having the last moments of the game follow John as he tries to make a fresh start with his family years after the events of part one and figuring out how insane Dutch has gone, yeah, that is satisfying. And if you've played Red Dead 1 and enjoyed it, this ending segment will mean everything to you in that sense. It's almost like bonus prequel DLC on top of an already massive and great game beforehand. Plus it's a really unique way to loop around the themes of the story, as you get attacked by people that are exactly what you were earlier on in the game, but at the same time, you are still on the run for being a wanted man, and no matter what you do, how well you treat your family, how mundane your normal life becomes, how many years it's been, even how much debt you end up into the bank for legally buying your own land to start afresh, these people will never escape the torment of their past. Redemption is Red Dead. It's pointless. And considering what happens to John in Red Dead 1, this cements the point of the bigger story at work between both games and makes it all the more soul-crushing when reflecting on all that's transpired. <laughs>
So let's conclude things then, why don't we? Red Dead Redemption 2 is far from free of problems, and it does have a much stronger middle section than the first few and last few hours, but I honestly can't deny that I fell in love with this game so much that I am glad I didn't find any menu in the game that showed me how many hours total I spent on it, because if I saw that, I think I'd have to put myself on double medication. I was obsessed for a solid week with this game inside and out, couldn't stop playing it, and especially if you love the original Red Dead like I did, you owe it to yourself to pick this one up. I don't think as a whole it's better than the original, purely because the themes of, you know, redemption, which is in the title, is much stronger in the original game and is a more focused story, but the second succeeds in so many other ways that I can't say I enjoyed it less either. Well, that depends on what you're looking for. If you want a solid and grounded third-person action-adventure game with the Wild West as a setting, but with a better pace to its story and much more personal stakes, then you go with the original game. But if you want one of the most atmospheric, beautiful and deeply detailed video game worlds with the same fantastic action and intense scenes but with a group of great characters, you go with the second one. Whatever floats your boat, I suppose. Just get ready for a lot of this. Spyro came out on PS4. Hello everybody and welcome to one of the most inflammatory videos I've ever made. I get it because of the- But I don't want you to misunderstand me for a second. This video's title, you know, it's just a bit of fun. It's, it's a real me slapper. Speaking as someone who thinks that these three games here are some of the finest 3D platformers ever made, and I'm pretty sure I've put more hours into completing them than the entire original Crash trilogy, Spyro Reignited trilogy is a fantastic game, and for the price, it's worth its value more than I can describe. And whether you've played Spyro before or never even heard of him, I highly recommend you see what all the fuss was about back in the day and why so many people migrated to the PS1 because of him. I even 100%ed the entire collection in three days straight. I enjoyed my time so much but that doesn't mean it's perfect. There are some shit I did not like in this game, and I thought it'd be fun to talk about it all today in a top 10 video. Before I go into any of that though, I'd like to spend a few minutes telling you what I thought was great in the Reignited trilogy, because I don't want you to think I'm just a nasty little nipple. Firstly, well, this game, it's bloody Spyro. If you loved the original games, they are mostly left untouched in terms of design, and everything great about them is present even with some of the more modern tweaks. The vast and sprawling level designs begging to be explored, distant secrets teasing you with goodies that you need to try and glide to from secret higher points, extremely fun and varied side objectives, it's all here and has aged much better than I expected it would. This does mean you get all of classic Spyro though with all of its trappings, which is most noticeable for me in Spyro 1 with the boss levels. I thought they were dreadful in the original PS1 game and they're still dreadful now. Not only because the levels they occupy are some of the most basic and linear in the entire game with nothing memorable or interesting in them, but the battles themselves are totally pathetic. On Toasty stage, I died more to these damn dogs than I did the boss itself, which just stands there and lets you burn it. And even the final boss with Nasty Nork doesn't give a toss. All he does is stand there and spit at you, followed by spending the rest of the fight running away from you like a big old bitch. My point is, if you didn't like the original games back in the day, aside from the control differences, Reignited Trilogy won't do much to convince you to fall in love with Spyro this time around. Exactly the same story with Insane Trilogy now that I think about it. But as far as the controls go, holy hell, I never had any problem with the original games, but now this game makes the original seem like you're roller skating through honey in comparison. Spyro is ridiculously tight and extremely fun and bouncy to control, and the charging is my absolute favourite in any 3D Spyro game to date. The weight and heavy momentum with slippy sliding from the original Spyro 1 has mixed in with the speed and responsiveness of 2 and 3 to give you a brilliant compromise that feels completely excellent. Not too fast, not too slow, not too tight in the turning, and not too loose either. And there's a few additional tweaks made across all three games in the collection to make them more accessible but all the better for it in my opinion. Spyro in the first game still doesn't have the ability to hover that gives you an extra bump of height and distance after a long glide, but to compensate, Spyro can now pull himself up with this pseudo grab move if you just miss the platform, which will save your life multiple times. You can also use sparks to point towards any lost gems in all three games from the very start, making those moments when you're missing one single gem and cannot find it for the life of you no longer an issue. And if that's not enough, you even have a map feature across all three games from the start as well. The analog stick control is extremely precise to make Spyro snap towards any direction you point him towards immediately, and this extends to additional characters in Spyro 3 too. Sheila isn't anywhere near as heavy but still has the perfect amount of weight to her movements. Sergeant Bird is a joy to control with the knowledge we have nowadays on third person flying control schemes. Bentley moves a little bit faster and jumps a little bit higher and- OH MY GOD AGENT 9 IS NOW A THIRD PERSON SHOOTER YES! 
Yes! I'm so happy they did this. Even that awful first person mission in Fireworks Factory plays like an actual first person shooter and not like if Wolfenstein was made by a baby. <laughs> Load times when inside levels are non-existent to keep the pace up and there's even fast travel from the very start of all the games to make backtracking to previous levels with new abilities and characters no hassle whatsoever. This is easily the best controlling Spyro game of all time, bar none, and I have to praise the art style as well. Some of the levels are so beautiful that if they were my best friend, I'd kill all of their lovers so that they could only belong to me. There's way more original assets and character designs on display, even if they're on screen for only a few seconds. Old enemies that gave my younger self nightmares now look even more horrific. Blades of grass don't only singe temporarily when you burn them, but also react to Spyro's feet and tail whenever he brushes past them. And Spyro's animations as well are frigging perfect and almost feline in their look. It reminds me a lot of a hero's tale, but nowhere near as stretchy and ridiculous. He even adjusts his feet mid-air whenever he's flying or charging mid-air after a jump, which further adds to his cat-like movements. Honestly though, I'm in two minds about Spark having feet. On one hand, it's kind of adorable, and on the other hand, STOP WAVING AT ME RIGHT NOW! There isn't only the entire original soundtrack to choose from if you feel truly nostalgic, but even a brand new dynamic soundtrack that not only captures the original tunes perfectly with a more modern twist, but even gives you less accompaniment when you stand still, different instruments when underwater, and adds galloping noises when you charge, just to name a few things. Even Sheila jumps in time with her own theme song. Also, you can do this in the level loading screens. Okay, well, I didn't say it was fun. This is, though. Enough positivity! I just flicked the bastard caddy switch. Here's ten things that suck about the Reignited trilogy. Bentley boxing is still awful and way too difficult. I'm only joking, it's easy as piss, and if you still can't do it nowadays, then you're just shit. Things that weren't fixed or made even worse. Sometimes. I may have had a ton of praise just then for all the control fixes, but for Christ's sake, some of these things weren't fixed at all or sometimes were even worse than they were originally. It's great how things like sliding actually allow you to, you know, control yourself this time. But what isn't great is these few things here. Ice skating in Spyro 2 is still how it was in the original with the auto moving forward instead of in Spyro 3 when you have free control and can stop in place. With this boss against the bull in Metropolis, it's a royal pain in the ass crack that could have been very easily fixed by just having the ability to stop and avoid the bombs, but that just isn't the case for some reason. Also, the flight controls, where they're great for the most part when you go through a speed boost instead of it being like it is in the original when you go really, really fast but still have tight, precise control, now it's almost like you drift in mid-air, which I'm sure I don't need to explain, is a bit of a problem and it makes you smack into the side of things and make you not decide to take any of the shortcuts and make the races last way longer because of that. And for the main thing that made me add this questionable changes topic to the list, the fight against the fire dragons in Fireworks Factory. What was already a long, drawn out and frustrating mission has been made at least three times worse by a number of changes. Firstly, your super fire breath attack is a little bit smaller than the original game, making hitting these extremely skinny targets while they move and twist around all over the place even more difficult. Secondly, I swear they respawn their health much faster than they did before, making the battle even longer. And thirdly, I also swear they're much more aggressive than they ever were in the original and managed to hit me over and over and over again unlike anything I've ever seen. The only way I was able to beat these things is if they were somehow stuck in a loop-de-loop -loop while I was close enough to wail on them, but that was rare. And why they decided to make this already hated mission even more tricky, I couldn't possibly tell you. <laughs> Look at these Norks in Twilight Harbor, the last main level of the game in Spyro 1. What should be aggressive and horrible enemies with vicious machine guns are now aggressive and horrible enemies with paintball guns. What is this? Pepper Pink? <laughs> Super Yeah. Okay, to be more exact, it's fine for the most part, but if there's one thing I thought was done twice as good in the original games, it was the supercharge mechanic. What used to give you instant fast speeds now has a very weird speed building system where the longer you charge, the faster you go. And if you dare even touch certain sides of tracks while supercharging, this can sometimes happen. Oh. And I'm not sure if this weird new momentum building supercharge was to blame or whatever, but one level that is infamous among the Spyro fandom, Treetops, was made even more difficult with the supercharge jumping. I personally know Treetops inside out and know every single route to each distant island with the super ramp jumping points, so much so that I can do it all on my first time on the PS1 version. But here, sometimes I'd jump too low, sometimes I wouldn't jump far enough, sometimes glides wouldn't make it, going off at the same speed and the same ramps and everything. Yeah, I know if you want to get specific, I'm jumping off of the ramp at different points, but it seemed way more strict and reignited and it didn't half make me shout. <laughs> You know the classic bone dance in Spyro 2 and 3 when you help Uga put his skeleton friend back together? Well now, there's unironic air horns trying so desperately hard to be cool and hip it's embarrassing. 
and now the skeleton flosses. It's terrible and I hate it. Glitches. Or bugs, there's one. <laughs> now you may be thinking to yourself, glitches are a pretty important thing to the experience of a game, so why isn't this higher up the list? Well, that's because A, the bugs I came across weren't that numerous compared to the rest of the game that played fine, and B, I only seemed to have the bad glitches on Spyro 3. Which sucks because that's my favourite of the trilogy, but I'm sorry, did you just see that there? And that wasn't the only thing. I experienced this annoying little bug multiple times where Sparks outright refused to pick up any gems that were right next to him. Sure, when you're standing this close, it's stupid. You can just go and pick the gem up. But when you're on a grassy plain with green gems perfectly camouflaged into the grass that Sparks just completely ignores, that's really annoying and a huge time waster at best. There was this one part here where I caught an egg thief after it decided to have a little bit of a fit, but then when I got to him, it didn't drop the egg and he disappeared from the game entirely, causing me to have to reboot the game to get him back. And the only reason I knew to do that was because I played Spyro 3 so many times, so if I was a first time player of this game, I wouldn't have thought that anything was supposed to happen and I would have been looking around for one single missing egg the entire time, I mean, come on. And another time I had to reset the game was when my mole counter here in the Bentley mole bashing mission was completely stuck on 15 and would not budge. Not that this ever happened to me personally, but I've heard a few reports of crashing and save game data being lost on Twitter. Someone said to me that they had the final 100% completion level of Spyro 1 completely locked out, which after completing the game to 100% to try and unlock it must have felt a bit crap. And even though I found the right stick free camera control a big improvement over the left and right shoulder control from the original trilogy, whenever you go swimming in Spyro 2 and 3, and especially when you charge underwater, the camera would get a bit confused and think it was giving you a spirocolonoscopy. The worst part for me though was in this part of Sergeant Bird's base. You go into a tunnel and this happens. What in the actual bloody moist figs is going on here? I can't see a single shitting thing here. And no, I'm not in the aiming downwards mode. I'm just trying to get through the tunnel regularly. Oh, look, I died. What a surprise. I'm not going to pretend the original games were glitch free, but the originals definitely felt more stable and that was on the PS1, so I have to give a point to them. <laughs> The they should have scrapped this mission, I just hate it. This isn't the Reignited Trilogy's fault, I know, but my god, when you have a mission in the game that is entirely based on trial and error as you escort a dumbass scientist to Hunter trapped by rocks on his feet, who even thinks it's a great idea to walk around in circles towards pickaxe-wielding rock monsters that he already avoided, when the place he needs to go to is right next door to where he already is, it just makes you question your life choices every time you restart the mission. I'm lucky in the sense that I've done this so many times, I know exactly where he's going and I did it my first time, but even and then you can only just interrupt the rock monsters before they attack. And plus, that's all you can really do because your charge pushes them back so slightly you can never truly get them out of the way, meaning that all you can do is hit them at just the right time so that they're stunned as the alchemist walks past them. And even better, if you didn't know beforehand, after you finish that mission, you find out from Hunter that you need another power up to do another mission that follows it. So you carry on with the game, get the head bash move, return to Fracture Hills to do the second part of the mission, and you have to do the alchemist part all over again! <laughs> And while I'm in the middle of bitching about particular missions, I'm gonna go off for a bit on this one. And I know what you're expecting me to say, you know, that one mission in the entire trilogy when every time you fail it, you hear the same line over and over again. Trouble with the trolley, eh? But no. I'm not talking about that one. Because aside from the first time I deliberately failed the mission just so I could record that line, I did this mission on my first try. It's really not that bad. I don't know why people have such an issue with it. No. There is only one mission in the entire trilogy where I have to hear one particular line over and over, and over again. Ow! I went boom again. Ow! I went boom again. What happens when you take the trial and error element of the Alchemist mission, but with a faster NPC to escort, while they erratically bounce along a winding path with no indication on what they're about to crash into until the last minute? You get this god! Damn mission. And by the way, those mushrooms you need to stomp, not only do you have to stomp them preemptively because of the delay in your jump and stomp move, but they also don't stay down for very long before popping back up, which is great when these idiotic insects decide to loop around and run past the exact same obstacle you already pushed down, but it just went back up again. Damn you all to hell. Ow. Again, like the last point, I know this isn't the Reignited Trilogy's fault majorly, but I think at least they could have made the Fireflies move just a little bit slower, or made this task more, you know, what's the word. Um, oh yeah, fun. And it makes even less sense than the alchemist holding the secret formula because at least Sheila has hands. She can hold the bombs herself and take them straight there herself. She bounces around less than them too, so she's probably safer anyway. Oh, wait a second, why don't they just light the fuses when they get to the cages instead of lighting them at the start of a dangerous road? You don't get your keys out when walking down Drain Street. You get them out of your pocket at the front door. Voice <laughs> acting. Okay, back on track with the reignited specifics here. The voice acting as a whole in the PS4 remakes across all three games I found to be... 
Okay, the entirety of Spyro 1 is great, but that's because anything is better than the original Spyro 1. Spyro, it's great to see you, but I've got to go. <laughs> What? And I must be clear, a lot of these voices in the stages and interpretations of returning characters I actually adored. The Professor sounds great, Elora sounds adorable, Moneybags is as sleazy as ever, Spark still can't talk properly and it's brilliant. <laughs> Bianca is more expressive, Sergeant Bird is way less one note and has more character in his inflictions, Sheila sounds great, Zoe is at least seven times less annoying, but for most of the other voices, I'm sorry, I think they were better in the original game. They seem to do the Ratchet and Clank PS4 way of interpreting a classic, sacrificing the core ridiculousness and humour for cliched and forgettable cartoon show voices. Don't know what I mean? Here's a handful of examples that I wasn't too sure about in the remake. I'm a secret agent. I'm a secret agent. As you can see, a vicious ox has taken over our armory. As you can see, a vicious ox has taken over our armory. Gosh darn it, Spyro. I came in here to check on my prisoner. Gosh darn it, Spyro. I came in here to check on my prisoner. Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Oh, there's Romeo. Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Oh, there's Romeo. You'll have to use this combo power-up to take out these fire dragons. You'll have to use this combo power-up to take out these fire dragons. Rhinox are running rampant around here, but I can't get anyone out of the Tiki Lodge long enough to do anything about it. Rhinox are running rampant around here, but I can't get anyone out of the Tiki Lodge long enough to do anything about it. If you ask me, the statue is far prettier than she is. If you ask me... The statue is much prettier than she is. Not only that, but even Ripto, most people's favourite bad guy in Spyro history, has gone from a pathetic and slightly campy frustrated menace who thinks he's bigger than he really is. You singed my cape, dragon. To an angry and annoyed... man. You singed my cape, dragon. I can't describe it any better than that. He's just an angry person to me and nothing more. And sometimes these voices can clash against their designs, most of which, again, I totally love. But when you have these hilariously restrictive 32-bit 3D characters translated into highly detailed cartoon characters, I don't know, sometimes they just seem to lose all their charm to me. Even Hunter, I love this dude and his design I found great, and the voice performance is good, don't get me wrong, but compared to the original with the slightly clueless, cowardly and sarcastic edge to his dialogue... I found this gladiator training arena, and it makes a pretty cool skate park. Care for a test of your boarding skills? Has now been made overly confident and very Sonic the Hedgehog -y to me. I found this gladiator training arena that also makes for a pretty cool skate park. Care for a test of your boarding skills? Well, the good thing, I suppose, is that Spyro no longer sounds like a bratty, insufferable douchebag. What about Nasty Nork? I'm going after him. What about Nasty Nork? I'm going after him. So thank you very much for that, SpongeBob Square Bob Super Bob. <laughs> When I got this trophy, I thought it said Jaculate, and I was nearly sick. Performance. Is this game Sonic Boom levels of stuttery? Not at all. But this game does not run that great. And after I mentioned this on Twitter and a few people said it ran brilliantly for them, well, my footage doesn't lie here. I'm not trying to be a knob, this is what the game is like. If you're watching this on a mobile device or at 60 FPS, it may not look as bad. But if you go to full screen on your computer or watch on a TV, you'll see what I mean. This is direct capture from a PS4 Pro, and for as good as the game looks at a standstill, in motion, it likes to jump about a bit a few times. Not all all the time, but enough for me to notice it and distract me a bit. It is kind of frequent. And this doesn't ruin the game from start to end for me, don't get me wrong, it still plays fine a fair amount of the time as you can see from the footage, but whenever you charge into multiple pots at once, flame particular enemies, glide to particular areas as they load up ready for your arrival, or turn the camera quickly around in crowded areas, the game can sometimes look like a tractor wading through cow pat. And just before anybody else brings this up, yes, my favourite game of all time is Bloodborne on PS4, and that game does not run that well either, but firstly, the time gap between this game and Spyro is nearly four years, and secondly, look at the visual fidelity of Bloodborne compared to Spyro. I'm not saying Spyro's ugly in comparison, but there's a lot more going on in Bloodborne, and it really sucked me into the world despite the frame drops, whereas Spyro, I, I don't know, I'm not sure why it doesn't run smoother. And let's not forget the complaints from PS4 owners, particularly about the motion blur. This wasn't something that bothered me personally, but I know other people that have experienced sickness from the speed of the game.
the game compared to something like Uncharted 4's motion blur. And I don't think any level of distant details being rendered on screen is impressive enough for the game to run choppily as a result. I'd much rather it ran at a forever stable 30 with motion blur like the original release of the Insane Trilogy and Ratchet and Clank remake, or sacrifice a little more of the visuals for a potentially strong 60 FPS. There's a weird attempt here to get the best possible visuals but disguise the resulting occasional choppiness with excessive blur instead of just sticking with a stable 30 or doing a little less for a few more frames. Spyro is a fast paced platformer and if the original games run smoother on older hardware and relied on rendering tricks to give the illusion of objects far away to help it out, I'd rather have something done similar to that in order for the full potential of a next gen version of the same games I love to be a lot more than just a paint job the game can't handle. It's annoying because in terms of control and everything else this is easily the better alternative version of the same classic Spyro games and it does look great but Honestly, I'd rather just go back to the original games if I ever wanted to replay them because of how distracting this was to me. And to say that makes me really sad because I did love this game, but I can't ignore this. So yeah, I don't want you to think I'm a frame rate snob because I'm seriously not. If your game looks absolutely fantastic, absolutely stunning and runs at a solid, consistent 30 FPS, I'm completely okay with it. And if it runs at 60, that's even better. Wow. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed my little rant today, along with a very brief and very positive review at the start of this video about Spyro Reignited Trilogy. And remember everybody, if you're upset with my opinions, chill out. I still think that this game is really, really damn good and I highly recommend recommend you go and get it. I suppose all I can do now is wait for the eventual PC release, Toys for Bob, so that it can join alongside your second best release, Madagascar. Yes, I'm not joking, they made this. <laughs>